Let's talk about mathematics and understand why it is important for every engineer. Mathematics is the base of engineering. It is a fundamental requirement that everyone must master. Right from discrete mathematics, number theory, set theory, graphs, these are the basic things that every CS engineer must master. It is not just important for clearing interviews, but it is also vital for growth within a company itself. Facebook, Google and the likes ask numerous questions that are based on maths. GCD, prime numbers, modular arithmetics are common areas on which you would be often tested during your interviews. So prepare your mathematics well. Hey folks, I welcome you all to Scalar Academy's YouTube channel. So if you want to be a good programmer, then you need to have a good mathematical aptitude. Or in other words, you need to have a mathematical way of thinking to solve the coding problems which you face. So understanding the importance of this, we have brought you this tutorial on mathematics for programming. Now, before we start off, I'd like to request you guys to subscribe to our channel and also hit the bell icon so that you do not miss out on our upcoming videos. So on that note, let's get started. Hello. So we are back with a live class. Today's topic is factorization. Uh, these classes are for people who want to become better programmers, right? At uh, better at DSN algorithms. So please make sure that you subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to get notifications, right? About any new videos. As always, uh, there will also be a practice set available to you. Uh, this practice set will have a few problems so that you can apply whatever you learn in today's class, right? Actually applying, actually practicing the problems will help solidify the concepts, all right? So we are going to cover factorization today. Now factorization is a topic of mathematics, all right? And as computer programmers, uh, you will need to have a decent understanding of mathematics. In fact, I mean, in all sciences and computer science is a science, right? The stronger you are at maths, the easier your life will be. Now programmers, uh, I mean, you don't have to be very good at mathematics, but there are certain areas that you need to focus on to be a good programmer. Now these uh, topics are like discrete math, probability, statistics, combinatorics, linear algebra, modular arithmetic, number theory, graph theory, right? So it is still a very large uh, section of topics that uh, you will need to be a very good programmer. So we, we're going to start with that. And today's topic is from number theory and the topic is factorization. All right. So let us begin. All right. Cool. So before we begin, let us start with a question directly, right? Let us say that you have been given, you have been given a number n, all right? And this is an integer. This is an integer. In fact, this is a positive integer, right? Your task is to find all the factors, all the factors of this number, right? So for example, let us suppose that you have a number like 16 perhaps right so can someone tell me all the factors of 60 what all numbers is 60 divisible by so when we're talking about factors we are talking about the positive numbers right the positive integers that divide 60 right and do not leave a remainder so what numbers are those so firstly we have one right then does 2 divide 60 yes it does so we have 2 similarly 3 divide 60 4 also divides 60, 5 does, 6 does, 7 does not really divide 60, right? Now, 8 also does not divide 60, neither does 9, 10 does, right? 10 definitely divides 60. After that, what numbers we have? So, we have 12, right? Then we have 15, then we have 20, right? What more? We have 30 and 60, right? So, these are all the different factors of 60 right cool now before we before we dive further into this problem let us try to draw some observations let us try to draw some observations and see 
if there is some pattern to what the factors of a particular number are, right? So first of all, you will notice that one and the number itself, they are always factors of this number. Yes, do you agree? Well, one divides every single number. And if you have a number, let us say n, then that number will divide itself, right? So that has to be a factor. What else do we notice over here? Is there any other pattern that we notice over here? Yes. Hmm. So we notice one more thing. So the first thing is that one and n are divisors, divisors of n. The second thing that we notice is that that factors come in pairs. Factors come in pairs. What do I mean by that? I mean that given any factor, given any factor, there is a corresponding factor. Right? So if I pair 1 with 60, then I will get 60, right? 1 times 60 equals to 60. Similarly, if I pair 2 with 30, then I once again get 60. So 2 times 30 is 60. Similarly, 3 times 20 is 60. 4 times 15 is 60. 5 times 5 times 12 is 60, 6 times 10 is 60, right? And then if I continue, if I continue from here on, you will see that I will just repeat these things, right? So I will just repeat these things. I will say 10 times 6 is 60, right? So 10 and 6 have been repeated. Similarly, I will next say 12 times 5 is 60. So after all this, the numbers are being repeated. Is that clear? The factors will always, always come in pairs, right? That is the main observation that we draw from all right. Now, given that we have these observations, could we write a program? Could we write a function? Let us say find factors, find factors, right? That takes an integer n, and it let's suppose print out prints out all the factors of it. So let us in fact call this instead of find n, let us call this print factors. This function accepts an n, and it is supposed to print out all the different factors of n. Right, so what approach do we see over here? What approach do we see over here? So one way, one way to do this would be the naive way, right? The very, very simple way. The first way would be to look, to go through all the numbers. Go through all the possible, possible devices, right? So to go through all the possible devices, we will need a few more observations, right? Let us, let us quickly see what those observations are. So the first observation was that 1 and n are divisors of n. There is one hidden observation over here. Right? Let me mark this as the third observation. And that observation is there are no divisors that are less than 1 and there are no divisors that are greater than n. Right? So the divisors, so 1 is the smallest divisor and n is the largest divisor. Yes? Does that make sense? So when I am trying to find the devices of a particular number, I only have to go from 1 all the way till n, right? Because I cannot have devices that are greater than n. Does that make sense? Is that part clear? Right? Perfect. So how do we write this program then? This is a very simple for loop. So we will say for i goes from 1, right? All the way till n, all the way till n and we'll increment i. So we'll go through all the different numbers. What we will do inside this? We will check if n mod i equals to equals to 0. Right? So does, everyone is familiar with this mod operation, right? This is the remainder operation. This says that when we divide n by i, then what is the remainder? Is that remainder 0? If that remainder is 0, then i must be a factor. Right? i must be a factor. Then what do we do? We simply print i. Right? So this is our code for factorization, right? Cool. Now this is the first approach. This is the first approach. This is very naive. We can do much better than this. But why is this naive? So let us analyze the time complexity of this particular program. So how much time does this take? If I have a number n, then what is the time complexity of this particular program? Well, this is a simple for loop, right? We are going from 1 all the way till n. So this is linear. This is linear. In fact, this takes order of n time. Right? Cool. Can we do better? Can we do better? 
Well, certainly we can. Certainly we can. So the first thing that you will notice over here is that whenever you are looking at these numbers, whenever you are looking at these numbers, we know that the largest factor is the number itself. Right? The largest factor is the number itself. But what is the second largest factor? How big can the second largest factor be? So I know that the largest factor, largest factor is in itself. Right? What about the second largest factor? Second largest. That must be less than or equal to n by 2. Right? That factor must be less than or equal to n by 2. Why? Because if it is greater than n by 2, if it is greater than n by 2, then its corresponding pair, right? Devices always come in pair. Right? Factors always come in pair. Its corresponding pair will not be an integer. Right? 2 is the smallest integer that might divide this number apart from 1. Right? So we know that the second largest has to be less than or equal to n by 2. So one thing, one thing that we can do over here right away is instead of having this loop from 1 till n, right? instead of having this loop from 1 to n, we can modify this. Right? We can modify this. So let me just modify this over here. I will say i is less than or equal to n by 2. Right? And notice that this is integer division over here. Integer division. Right? So in this loop, I will print all the all these devices, but now I do not print n, right? I have missed n now. So I will have to add another statement over here, which will simply say print n. Is that clear? Because now our loop is going from 1 all the way to n by 2. So I will not print out n in this loop. I will have to print it separately. Yes. So how much time did we save just now? We made our program twice as fast. Right. That, that's very nice. Right. We, we suddenly make a, made our program twice as fast. The asymptotically, it is still linear. Right. It is still order of n time. But practically, it is twice as fast. Right. Perfect. All right. So can we extend this? Can we extend this observation further? What about the third largest factor? What about the third largest factor? How large can that be? Well, if the number is divisible by three, then the third largest factor can be up till n by three. Right? Does that make sense? So third, third largest factor has to be at max. It has to be less than or equal to n by three. Similarly, the fourth largest factor has to be less than or equal to n by 4, right, and so on. So we see this pattern over here. Is that clear? Cool. Now the question is, we could use this particular observation to reduce our time complexity by half. How do we utilize all these observations? How do we really utilize all these observations? Mm -hmm. So to do this, let us make one more observation. Right? Let us let us actually go back to this observation that we had previously. Let us look at this thing once again. Okay. So let us say that instead of going from one all the way till sixty, right? instead of going from one all the way till sixty, we only go till this midway point. Right? You clearly see that there is mid this there is this midway point over here. After this midway point, so this is the midpoint. After this midpoint, the numbers will repeat. Yes, 6 into 10 repeats as 10 into 6. 5 into 12 will be repeated as 12 into 5 and so on. Right? So we only need to go till this particular point. We only need to consider this half. We do not need to consider the other half. All right. So if we are considering this half, then we have to go from 1 all the way till what number? We have to go from 1 all the way till this number. How do we find what this number is? How do we find what this number is? So basically, we are looking for a number i, right? We are looking for a number i such that i times something else. First of all, this should be equal to n, right? Because they are numbers, they are, they are factors, right? So i times something should be equal to n. Secondly, I am looking for a number such that i is less than or equal to this something, right? Because so basically, I am I'm, I'm going till 6 because the pair of 6 or the, the number which is paired with 6 is greater than 6. Right? 10 is greater than 6. If I go any higher, if I go any higher, then the numbers will swap. 10 will now become, I mean, the, the first number will become greater than 6 now. Right? So we are looking for a number over here 
that follows this property okay so if this is x then what can i say from here i can say that x equals to n divided by i right so i can put the value of x over here i will get i is less than equal to n divided by i what can i get from this i can move this i to the left hand side right so i will get i square is less than or equal to n and what does this tell me this tells me that these numbers this tells me that these numbers they must be less than or equal to so i must be less than or equal to square root of n is this part clear is this derivation clear this is very simple a lot of you might already know this but it is important where from i mean from where this is derived right this this square root sign this this, this is not magic all right so once again we are saying that we are looking for a number i we are looking for a factor i such that its paired factor such that its paired factor when we multiply them we get n right they are factors now we are also saying that okay we are only going to make sure we are going to make sure that this factor must be less than equal to its pair right this factor must be less than equal to its pair because if it is greater than its pair then we are just repeating ourselves right because 2 times 3 is the same as 3 times 2 so we only need to make sure that this number is smaller than this number otherwise we will be repeating ourselves so we put this in the equation we say i is less than equal to n by i which means that i square is less than equal to n which means that i is less than equal to square root of n so what did we get from here so now we can improve our program we can now say that we have a for loop for i equals to 1 i less than square root of n right square root of n and i plus plus i less than equal to square root of n and i plus plus all right now i will check if in fact n is divisible by i so what should i print over here if n is divisible by i i should print i right i should print i but is that all is that all no because i also have to print the other pair right remember we are only going for to half the pairs now so we also have to print the other pair so i will also print n divided by i right n divided by i and that will complete the the that will complete the uh, list of factors is this part clear yes perfect right now first of all there is a mistake in this program there is a mistake in this program a very subtle mistake can someone point that out yes exactly exactly so over here let me just uh, point it out so over here lucky says that hey this is the mistake right what happens when i is actually equal to n by i which means that when n is a perfect square when n is a perfect square you will be printing this number two times right that is not very good you will be printing this two times that is not very good so how can we fix this right so is first of all is everyone clear if n is 9 n equals to 9 what we will see we will see i equals to 1 we will print 1 comma 9 right i equals to 2 we will not print anything i equals to 3 we will print 3 comma 3 right so we see that we printed 3 two times that is not a good thing to do right so we need to resolve this we need to resolve this and we see that this only occurs when n is a perfect square right otherwise this this issue cannot occur right so how do we how do we resolve this we simply say that i goes till less than square root of n right i goes till less than square root of n and after this we will specially check after this loop is over after this loop is over we will check if so after this loop what will be the value of i it will be exactly square root of n if it exists right so we will say if n mod i equals to equals to 0 then print it just once right print it just once because it is a square root so just print i right notice that we are not printing the pair over here is that clear cool so this will give us a correct answer now the question is how much time did we save what is the time complexity what is the time complexity of this particular code yes so who can tell me that well this is very simple right just like the previous case we have a simple for loop and this for loop now goes from 1 
all the way till square root of n. So the time complexity is supposed to be order of square root of n. Right? Simple. Is that clear? There is one more thing over here that if you were actually using a function to calculate the square root of n, you would not do this again and again. Right? You will actually say sqrt or square root equals to, you will calculate the square root of n outside. Square root of n outside. And then you will just use that variable. Right? So that whenever you whenever you hit this condition, you don't have to calculate it again and again and again. Okay. So this will give us the correct code. And the complexity will be order of square root of n. Now that is a huge improvement. Right? That is a huge improvement going from order of n to order of square root n. This is huge. This is massive. Imagine that you had a number which was, let's say, 100 trillion. Right? 100 trillion. If you, 100 trillion is how much? 100 trillion is how much? It is 10 to the power 14. Right? If you were to check this number, if you were to check a number of this order of magnitude on your computer, it will take a lot of time. Right? How much time will it take? It will take around 10 to the power 5 seconds. Right? Or you can say it will take around 30 hours. It will take around 30 hours of time. Whereas with this particular algorithm, how much time will it take? It will take just 10 to the power 7 operations. So this is 10 to the power 7. Square root of 10 to the power 14 is 10 to the power 7. So it will just take how much time? It will take 0 0.01 seconds. Right? That is that is amazing. We went from a program that took 30 hours to a program that took that I mean ran in one hundredth of a second. All right. Cool. So this is how we would factorize a particular number. Okay. So I hope this is clear to everyone. Now let us move on to a question, right? To a question, related question. Okay. Suppose that we have a hundred doors, right? And all these doors are closed. All are closed. So we have basically door number one over here. Door 2, door 3, door 4, all the way till 98, 99, 100. Right? We have all these different doors and initially all of them are closed. So let me say that these are closed. Okay. Now we are going to play a game. We are going to play a game. This game will have 100 steps because we have 100 doors, we will have 100 steps. So the first step, in the first step, what will we do? We will toggle. Toggle all the doors. Right? So you understand what toggle means, right? Toggle means that if it is open, you close it. On the other hand, if it is closed, you open it. Toggle basically means to flip it. Right? Cool. So we will say that in the first step, we will toggle all the doors. In the second step, we will toggle all the doors, all the even doors. Basically, we will toggle every second door. Every second door. Right? In the third step, we will toggle every third door. And so on and so forth. It right? will continue like this forever. In the hundredth step, we will toggle. So there will be just 100, right? We will toggle the hundredth door. Right, so this is what we are going to do. Is this part clear? So first of all, what happens after the first? So what happens after the first step? Initially, all of them are closed. After the first step, all of them will be open. Right? Then what will happen? After the second step, we will toggle this every second door once again. So this door will become closed. 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 Right? In the third step, we will once again toggle every third door. So this third door will become closed. There was a sixth door over here, right? It was initially closed. So we will open it up, right? And so on and so forth. Does that make sense? So we are doing this thing. That is the game we are playing. The question is that after we are done with this game, after 100 steps, which doors remain open? All right. Is the question clear? Yes. After the third step, we will toggle every fourth. So in the fourth step, we will toggle every fourth door. In the ith step, we will toggle every ith door. Right. And the question is, after all these hundred steps, which doors will remain open? 
Okay. All right. So, I mean, this hundred is a very, very large number, right? So let us actually, let us actually reduce the problem. So whenever you have a difficult problem, you try to, you try to check that problem on smaller numbers, right? So let us say that we only have 10 rows. Okay. We only have 10 rows. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Initially, all of them are closed. Okay. What happens after the first step? So this is the zero step. This is step zero. Step one, step two, step three, step four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right? What happens after the first step? After the first step, every door is open. Right? After the second step, what happens? After the second step, what happens? So after the second step, one is open, two is closed, three is open, four is closed, five is open, six is closed. Right? Seven, nine, these are closed now. What happens in the third step? In the third step, one, we do not change it. Two, we do not change it. Three was open, right? Three was open, so we will close it. Four, we do not touch it. Five, we do not touch it. Six was closed, so we will open it. Seven, we do not touch. Oh, seven remains as it is. Eight, we do not touch. Nine was open, so we will close it. Ten, we do not touch. Yes. Okay, we move on. So in the fourth step, we will keep one. We will not touch this. We will not touch this. This was closed, so we will open it. We will not touch this, we will not touch this, we will not touch this. This was closed, so we will open it. We will not touch this and we will not touch this. And so on and so forth. So can someone see what is happening over here? Can someone see what is happening over here? Basically what happens in the ith step? What happens in the ith step? Exactly. So Srinivas has the right idea over here. Srinivas says that in the i -th step, all the doors, all the doors that are divisible by i, divisible by i, get toggled. Right? That is the problem over here. Now the question is, now the question is, let us suppose that I am talking about the nth door. Right? Let us suppose that I am talking about the nth door. For which all numbers, for which all steps? which all steps will toggle this door will toggle this door right so is the question clear if in the ith step i toggle every ith door then given a door number right given that i am saying that okay let's talk about the 20th door right let's talk about the 20th door then in which all steps will this 20th door be toggled in which all steps will this 28 door toggle? All the factors of n. Exactly. Right? All the factors of n. Yes. So basically, 28 door will be toggled in the first step, in the second step, fourth step, fifth step, tenth, and twenty-eighth step. Is that clear? Yes, because these are all the factors of 20. Cool. So how many times, how many times will this door be toggled? How many times will this door be toggled? Well, we see, we, we already know that, that factors, factors come in pairs, come in pairs, right? Which means that if there is a step number one on which this is toggled, there is also a step number 20 on which there is toggled. Right? Similarly, for step number two, we have step number 10. For step number four, we have step number five, right? So we know, we know that the nth door the nth door will be always toggled, will always be toggled an even number of times, even number of times, right? Because why, why is this true? Because the factors will come in pairs, right? So every door is going to be toggled an even number of times. Is that correct? Is that correct? Well, not so fast. Not so fast. Is there any particular number which has an odd number of factors? Right? What happens? So you have this pairs coming up. Right? You have these pairs coming up. What if there is a middle value? What if n is a perfect square? In that case, this value root n, it doesn't have a pair. Right? Root n is going to pair with itself. So it will not have a pair. So basically, if the nth door, nth door, 
so if n is a perfect square right if n is a perfect square if n is perfect square then n is door will be toggled in odd number of times right in all other cases it will be toggled in even number of times is that clear yes all right cool so what happens if you toggle a door even number of times initially it was closed then it became open then it became closed then it became open if we do this in even number of times what will the end state be it will be closed right because we started with closed we toggled it even number of times so eventually it will be closed on the other hand when n is a perfect square we will toggle it odd number of times so what will be the final state we started with closed we move to open we move to close since we will do this odd number of times the final state will be open right so which all doors will be open now we know the answer which all doors will be open all the doors whose numbers numbers are perfect squares perfect squares right and all in all the doors from 1 to 100 which all doors are those which all doors are those so that is 1 then 4 9 16 25 36 then what do we have 49 64 81 and 100 right exactly 10 doors will remain open on all these are the doors that will remain open. is that clear no 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 if n is prime the answer will be even so vishwajit has a question over here vishwajit say that if n is prime n is prime then how many factors does it have well for any prime number it has two factors right one and n itself so for prime numbers it will be even not odd only for perfect squares only for perfect squares perfect squares will we have odd number of factors odd number of factors all right cool okay so what did we learn from this particular problem this was not a very difficult problem right this also does not involve a lot of programming we did not do anything fancy we did not do any fancy maths over here all we did was we sat down we made some observations right we made some observations we looked at the problem we tried it with a smaller number instead of going to directly 100 we tried it with a smaller number so that is something that you have to keep in mind right whenever you are facing a problem whenever you are facing a algorithmic problem or any problem in life please your first step should not be to come up with a solution that is a very very wrong way of doing things the first step should be to make observations make observations okay. once you do this once you do this only then you will be able to find a solution find a solution if you do not make observations you will never be able to find a solution all right so please do not skip this step okay cool so that was a nice little exercise let us go back to what we were doing earlier right so first of all what we did was we found all the factors found all the factors of n right that is the first thing that we did. now while we were doing this we kept talking about something right we kept talking about prime numbers we kept talking about prime numbers so can first of all can someone quickly tell me what a prime number is so what is the definition of a prime number what is the definition of a prime number a prime number so first of all it has to be a positive and it has to be an integer right it has to be a positive integer secondly it must have exactly exactly two divisors right it must have exactly two divisors there is a lot of people think that this is the definition of prime number right a lot of people think that a prime number is a number which is divisible which is divisible by one and itself right by one and itself if this was the definition of prime numbers then one would be a prime number right then one would be a prime number because hey one is divisible by one and one is divis divisible by itself but one is not a prime number all right is that clear so this is not the correct definition this is very close but this is not the correct definition the correct definition is is that it must have exactly two divisors exactly two distinct divisors right so can someone very quickly tell me what all the what the prime numbers are a few prime numbers from the start so is is zero prime is zero prime no it is not is one prime 
No, it is not. Is two prime? Yes, two is prime. Two is the smallest prime number. Then three is prime. Four is not prime. Five is prime. Six is not prime. Seven is prime. Eight is not prime. Nine is not prime. Ten is not prime. Eleven is prime, and so on. Right? How many prime numbers are there? How many prime numbers are there? Hundred, two hundred, five hundred, one thousand, million, billion. How many prime numbers are there? There are infinitely many prime numbers. Infinitely many prime numbers, right? Everyone knows this. Cool. There's a very simple proof for this as well. All right. Okay. So now that we know the definition of a prime number. Some people are saying four prime numbers are there. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, suppose now that we know the definition of prime numbers, can we write a program? Can we check if a number is prime? Right. So we know that the definition of prime number is a number which has exactly two divisors and it is a positive integer. So given a number, can we check if it is prime? So is prime. Right, it is going to return a boolean, and it is going to take an integer. Yes. So how can we write this program? So very simple, right? Very simple. We can say that count is zero. Right. We can write a loop for i equals to one, i less than equal to n, i plus plus. Right. And we can check if n mod i equals to equals to zero. Then we will do count plus plus, right? And finally, we will return what if it is if the count is exactly equal to two, then it is prime. Otherwise, it is not prime. Yes. Right. Cool. What is the time complexity of this program? What is the time complexity of this program? This program runs in order of n time. We already know that we can optimize this a lot. Right? We already know that we can optimize. So uh, Surat says why boolean. So this is prime will return true or false, right? It will return true or false. True if it is, if the number is prime. False if it is not. Right? Which is why we are returning a boolean. Techgeos is asking, sir, just confirming, is this code Java, right? So uh, this is this might not exactly be Java. For example, in Java, you will have to put a semicolon over here, right? Uh, I'm not sure if you write bool or boolean in Java. I kind of forgot, but the rest of it pretty much looks like Java, right? Pretty much looks like Java if you add these semicolons. This will also work in C++, almost exactly the same way, right? However, when we are doing these classes, we will not be following any particular programming language. If you have any questions of a particular programming language that, let's say, if you want to ask, okay, so how will I do this in Rust, or how will I do this in Haskell, or how will I do this in, let's say, Python, right? So you feel free to ask that. Okay, feel free to ask that. I will be able to give you an answer for most common programming languages. However, we will not be focusing on the programming language in this particular class. Right? We will be focusing on the pseudo code. We will be focusing on the intuition. Okay. Cool. Okay. All right. So we see that this is linear in time, but we already know that we can improve this a lot. Right. So how can we improve this? Instead of going from one to n, we can go from we can, so if one is a factor, right? If n is a factor, right? And prime numbers have exactly two factors. What does this mean? What does this mean? This means that if n is prime, if n is in fact prime, then it must not have any factor, not have any factor between 2 all the way till n minus 1. Yes, is that clear? It must not have any factor between 2 all the way till n minus 1. In fact, it must not have any factor between 2 all the way till n by 2. In fact, we can even generalize this and we can say that a prime number does not have any factors between 2, between 2 all the way till square root of n. Right? Because we see that the the factors will come in pairs. Okay, the factors will come in pairs. Is that clear? So we can improve this code a lot. We can improve this code a lot. We can say Boolean is prime. 
is prime, right? We have an integer n, and we will say. So now we don't need that count anymore, right? Because we are just checking if there is a prime factor or not. If there is a factor or not, so we can say for i goes from two all the way till square root of n i plus plus, right? If there is any factor, if n mod i equals to equals to zero, if we did find a factor, then what can we say? If we did find a factor, then what can we say? Hey, we found the factor, so it must not be prime. If you found a factor between two and square root n, it cannot be prime. So we'll just return false. Return false over here. Right? And after this loop is done, after this loop is done, we will return true. Because if we did not find any factors except for one and n, then the number must be prime. Is this clear? And the time complexity of this code is the time complexity of this code is order of square root of n. Right? Perfect. So we know that we can check if a number is prime in order of n time as well. Now, one question, it's not, I mean, we are not going to teach that today in the class, but one very common question is, is this the fastest we can do? Is this the fastest we can do? And the answer is no. The answer is no. In fact, primality testing, primality testing, this is in P, right? This is in P. P stands for the polynomial time algorithms, right? I'm not sure if you have heard of P versus NP, right? But primality testing is in P. That means that we can check for primality in log n time, okay? in order of log n time. All right, we will not be going over this particular algorithm today. So there are several algorithms. One of the most famous ones is the AKS primality test, right? Okay, but primality can be checked in order of log n. It is in P, right? And no, no, no this is this is different from sieve of Pirata right? This is this is different from the sieve algorithm. This is a different thing. Okay. So if someone asks you how much time does it take to check if a number is prime, the answer is log n. Right? You can you can test primality in polynomial time. Okay. Cool. Vikas says, uh, what if n equals to 5? So Vikas has a question over here. Let us look at this code and see what happens when n equals to 5. Does this code work correctly? Right? So let us try that. So what happens? So first of all, we will say i equals to 2. Right? So we will first come over here. We will say i equals to 2. Then we will move on to the condition. We will move on to this condition. Right? That is how a for loop works. We initialize. We check the condition. We go inside the block. We increment and we check the condition again. Right? So we will check this condition. Well, what is the square root of 5? The square root of 5 is? Well, the square root of 5 is 2 point something, right? Let us suppose that we are doing integer things over here. So we will say that, okay, this, this is 2 is less than or equal to 2.5, right? Less than or equal to 2 point something. So we will go inside. Right? We will go inside. We will check. Is n divisible by 2? Is 5 divisible by 2? No, it is not. Right? So we will continue the loop. We will continue the loop. We will increment i. i will now become 3. Now once again we will check. Is 3 less than or equal to square root of n? No. 3 is not less than or equal to square root of n. Right? 3 is greater than square root of n. So we will exit this loop. And we will return true. So we will say that yes, 5 is prime. Which is correct. Okay? Okay, so there is another question. Santosh says that, okay, what if 2? What if we check with n equals to 2? Right? What happens when n equals to 2? Won't this program return false? Let us see, right? So when n equals to 2, we start, right? We start with i equals to 2. Okay? Then we move on to the condition. We move on to the condition. We check if i, if 2 is less than or equal to square root of 2. Is this true? Is 2 less than or equal to square root of 2? No, it is not true. Right? This is not true. So it will directly come outside the loop. Okay? It will directly jump outside the loop. It will not go in the loop. And we will return true. So even for true, we will return true. Is that clear, Santosh? Yes. But this program is not 100% correct. This program is not 100% correct. Can you tell me one value for which this program will fail? Exactly. So I used to have the right idea over here. What if n equals to 1? Or what if n equals to 0? Or what if n equals to minus 100? Right? For all the numbers that are less than 2, 
So all the numbers that are less than two, we will never go inside this loop. So we will automatically return true, right? So we need to improve on this program. We need to improve on this program. We need to add a check over here. So let me just insert some space. Let me just insert some space. So we will very quickly, let me just clear up the mess. This was square root of n. So we will add a check over here. We will check if n is less than or equal to one, then we simply return false. Right? We simply return false. All right? Is this clear? No, this is not a base case. Base case happens when you are in a recursion. Right? Base case, we talk about base cases when we are in a recursion. This is a edge case. This is a boundary condition. Okay. So it's almost the same, but it is it is better if we follow the correct nomenclature. Okay. Base case in which is when we talk about recursion. Currently, we're talking about edge cases or boundary condition. All right. Yes, we can we can also say that this is less than equal less than two. Right? We can instead of saying less than equal to one, we can also say less than two. That is perfectly fine. All right. Okay. Let us continue. Then. So now we know how to check if a number is prime. Now a very common question comes up. Uh, let me just check how we are doing on time. All right. So a very common question comes up now, which is called if you had to find all the primes, all the primes till n. Right? So I give you a very, very large number n, let us say 1 million. Right? And I ask you, find out all the primes till 1 million. Right? How will we do that? Is the question clear? We have to find all the primes till 1 million or some number n. So one way of doing that is to very simply go through all the numbers and check if they are prime. Right? So we can simply do for i equals to 1, i less than equal to n, i plus plus. Right? And we will say if is prime, if is prime of i, right? so this is prime is the function that we have coded earlier. This is prime is the function that we have coded earlier. We will simply print i. Simple enough? Yes. How much time will this algorithm take? How much time will this algorithm take? Well, this is prime function. This takes order of square root of i. Right? This takes order of square root of i. And we are doing this thing. We are doing this thing n times. Right? We are doing this thing n times. So how much time does it take? It definitely takes, it is bounded by, it is upper bounded by, so the time complexity of this program is upper bounded by order of n times square root of n. Right, n times square root of n. It is a little lesser than that, but as importantly, this, this is what the type bound is. Okay. Cool, can we do better? Now the question is, can we do better? This was the simple approach. We had the program, we had this function is prime that we have already coded. Right? And we simply say, okay, let us go through all the numbers and let us check them. So this will take this much time. The question is, can we do better? All right? Cool. So the answer to this is yes. Right? In general, yes. There is something called sieve algorithms. Sieve algorithms. All right? And there's a lot of different sieve algorithms. So one of the most famous that you will come across is the sieve of Eratosthenes, right? The sieve of Eratosthenes. And this is how you pronounce the name. You say Eratosthenes, okay? Eratosthenes. So this sieve algorithm can achieve much better time complexity. All right? Now, let us continue this particular thing in tomorrow's class. All right? We are going to keep the today's class uh, simple enough. Because you will have a lot of practice problems that you can go and try. We will talk about this sieve algorithm tomorrow. And this is a very elegant algorithm. This is a very nice algorithm. It is also very simple to code. Right? So it only has like five to six lines of code. And that gives you a very powerful algorithm that, that checks, that finds all the numbers, all the prime numbers up to a given number. All right. Cool. So one thing that Ankush is pointing out over here, or uh, not this. Where did that comment go? Interesting. Hmm, that comment just vanished. Yes. So Ankush is pointing out over here that in this particular program that you wrote, right? In this particular program that you wrote, 
you draw this loop as i equals to 2 all the middle square root of n we can rewrite this in this manner as well right so i am just pointing it out over here as ankush said that these two loops are equivalent i equals to 2 i is less than equal to square root of n right i plus plus this loop is the exact same as this loop for i equals to 2 i times i is less than equal to n i plus plus okay so instead of calculating instead of calculating the square root of n and then comparing it with i we square i and then we compare it with n okay it will work exactly the same and this is one more way more way that you can do it if you if you were to do it this way then you will have to pre calculate the square root of n right you will say square root of n equals to so you will use some sort of a math library you will say math dot square root of n and things like that so if you do not want to do that you can simply use i into i is less than equal to n All right Bridge says, but don't we have to check for overflow? Well, not really, Bridge, because i into i will not overflow, right? If i into i overflows, then n itself should overflow. Does that make sense? We are not really considering the overflow case over here. We are talking about not too big numbers. Okay, we are talking about numbers that will fit in the integers. Now, if n fits in the if n fits in your memory, if n fits in uh, let's say a 64-bit integer, then i into i will also fit in 64-bit integer. All right. Shrinivas says, sir, how to deal with very, very big numbers? Well, Shrinivas, there are a lot of different ways that you can tackle big numbers. One very common approach is to use a big integer library. Right? Big integer library. Right? But usually, uh, this is not a very good approach. Right? First of all, the question is, why, why would you need to deal with big numbers? Right? If you are implementing, let us suppose, some sort of an RSA algorithm, and you want to check if a number is prime or not, then you might have other ways of generating large prime numbers. Right? In practice, we don't really have to deal with very, we don't have to check very large prime numbers with something like a C. Right? With something like a C, we don't do that. Okay. So let us end the class. Once again, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon so that you can be notified of the videos. And in the next class itself, we will be going over prime numbers once again. And we will be going over a lot of different things. So we have to cover GCD. So greatest common divisor, Euclid's algorithm for that. We have to cover model arithmetic and a lot of different topics. All right, so please make sure that you subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon, and please, please go and practice the problems. Hello, everyone. So uh, in the last class, Pragya has taught you uh, about how to check whether a number is prime or not. Okay, so is everyone clear with that? If given a number n, can you all check whether the number is prime or not? Now, once you know that uh, whether a number is prime or not, now let's try to modify the problem a bit. Okay, so instead of getting a, a direct problem of checking whether a given number is prime or not, let's say that you have to print first n prime numbers. Okay, given a number n, you have to print the first n prime numbers. Or uh, another question could be that uh, you have to print all the prime numbers less than n. Another question would be that you have to print all the prime numbers in the range from L to R. Okay. So these are the three types of questions which we are going to solve optimally in today's class. Okay. Now, if you all remember, if uh, when you have to check whether a given number is prime or not, what is the time complexity of that operation? You are going to run a loop that starts from 2, goes till square root n, right? And with every number in in this range you try to divide n and you see whether n is divisible by that number or not if n is divisible by none of the numbers then you can see that you can say that that n is prime so the time complexity of this operation is order square root n right now if you have to check if, if you have to print the first n prime numbers wh what will be the time complexity of this approach if you have to print first n prime numbers you will be checking for all the possible numbers right you will run a loop for all uh, numbers from one to n and then you will run another loop. Uh, maybe you will have to increase the size of the first loop because uh, first n prime numbers might exceed n as well, right? So uh, the time complexity of this is going to be n root n, right? For each and every number, you will be checking, uh, you will be running a square root n check, right? Similarly, if, if you have to print all the prime numbers which are less than n, again, uh, the same time complexity will be there, n root n. If you have to print all the prime numbers in the range from L to R, then again, size of range multiplied by square root n so all these types of questions can be solved in this time complexity n into square root n using a very easy 
check prime algorithm that we have learned in the previous class okay can we do it optimally can we do something to make all these problems easy for the computer now there is a very very well researched algorithm with very famous algorithm which many of you are already writing in the comment it's called the sieves algorithm right so in today's class we are going to learn about the sieves algorithm okay do you guys understand what is a sieve what is the literal meaning of a sieve if you just translate sieve in hindi what is that it is nothing but a channi right this is chai santa hai ghar pe so it has a net very fine net and a handle right this is a sieve right and printing all the prime numbers using a sieve is going to be exactly same as how you filter your tea okay we'll see how so jab chai santa hai tab kya hota you have a utensil right in this utensil you have uh, uh, the cooked chai right and then you pour it on the sieves and in after this you have your tea mug right so at this point this complete mixture is called chai right at this point you say that everything which is there in the utensil is my chai but when it is filtered then whatever is in your tea cup is called chai right to pehle to jo usme tha pure ko humne bol diya ki yaar ye chai hai chai ban gayi hai isko chhan lete hain jab chhan ke aaye to fir humne bola yaar chai to ye hai ye jo isme reh gaya hai ye chai nahi hai ye chai patti hai adrak hai jo bhi hai chai nahi hai hai na so sieves is going to function in an exact same way we have to figure out what are the prime numbers we will say that all the numbers are prime right so we will we'll take uh, all the numbers and we will say that all of them are prime then we will pass them through a sieve after passing them through through the sieve we will see that only the actual prime numbers are remaining all the composite numbers will be filtered out by the sieve okay let us see how it is going to work so first of all let us write down all the numbers which on which we will be running the sieve okay so we have all these numbers initially just like the t i am saying that all of them are prime okay all the numbers are prime now for one we are very sure that one is not a prime right is is, is everyone clear with this thing that one is not a prime right why is one not a prime because a prime number has to have exactly two divisors one has got only an exactly one divisor so one is not a prime so we can directly remove one okay now whatever is the first number which is present in this uh, uh, in the list of all these numbers which is available in the list we'll say that this number is a prime number okay so what is the first available number here the first available number is 2 so i am saying that 2 is a prime number so we'll filter out 2 2 comes out of the sieves okay so we have poured all the numbers uh here till 40 and now 2 has fall 2 has been uh successfully he has crossed the sieves okay one has stuck here now if 2 is a prime number can i say that all the multiples of 2 will never be a prime number right because all the multiples of 2 will definitely have one as a divisor themselves as the divisor and also two as a divisor so they are not satisfying the criteria of being a prime number does this thing make sense to everyone does this thing sounds obvious to everyone that any multiple of 2 can never be a prime number right so if any multiple of 2 can never be a prime number so what can we do filter them out cut them So I will just cut all the multiples of two which are present in this list. So four is gone, six is gone, eight is gone, ten is gone, right? So all these multiples are removed from this list. They, these all have been filtered out and thrown away. What is the next available number which is there in the sieve? What is the next number that I can see? The next number is three. So I can say that okay, three is also a prime number. Let's add three as well. Okay. once i am declaring that 3 is a prime number can i say that any multiple of 3 does not stand a chance for being a prime number any multiple of 3 is always and always going to be a composite number right so let us filter them out let us remove them from the list so let us remove all the multiples of 3 6 has already been removed then we remove 9 12 has already been removed we remove 15 18 is already gone right and then 21 24 is gone 27 and then 33 36 is already gone then 39 okay now which number is the next uh, available number in this list the next available number is 5 right so i can say that 5 is also a prime number okay so out of all these numbers we have till now filtered out three numbers which are prime numbers right so now 5 has come so any multiple of 5 will 
never be a prime number so all the multiples of 5 will also be removed so currently i can see that all the multiples of 5 have already been removed 10 is gone 15 is gone 20 is already gone 25 is remaining so we'll remove 25 as well and then 35 okay then what is the next available number in this list the next available number here is 7 so 7 becomes the next prime number okay and all the multiples of 7 will also be removed so now uh, 14 is gone, 21 is gone, 28 is gone. All the multiples of 7 have already been removed. Okay. What is the next available number that we have? Now we have 11. So 11 becomes the next prime number. And all the multiples of 11 again have already been removed. Then we have 13. Then we have 17. Then we have 19. Then we have 23. Then we have 29. Then we have 31, 37. And that's it. So now you can see that we have got all the prime numbers in the range from 1 to 40. These are all the prime numbers in the range. All the prime numbers which are less than 40 are now with us. Is the idea of the algorithm make sense to everyone? Is the idea clear? How the algorithm is going to work? Initially, we said that all the numbers are prime numbers. Assume that all of them are prime numbers. Pass them through the sieve. What does the sieve do for us? Sieve takes, see, the sieve algorithm takes the first available number and uh, and declares it a prime number. So we declared that 2 is a prime number. Since 2 is prime number, none of its multiple can be a prime number. Cut them out, remove them. Then take whichever is the next available number, call it a prime number, remove all the multiples of this number as well. Okay. Now let's try to see uh, how can we write the code for this. Okay. The code is going to be very, very uh, small, very, very easy. Right. So what we are doing here is initially, Initially, what we are doing is we said that let us first take all the numbers. So if let's say we have to print all the prime numbers in the range n, so then we take an array prime of size n plus 1 because if, if n is 40, array indices are going to start from 0. So I also need 40 as, as an index. So I will take the size as n plus 1. Okay. And I will say that all of them are prime. Okay. So this this primary, what, what, is, what does it hold? This primary for every index, it holds true or false based on whether the number is prime or not, right? So currently I am saying that this is, if this is my array, okay? Currently I'm saying that all of them are prime. So have true for each and every index, okay? Then what we will do is, we'll first declare some of the well uh, already known values, right? So we know that zero is not a prime. So we can say that prime of zero is false. So this will be turned false. And we also know that prime of one is also, for one is also not a prime, right? So one will also be converted to false. Now, starting from two, two, n we have to check each and every number, whether they are prime or not. So how, how did we do this uh, in this algorithm? We selected whichever is the first uh, true value. Basically, the first available means the first true value, which is currently declared as a prime number, right? So we'll run a loop, which will start from 2. And this loop will go till i, uh, sorry, till n. And we'll be incrementing the value of i one by one. And then we have to check whether this value has been removed or not. So if it has not been removed, then we will always be having a true value, OK? So we'll just check if this number at index i, if it is true, if this number is currently a prime or not, what is the first available prime number that we have here? Right? If it is a prime number, this means that none of its multiple can be a prime number. So for all its multiple, make them false. So if two is true, four, six, eight, ten, all these numbers should be turned to false. So I will just run a loop, star, uh, uh, let's take a different value variable. So we'll, now what we have to do? For i, we have to uh, make 2i, 3i, 4i, all these numbers as false, right? So we'll quickly run a loop starting from 2. And uh, we'll see till where we have to run this loop. And then do this. We'll say prime of i into j, right? So i is already there. This is our j, right? This has to be false. So we uh, till till what value we have to increase j? We don't know, right? We don't know that. Hmm. So we actually don't know till when we should be incrementing j. But what we know is that this product, this three i four i or or j i, this can never be greater than the maximum value that we have. 
so this product can never be greater than n this always has to be less than or equal to n right so here what we will have is j into i is less than or equal to n okay because if if you see in this list when when you start when you select i is equal to 2 then from where to where your j range is j starts from 2 so if j is equal to 2 you cut 4 then j becomes 3 you cut 6 j becomes 4 you cut 8 and you will go till 40 right so j becomes 20 you don't want to increase j such that you are targeting you are trying to cut a number which is greater than 40 so always we are keeping i into j less than or equal to n okay cool uh, <clears throat> now let us see let us try to uh, quickly see what happens when we are actually cutting the numbers right so uh, when when my i takes a value 11 okay when i am taking when i am taking a value 11 uh, in this case when we selected 11 what was the first number that we tried to cut the first number that we tried to cut was 11 into 2 which is 22 right so if i is 11 we are going to check it for value of j is equal to 2 right which will give us 22 then we will try to cut 33 then we will try to cut 44 then we will try to cut 55 and so on then j will become 11 and we will cut 121 and so on right now i have a question when i'm trying to cut all these numbers for uh, the value of i equals to 11 can i say that 22 33 44 55 all these numbers would have already been cut because before before i takes the value 11 i will also take the value 2 when i takes the value 2 22 would have been cut by that right so you must have observed in this case also that when we reach to 11 all the multiples of 11 were already cut right when we reached to 5 what was the first number that we cut 10 was already gone using 2 15 was already gone using 3 20 was already gone using 2 what was the first number that we cut using 5 it was 25 if i if i start from 11 then we can see that none of the multiple of 11 is available here which has not been cut all the numbers have been already cut right why why that happened because before taking a value 11 i must have taken all the values which are less than 11 so all those values have already been cut so 22 has been cut by 2 33 has been cut by 3 44 has already been cut by 2 55 has been cut by 5 and so on right so what should be the first value from where we should be starting the second loop from where we should start the second loop this has to start from j is equal to i right because when when we were trying to cut the numbers from 5 we saw that the first number that we are cutting is 25 similarly for 11 the first number which will be available there is going to be 121 all the other numbers must have been cut by the smaller values of i so we don't need to start from 2 we can start j from i okay now if if we are starting j from i what is the maximum value that i can take do we need to run the first loop till n okay let us let us try to again try to analyze the second loop and that will give you the answer whether we should be running the first loop till n or not should it start should it go till n by 2 hmm so what is the maximum value that we have to cut the maximum value that we have to cut is here 40 right okay and whenever you are starting to cut you are always starting from the i value which means that the first value that you are cutting is i square right for 2 you are cutting the first value that is being cut is 4 right for uh, for 3 the first value that you are cutting is 9 for 5 the first value that you are cutting is 25 for 6 the first value that you will be cutting is for, for 6 you will uh, anyhow won't cut any value for 7 what will be the first value that you will be cutting for 7 the first value should be 49 7 into 7 is 49 is 49 in this range no 49 is out of this range so what should be the maximum value the maximum value till which we can go is i square so i can never go beyond square root n right because the first number that you are cutting here uh, like like this this number which is the last number would have been cut when i becomes square root n right so this n can be turned to square root n right so either you can say i is less than or equal to square root n but if you are using this function square root n this is an expensive operation or finding finding a square root of a number is 
actually it's expensive operation it will take at least log n time so what you can do is you can replace this by i into i less than equal to n so now you are doing the checking order one operation this is going to take log n time at least if, if you are printing the integer part right using binary search okay so now let us come to the time complexity okay this loop the first loop is running from 2 to uh, square root of n uh, let us let us actually remove all the optimizations that we have done we'll try to calculate a very relaxed upper bound okay so tell me one thing when the value of i is equal to 2 how many times does the inner loop run if let us say that this is starts from 2 if we are considering the previous loop the, the totally unoptimized loop which was starting from 2 and going till n and this loop is also going till n we are considering the most unoptimized version now tell me if value of i is equal to 2 how many times are we going to run this loop this loop will start from 2 go till n by 2 right we will be cutting exactly n by 2 numbers for i is equal to 3 how many times is the inner loop going to run the inner loop is going to run for n by 3 times for i equals to 4 how many times is the inner loop going to run for i equals to 4 is it going to run is it going to run for n by 4 times for i equals to 4 so see what happens is when when i takes a value 2 when i takes a value 2 we cut 4 we say that now 4 is not a prime because 4 is a multiple of 2 and before running this loop we are always checking whether i is prime or not is 4 a prime no 4 is not a prime so this loop the inner loop is going to run how many times exactly zero times this if case is going to fail for 4 right for 5, it is going to run for n by 5 times. For 6, this is going to run for, again, 0 times 6 is not a prime. For 7, this is going to run for n by 7 times, right? So can you see a pattern here? If, if we have to add all these time complexities, what will, what will we get? We'll be getting n by 2 plus n by 3 plus n by 5 plus n by 7 and so on. What are these? If, if you take n common from here, you get 1 by 2 plus 1 by 3 plus 1 by 5 plus 1 by 7 plus 1 by 11 plus 1 by 13 and so on. What are all these? These are nothing but sum of reciprocals of prime numbers, right? First n prime numbers basically, correct? So I can say this, this is equal to i equals to 1 to n 1 by p. All the prime numbers, the, the first n prime numbers or maybe all the prime numbers which are less than n. Right? All the prime numbers which are less than n. This is the time complexity. Now, if if you are really, really good at mathematics, you will be able to, you, you will be knowing that this whole sum can be approximated to log of log of n. Okay. So this is the overall time complexity of Seed's algorithm. Okay. So if you are really good or if you are interested in mathematics, you can uh, read about the Merton's theorem, which proves this thing. Okay, that sum of reciprocal of first n prime numbers is same as log of log of n. So the overall time complexity can be appro approximated as order of n into log of log of n. Okay. Uh, okay. I will I will quickly brief over the time complexity part once again. Okay. So if uh, we we are just checking for every value of i, how many times is the inner loop going to run? Okay. So I said that if i is equal to 2, how many times is the inner loop going to run? Inner loop is going to start from 2. We are uh, come, we are assuming the most unoptimized version. We are removing all the optimizations that we had done. So inner loop will start from 2 and it will run for n by 2 times. Right? If, if you are starting from 2 and you have to go till 40, you will be running 20 times. Right? You will cut 20 numbers in this loop. Similarly, for i equals to 3, you will be running the inner loop for n by 3 times. For i equals to 4, now this is a very important thing that before running the inner loop, you always check whether this number is prime or not. 4 is not a prime. So for 4, the inner loop will never run. For i equals to 5, uh, the, the loop runs for n by 2, uh, n by 5. Then for 6, again, since since 6 is composite, loop does not run. Then for i equals to 7, loop runs for i uh, n by 7 and so on. So if you add all of them, right, because then you have to calculate the time complexity, you will be adding how many times uh, the inner loop is running in total, right? And that will be the overall time complexity. So if you add all of them, you get this series. Here, if you take n common, then you get something which is nothing but the sum of reciprocal of all the prime numbers. And if you apply Merton's theorem, if you are aware about the Merton's theorem, 
you will be knowing that sum of reciprocal of all the prime numbers can be approximated as log of log of n. So that is why the time complexity of C algorithm is order of n log of log of n. Okay. Now this is the most relaxed uh, time complexity that we have achieved because we removed all the optimization, right? The, uh, the optimization that uh, says that the first loop should run only till square root of time. This loop should start from I. We have removed all of them and then we have calculated. So whatever, if, if you do any optimization here, your algo is definitely going to be better than this time complexity, okay? <clears throat> the question is, will this work for a range whose first element is not a prime number? This is only going to work if you are starting it from two. If you are starting from any random number, this algorithm is never going to work, right? Because you have to make sure that all the composite numbers are cut. So if let's say you are start, if you are trying to find the numbers in the range from 40 to 100, right? So you have these numbers. And now if you start cutting the numbers uh, from, from 40, you're, you're trying to cut the multiples of 40. This is not what Sieves is suggesting. Sieves is saying, give me the first prime number. What is the first prime number? First prime number is two. Cut all the multiples of the first prime number, not the first prime number in this range. The first prime number overall, right? So you will always be starting, or uh, this algorithm will only work if you are starting cutting the numbers from two. However, if you have to find the numbers in a range, what, what you can do is, you can pre-compute all the prime numbers. So what you can do is, if you have what, what would be the maximum value of range, then starting from two to that range, you can pre-compute all the prime numbers, okay? Once you have all the prime numbers in this range, now what you can do is, you can, uh, this, this array is going to be a sorted array, so you can apply binary search and you can find all the positions of the uh, LH prime number and RH prime number and print all the values, okay? Cool, is the, is the Sieves algorithm clear to everyone, including the idea, the intuition and the code, is everything clear to everyone? Great, now, now what we'll do is, we'll try to see a problem, okay? So we, we still have uh, 30 minutes, so we'll try to solve a very, very good problem, which is a very commonly asked problem, and a very generic problem, okay? The problem says that given a number, <clears throat> return the prime factorization of this number. What is prime factorization? So is everyone here clear with the thing that any composite number can be written as the multiple of all prime numbers, not all prime numbers, but uh, multiple of prime numbers. Is everyone clear with this thing? So if, if, if I give you n is equal to 24, what would be, what would be the prime factorization of 24? 24 can be written as 2 into 2 into 2 into 3. Basically, 8, 3 is 24, right? So 8 is nothing but 2 raised to the power 3. So 24 can be written as this. So the prime factorization of 24 would be 2, 2, 2, and 3. This is what you have to return. Okay, is the problem clear to everyone? If, if the value of n, let's say, is 10, you will be returning 2 into 5, okay? If, if the value of n, let's say, is uh, 42, then we have 2, 3 and 7. Okay. Is the problem clear to everyone? Given a number n, you have to return the prime factorization of n. Prime factorization means you have to uh, represent that number in terms of only prime numbers. And that is possible for each and every number, right? Because any number either will be a, 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 a prime number or a composite number. If it is a composite number, you can further divide it into prime numbers, right? For example, if n is 24, you can write it as 2 to 2 into 3. Uh, there can be many ways. Can there be many ways? Varun, just try to think and figure out. Can there be many ways? If you are if you are breaking down the number into prime numbers, not composite number, none of the numbers in the returned array should be a composite number. Okay, what what can be? Uh, what is the first thing that comes to the mind? So if let's say I am given twenty four and I have to, so we we must all must have done this in school, right? We all have done the prime factorization of the number in school in the elementary mathematics, right? This was, I think, in sixth class, maybe, or fifth class, when we learned about the prime numbers, right? So how did how did we used to do it at that time? So if I'm given 24, what will I try to do? I will pick what is the smallest number with which I can divide it, right? So the smallest number that I can figure out is 2. So I will try to divide 24 with 2. I get 12, okay? And this 2 gets added to my answer. Now I have got 12 
and I know uh, that again I have to do the exact same thing. Find the smallest number with which I can divide this, and that number obviously should be greater than one, right? So again, here also the smallest number that I can think of is two. So I divide it with two, I get six. Again, I can divide it with two, so I get three. Now three, the smallest number that can divide three, bigger than one is three, so I get finally one. All these numbers are definitely going to be a prime number because we are always selecting the smallest number. Right? If that smallest number is not a prime number, then there must be a number which is smaller than this that can divide this number. Does this make sense to everyone? What I'm trying to say is, if there is a number x, which is the smallest number, which is dividing uh, 24, and x is not a prime number, if it is not a prime number, then it must be a composite number, and then it can be broken down into two prime numbers, at least, right? So 24 will also be divisible by these two. So that means x was not the smallest number that can divide it. There are smaller numbers than x which can divide 24. So using this proof by contradiction, I can always say that the smallest number which is able to divide any number is going to be a prime number. Okay. Now, how to code this thing? I'm just going to code the same approach that we used in our fifth, sixth class mathematics, right? So to do this, First, we can initialize uh, an answer array or maybe a prime factor array. And what, what we are going to do is, so here in this case, I, I just used my mind and, uh, and saw that this is divisible by 2. But for computer, we'll have to check with every number starting from 2, right? What is the first number that divides 24? And then keep dividing it by that number till it is divisible, right? So I will start from 2 and I will say, that this has to go till somewhere and then i plus plus and then i will say while this is divisible if it is not divisible then it will not go inside the loop but if it is divisible first of all add this i to the answer so we'll do prime fact dot add i okay add this to the answer and then divide divide n so n will become n by i okay so what, what we are doing in this case is n is initially 24, right? We are starting from i and we are, uh, and the first value of i is 2. So we are checking if it is divisible. If it is divisible, then keep dividing it till it is divisible. So we divide it, make it 12, n becomes 12. Then the loop still checks that this is still divisible by 2. So keep dividing it, keep dividing it, and also keep adding it to the answer. So the answer will have 2, then in the next step again 2, and then again 2. Then you have three, so this is this will break out because now n mod uh, three is not divisible. Sorry, n mod, mod two is not divisible. N has now become three, right? Three mod two is not equal to zero, so we'll increment the value of i. So i now becomes three. So then we'll check n mod three is now divisible. So we'll add three to this and uh, we'll divide n further. So now n becomes one. Okay. So uh, the question is, till when this loop should run? What should be the breaking condition here? What can be the maximum number that I can take? The maximum number that I can take is, we may use set instead of array. No, you cannot take set because set will guarantee that the occurrence of every number will be limited to exactly once. Whereas we need three twos. If you are taking a set, you will have exactly one two, right? So set is not useful in this case. You'll have to take a list, array list uh, or array, which supports multiple occurrences of same character, right? Okay, so what, what should be the maximum value that I can take? The maximum value that I can take, obviously, is going to be square root of n, right? So the i that we are going to uh, increment is going to be till square root of n, okay? Now, uh, this code is going to print all the prime factors for us. I can see that there are two mistakes in this code, two very big mistakes. Can you guys quickly figure out them? This code has two blenders. And one of them is the most, most commonly done mistake while writing a code. Even when people write uh, the most simplest of the codes, they make this type of mistakes. Can you quickly figure that out? It doesn't work for 0 and 1. Yes. So this is guaranteed in the input that n will always be greater than 1. Because even the question, who is, uh, the person who is asking the question knows that 0 and 1 will not be, uh, are not eligible for this question. Okay. Right, so I can see that one of the mistake has been pointed out. Uh, the other mistake, no one is able to guess. Hmm, let us see, let us see what we are doing. 
uh, let us quickly reiterate over the code. We are saying that i is starting from two. I should go. What is the maximum limit that I is taking? It is taking square root of n. So here, instead of this, I would be writing what? Actually, square root of n. Or maybe uh, to keep it optimized, let us have i into i less than equal to n. Right? This is the more optimized version of the same thing. Okay. So what we are doing here is we are initializing i. We are checking that i should not go more than square root of n. And inside this loop, what we are doing is we are changing the value of n. Correct? n is changed inside this loop n is also there in the breaking condition so initially we started this loop with an assumption that n is going to be 24 so the maximum value that i can take is going to be root 24 in the next iteration you changed n to 12 so this loop here now this this condition is not going to hold true because n has been changed this is the most common mistake that i have seen students doing while writing most easiest of the codes if you are changing a value inside the loop you should never be taking it in the breaking condition so always do one thing assign some variable this value and then use it here okay otherwise you will see uh, your code behaving in very unexpected way and you will not be able to realize uh, what is going wrong wrong there okay so assign the value and then keep it inside the loop this is one mistake what is the other mistake the other mistake most of you have already pointed out, which is if 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 the number is already prime, right? If the number is already prime, uh, or maybe number is uh, having uh, the number is having a, a prime factor which is greater than square root of n, right? If a number is having a prime factor which is greater than square root of n, for example, let us talk about 404. Okay, so for 404, how will this loop run? We'll start from two. We check that 404 is divisible by two. We divide it. Okay. Then we again check that this is again divisible by two. We divide it. Now this is not. So we have added two and two in the array. Now this is not divisible by two. Then this is not divisible by three. And what would be uh, what would be the maximum value of that I will be taking in case of 404? The maximum value that I can take is going to be 20, right? Because the square of 21 is going to be greater than 404, right? So the maximum value of I is going to be 20. But we can see that for all these values of i, the prime factorization of 404 is not complete, right? So what we can say in this case, right? Because this, this is not complete, 101 would also have been there, correct? So this is another mistake in this code. How to, fi how to fix that mistake? Can I say, can I say that even after removing all the uh, possible prime factors from that number, if I have got a number which is greater than one, that number must be a prime number. Can I say this? So to, to just to, to actually fix this code, can I just add another if condition? It says that if, if this uh, number is still not reduced to one, that means that this number has to be a prime number. So directly add this remaining number as well. So what we'll do here is if n greater than one, then prime factor dot add n. We'll add this line here itself after the for loop completes. So if this number is not been reduced to one, we will add 101 as well, and we will get the correct answer. Does this make sense to everyone? So this is uh, about prime factorization. What is going to be the time complexity here? What is the time complexity of this code? So calculating the time complexity is pretty easy here, right? Uh, the, the first loop runs for how many times? The first loop runs for root n time. OK. Then the second loop runs for? The second loop is going to run for how many times? We are dividing the number uh, n by i every time in every iteration. So how many times the second loop is going to run? The second loop is going to run for log n time. So what should be the time complexity? Is it going to be root n into log n? Is the time complexity going to be root n into log n? No, right? This is wrong. This is not going to be root n multiplied by log n. Okay. Why? We we can we can quickly see that this loop runs for root n times. And here we are dividing the number by i every time. In the worst case, the value of i is going to be 2. So in the worst case, 
if you are dividing n by i how many times can you divide it if if given a number how many times can you divide that by 2 this is given by log right this is given by log of 16 log whatever is the value of log of 16 you can divide 16 that many times by 2 right but this is incorrect why so let us try to analyze what is going on here so if if we have a value if we have a value let's say let's take 16 itself okay so in, in the first iteration when the value of i is equal to 2 we check that this is divisible and we divide it so we get 8 then again we divide it by 2 we get 4 again we divide it by 2 we get 2 again we divide it by 2 we get 1 okay now after we have divided completely with 2 For the next value of i, which is equal to three, how many times is the inner loop going to run? For three, how many times is the inner loop going to run? Zero times, right? Inner loop is not going to run because this has already been reduced to one. Okay. If this has already been reduced to one, now this inner loop will never run again. If this inner loop is not going to run again, for three, number of iterations are going to be zero. For four, the number of iterations are going to be zero, right? So. What is the total number of times, including all i's, the, the inner loop is running? For all the i's, the inner loop is going to run for log n time. This is not for each and every i. This is for all the i's combined. For two, it runs for log base two n. Then for three, it runs for uh, log base three n if n is there, right? So if, if let us talk about any other number. So if I talk about twenty-four, two can reduce it to twelve. Then two can reduce it to six. Then two can reduce it to three. Now. Three is not going to have log base three twenty four these many steps because three is going to reduce this number which has already been reduced by two right so the total number of steps including all the i's combined is going to be log of n so this is going to be log of n plus square root of n which is nothing but square root of n so the time complexity of this algorithm is going to be exactly square root of n not root n log n okay. Guys, in, in mathematics, there are multiple topics which are very, very important uh, for 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 programming point of view or both the interview point of uh, point of view as well, right? So there there is modular arithmetic that that you must learn and you must solve multiple problems on this. Okay, then there is GCD, the LCM, and HCF problems. Okay, GCD is also very very important concept. Okay. then of course you you definitely have the prime numbers uh and in the prime numbers you you can also uh, optimize this approach that we have discussed right you can optimize this approach using a concept called the smallest prime factor of a number which is called the spf which we haven't discussed in the class but this is also a very important concept okay so uh, after the class please go through this what is spf and how you can actually uh, optimize this, this algorithm using the smallest prime factor okay and then in the modular arithmetic there is also fermat theorem which is very important so just google all these concepts uh, and go through all of them try to solve problem based on all of them okay they all are very very important they will help you uh, in problem solving as well as in interviews okay cool so uh, this is it for today's class if you like the video if you like uh, if you understood everything please like please share it with your friends uh, please tell us in comment which all topics uh, you would want us to discuss next okay tomorrow's class is going to be on bit manipulation so if possible before joining the class if you can go through uh, how numbers are represented or what what are the basic bit operations then uh, the class will go very smoothly right so next class is going to be on bit manipulation so just read about some bit wise operators like or and xor uh, left shift right shift etc just read about them and if you found this video useful you can just like it and share it with your friends okay hello everyone in this video we will study about arrays and its fundamentals arrays is basically a simple data structure that can also be used to build complex or composite data structures like stacks and queues in this video we will discuss about arrays and we will see what all different operation can be performed using arrays and how arrays are stored in computer's memory so let's start with the definition of arrays arrays is a collection or systematic arrangement of objects of same data types 
Data types can be integer, character, double, etc. Now let's say if we want to declare an integer array, then let's see how we will do that. We will first write the data type, then the variable name, and then the size of the array. So this is the data type, which can be character, float, double, etc. This is the variable name. And this is the size of the array. Now let's see where the concept of array is useful in computer programming. So let's take a case where we have to store marks of 10 students in the class. And we have to find the average marks of all the students in the class. So if we use the integer variables, we can have 10 different integer variables m1, m2, m3, m4 and so on up till m10 where each variable corresponds to the marks of the student in the class and in order to find the average first we need to find the sum of marks which can be calculated using m1 plus m2 plus m3 plus m4 and so on up till m10 then we can easily find the average using the formula sum divided the size that is 10 in our case because the class has 10 students now let's say instead of 10 students if we have 100 students in the class then you can easily said see that it will be very difficult to have 100 different variables so instead of that we can easily form an array of data type integer and size 100 we know the indexing of the array starts from 0 so m0 will represent the marks of first student in the class m1 will represent the marks of second student in the class m2 will represent the marks of third student in the class up till m99 which will represent the marks of 100 student in the class also you can see that to find the sum using m0 plus m1 plus m2 up till m99 will also not be a good idea. So instead of that, we can easily run a for loop and let's see. So first we will have some array which will be initialized to 0. Then we can run a for loop which is starting from 0 and going till 99. And we can easily update sum as sum plus marks of ith student and in order to find the average we can again use the same formula which is sum divided by total number of students in the class which is 100 you can clearly see that it will work even if the class has 1000 students or even more than that so this is a clear example how arrays are very useful we can also have arrays of different data types. So in this case, we are declaring an array of integer data type, but we can also have arrays of character, float, and so on of different data types. And also this is an example of one dimensional array, but we can have arrays of two dimension, three dimension, and so on. Now let us see how arrays are stored in computer's memory. So computer memory is divided into segments or partition and computer memory can be considered as a very large array of bytes. So each segment is representing one byte of memory. And in computer architecture, each byte of memory has an address. So we can assume the bottom most address is zero. Then as we go up, we have address 1, address 2 and so on. So let's take address of this byte as 100, then this as 101, then this as 102 and so on. In C and C++, we also have pointer variables that can store these address. Now let us take our array again. So we have an array of data type integer and let's take the size 5. We know the size of integer is 4 bytes and the total number of elements in our array is 5 and every element is having 4 bytes 
So total size of the array becomes 20 bytes. Now when the program executes, the computer will allocate 20 bytes to this array. So you can assume that this 4 bytes will be given to A of 0 and computer will give continuous segments. So basically array of 1 will definitely have these 4 bytes, array of 2 will have above this and so on. Now since memory allocation is continuous, so access and modification of the array element becomes very easy and the SS or modification of the array element takes order of one time that is order of one time complexity now let us see how so basically arrays a is also known as the pointer to the first element of the array and a also represent the base address so let us see using a c program how we can see the value of address and the value stored at that particular address so let us go to a c program and let's declare the integer array of size 5 now if you will execute this statement printf percentage d is used for integers backslash n is used for next line and you will try to print a this will print the base address or the address of first element of the array and also if you will try to print the value at this address which will also be an integer you know in C we can print the values using x star so star a will print the value of first element of the array now we see that we have only declared the array we have not initialized the array so at this point of time this will print a garbage value or any random value so if we want to test it properly let's also initialize the array so array of 0 let's make it equal to 2 array of 1 let's make it equal to 4 array of 2 let's make it equal to 5 array of 3 let's make it equal to 8 and array of 1 let's make it equal to equal to 1 now if you will print this again the base address will be printed but the value will not be any random value instead this will print 2 which is the value of the first element of the array or the index 0 now if you will try to execute a statement like this that is the address of the next element that is a plus 1 this will give you the address of the next element that is second element now let's say if the value of base address is 100 this will return the value 104 why because this is a pointer to the first element of the array that is base address and this is known as an offset now offset increase the address of the base address by the size of the data type in our case we are using an integer variable integer has size 4 bytes so this will increase the address by 4 bytes so if the base was 100 in this case 104 will be printed now as we mentioned the ss is in order of 1 so let's say if we have to print the second value or the value of second element we can easily run this which will be an integer because we are having an integer array 
An extract sign we know is used to print the value of particular address. So this statement will print the value of the second element, which we can clearly see is 4 in our case. Now, SS is order of 1 because as we have seen, when we want to try or we want to find any element in the array, the address is calculated using base address plus the offset. So let's take an example. If we have to find the value of the third element of the array, we can either write it like this, that is value basically of the fourth element, which is the third index. And it can also be seen like this, that is base address plus the offset and the value at that offset. Now, please note that the pointer arithmetics only applies in C and C++ because Java do not support pointer variables, but the internal working will be similar. So this was the basics of arrays and how they are stored in memory. In coming videos, we will study more about arrays. So I hope this video was helpful and thank you everyone. So my name is Shitesh and I will be discussing about arrays in today's class. Okay. So in today's class, we are going to discuss some challenging problems on arrays, which can be solved just by, uh, just by the knowledge of arrays. In tomorrow's class, we'll be discussing some more challenging problems on 2D arrays. And then uh, in the upcoming classes, we'll be discussing about, uh, about sorting. Okay. So in the next four or five classes, we'll be discussing about uh, arrays and sorting algorithms. Okay. So before we start the class, uh, I just want your uh, your opinion on have, have you guys ever worked with arrays? Have you guys ever used arrays? Are you guys familiar with what is an array? Arrays are nothing but collection of same type of data, right? You can have an array of integers, you can have an array of uh, strings, you can have an array of floating point uh, data structure, or you can e even have an array of objects, right? So array is nothing but a collection of data. And arrays, all the values in the arrays are stored in continuous memory locations, right? So if you have an array A of size 5, and if this is your memory, all these uh, array elements are going to be stored in continuous memory chunks, right? So they are always in a sequence. Correct. Homogeneous collection of data. Absolutely correct. Okay. Now, uh, in today's class, we are going to see some of the problems which do not require any algorithm, which do not require knowledge of any other data structure other than arrays. Okay. And these problems have been asked in Google, they have been asked in Facebook, they have been asked in Amazon. So if you are just familiar with arrays and if you have a basic logic building uh, or problem solving skills, you can attempt these problems. Okay. Uh, right. So regarding the language, so most of you are asking in which language are we going to discuss the problems, right? So let's let's keep the session language agnostic. Okay, we'll be discussing the logic, we will be discussing the pseudocode, but all the logics that we are going to discuss, they will be language agnostic. So whether you are coding with C, C++, Java, Python, Ruby, doesn't matter. You can apply those logics, you can apply the same solution in any language. Okay, so keep things language agnostic and let's focus on the problem solving techniques. Okay. One more th thing guys that with the class, you will also be getting the problems that we are going to discuss. You will get the exact same problems. You will also get some variations of these problems. Okay. So that you can uh, test your knowledge there. Right. So I strongly recommend all of you to attempt those problems because if you are just listening in the class uh, and, and you feel that you, are, you have understood everything. You might understand things, but after a while, you will forget. So it's always better to reinforce your knowledge by practicing those problems. Okay, So I will strongly recommend you guys to solve all the problems which are provided in the description link. Okay, cool. So let us start uh, the session with a very, very interesting problem. And this problem was asked in uh, in Amazon, this has been asked in Facebook, this has been asked in Google. Okay, the problem says that you are given an array, and in this array, you 
you are having uh, heights of some buildings okay so you can consider that these are 2d buildings two dimensional buildings with uh, a width of of size 1 and the height is given to you in an array okay so let's say that this is uh, the array in which you have all the heights of the buildings okay now you can see this picture so these these are the buildings right and and these black bars are are the buildings and uh, it's it's raining heavily in the city so you have got some clouds and it's actually raining heavily and because of the rain there is some water which is being trapped between the buildings okay so these are the clouds not so good looking clouds but yes they there are clouds and you can see some water being trapped in between the buildings so given the heights of the buildings you have to identify what is the total amount of water which is being trapped in, in between these buildings okay is the problem making sense so aap logo array mein buildings ya bars ki height diye hue hain and wahan pe shehar mein bahut tez barish ho rahi hai to kyunki ye two dimensional world hai yahan pe kuch water trap ho raha hai in buildings ke beech mein okay aapko batana hai ki टोटल कितना अमाउंट है वाटर का जो कि ट्रैप हो रहा है ओके राइट दिस दिस इज अ वेरी वेरी फेमस प्रॉब्लम इट इज कॉल्ड ट्रैपिंग रेन वाटर दिस इज अ प्रॉब्लम ऑफ दिस इज अ प्रॉब्लम व्हिच इज प्रेजेंट इन ईच एंड एवरी प्लेटफार्म दिस इज इन लीड कोर दिस इज इन इंटरव्यू बिट दिस इज इन गीक्स फॉर गीक्स दिस इज इन हैकर आई थिंक दिस इज प्रेजेंट इन ईच एंड एवरी प्लेटफार्म बिकॉज़ दिस इज वेरी वेरी फ्रीक्वेंटली आस्क्ड प्रॉब्लम राइट सो व्हाट इज द आंसर फॉर दिस केस हियर वी कैन सी दैट 6 यूनिट ऑफ वाटर इज बीइंग right right one unit here then you have one unit here one unit here so let's actually draw the squares right this is one unit of water then you have one unit of water here then you have one unit of water here one unit here one unit here and one unit here right so you have got six units of water being trapped between these buildings here okay now the question is that given the array you have to identify you have to uh, calculate the total amount okay how to approach this problem okay so there is focus on what is contributing to the total amount how do we calculate the total amount so how, how have we counted the total amount of water in this case to count the total amount of water what have we done we have just counted what is the amount of water trapped above each and every bar right so if if i count what is the total amount of water trapped above each and every bar and if i just add that that would be the answer for example here this bar length is zero so this bar is having zero amount of water trapped here the bar length is one but even then the amount of water trapped above it is zero here the amount of water trapped above this bar of length zero is one Right. similarly here we have zero amount of water above this bar we have one unit of water right similarly above this bar we have two units of water here we have one then again zero zero then one zero and zero so if if we just add all of these we will get the answer if if we just add the uh, the amount of water or the size of the water column trapped above each and every building we get the answer now the question is how to get the amount of water trapped above each and every bar right so we have reduced the problem from finding the total amount of water to count what is the what is the amount of water trapped above each and every bar but how to do that okay again let's let's make some more observations here. so we have seen that the amount trapped above this bar is zero okay why is this amount zero why is it not non zero why is this amount why is this bar not able to trap any amount of water above it simple reason is that there is nothing on the left side to hold the water right there is something on the right side but if if the water falls here there, there is nothing on the left to hold it Right. If if there had been a bar on the left side, then you would be getting some water here. But there is nothing on the left side, so you can just consider this as a vessel which is of uh, of this L shape, right? 
you can consider this scenario as a l shaped vessel if you fill any liquid inside a l shaped vessel it will just flow from here right you cannot trap the uh, liquid with in a vessel which does not have the boundary right so that's why here we have zero amount of water now what about this part this also has uh, this also has zero amount of water what is the reason for that this is not known this has to be zero what is the reason for this again the same reason this part also does not does not have anything on the left side to hold the water right that's why this is also not trapping anything when we come to this bar this bar has got a size 0 but it is able to trap a water column of height 1 simple reason being it has got something on the left and something on the right as well so now this is forming a complete vessel right so it, it can hold water uh, a water column of size 1 now we come to this bar again this this has got a bar which is on the left side if i am talking about this bar here this has got a bar on the left side even after that this bar is not able to hold any water why because the bar which we have on the left side has got a smaller height right if you have to hold some water above this bar you need something on the left and something on the right of a higher height right so you can assume that this is the surface of your vessel now this bar here is below the surface right so you need something which is higher the surface then only you can trap some water inside this correct so that is why this is also not able to trap anything now when when you come here this has got something on the left and something on the right as well correct so one thing which is very clear from this observation is that to trap the water you definitely need something on the left side something on the right side of a higher height than the current bar right this bar is not able to trap because it doesn't have anything on the left this bar is able to trap because it has a support on the left side as well as on the right side so it has got uh, both the boundaries correct right? cool now the question is how do we uh, so we have determined that some of the bars will not be able to hold but the bars which are holding the water how much water is going to be there okay now to do that to to actually analyze that let's consider a very simple example first okay so let's say that the heights of the bars are 2 1 and 3 so we have got a bar of size 2 then we have got a bar of size 1 and then we have got a bar of size 3 and we are talking about this middle bar we we have to identify what is the amount of water being trapped above this middle bar okay this has got height 2 this has got height 1 this has got height can you guys quickly respond what is the amount of water which will be trapped above this bar the size of the water column here is it going to be 1 is it going to be 2 is it going to be 3 it's going to be 1 right why 1 because the height on the left side is this this height is of size 2 right and we have this bar till height 1 so the only limited space that we have for the water is this column anything above it will flow from here correct okay let's change the example let's add some more bars here okay so initially we have this configuration where we have bar of size 2 1 and 3 now i am going to add one more bar on the left side and this bar is also of length 3 now how much water will be trapped above this bar is it still going to be one or now will will we have some more water here yes it's going to be two this time why because now we have got a higher support on the left side right so if if it is continuously raining all this area will be filled with water right and now we can see that this column the height of this column has now become 2 right the height of the water column trapped above the uh, above this bar has now become 2 height of the water column above this bar has now become 2 okay why has it become 2 in this case it was 1 now it has become 2 what is the reason 
what is the reason the reason is the addition of this bar right let's add some more bars okay let us add some more bars to this configuration so i will be adding a bar on the left side let's raise a bar of size 4 will the height of the water column uh, stored above this will increase if i have just added a bar on on the right side of length 4 will the height of the water column above this bar is it going to increase no right because on the left side it is still 3 on the left side the maximum that we can have is still 3 anything above it is going to flow from here if we also add another bar of size 4 on the left side as well now will it increase yes now it's going to increase because from both the sides we have got a height of size 4 right so is is this complete observation making sense to you guys the height of the water column stored above any height is nothing but the minimum of the maximum height that you can get on the left side and the maximum height that you can get on the right side correct the height of the water column stored above this is minimum of maximum height available on right and maximum height available on the left so if i have to identify what is the height of this column right height of water column above bar i this is equal to this is nothing but the minimum of maximum bar on left side maximum bar on right side minus the height of bar i so if i am talking about if this is my ith bar the water column trapped above this bar is how much this is minimum of maximum of left maximum of right minus the height of this current bar if i have to calculate the total amount of water this is just going to be the sum of all such values correct so the answer that we are going to calculate sum of this value for each and every height right sum of minimum of left max right max minus height of bar so i will be calculating the minimum of left max minimum uh, and right max for each and every bar subtract the height of that bar and keep adding it so whatever we get at the end is going to be the answer correct let's quickly do this thing on the given example right what is the minimum uh, what is the minimum on the left side for this minimum on the left side for the first bar is zero there is nothing on the left sorry ma maximum on the left side right maximum on the right side is this bar of length 3 but since we are taking the minimum of left max and right max minimum becomes zero zero minus the height of the bar is zero right so this is not going to hold anything what about the first one again left max is minimum uh, left max is zero so uh, we won't be getting anything right for this bar for for this water column the left max is is 1 right the right max is 3 so minimum of left and right is 1 minus the the height of this bar which is 0 so this is going to hold 1 unit of water right so if we do the same thing for each and every bar we are going to get the answer let's also see for this column so here what is the left max left max has got a height 2 right max has got a height 3 minimum of 2 and 3 is 2 so this bar is going to hold 2 minus the height of this which is 0 this much amount of water so we just have to do this thing for each and every bar and we add whatever amount is trapped over that bar and we get the answer okay Okay, let's let's do this in this example. Let me just clean it up a bit. Let's try to calculate what is the total amount of water that will be trapped in this scenario. Okay, if this is the landscape of the buildings that we have, what will be the total amount of water trapped here? Okay, so we are saying that the total amount of water trapped is the sum of water trapped above each and every building. What if negative heights are not going to be negative? 
right? Negative height means that you are digging a hole and then you are, so it's basically kind of a plane. So you can assume that such buildings with negative heights are not possible, okay? Okay, let's, let's uh, try to run our approach on this thing, okay, on this scenario. So for this building, what is the maximum height on left side? Maximum height on left is zero. Maximum height on right is four. For the first building, the answer is going to be zero, right? For the second building, maximum height on right is four. Oh, sorry, maximum height on left is four. Maximum height on right is also four, right? So we'll be getting minimum of these two minus whatever is the height of the building, which is three. So this is going to contribute one unit of water, okay? Then uh, in the next building, so the one unit of water comes here. In the next building, we will be checking minimum of, what is the left max? Left max is still four. What is the right max? Right max is still four. Building size is two. So we get two units of water above this, okay? Similarly, for the next buildings, again, uh, left max, right max are four and four. Building height is one. So we get three units of water above this. Okay. Similarly, we'll be doing for this as well and this as well. And once we add all these values, we'll be getting the answer. Okay. Cool. So now once this is clear to everyone, can you guys tell me what is going to be the time complexity of this approach? So for every bar, we are calculating a maximum on the left side we are calculating the maximum on the right side and then we are applying uh, this observation and getting the height. What should be the time complexity if we go by this approach? Okay, let, let me just reiterate over this example again. For uh, If I'm calculating for this bar, I will have to calculate what is the left maximum. To calculate the left maximum, I will be iterating over all the possible bars on the left side. To calculate the right maximum, I will be iterating over all possible bars on the right side. How much time is this operation going to take? This is going to take order n. How much time is this operation going to take? This is also going to take order n, right? So to calculate the water column above each and every bar, we are doing an order n operation because these two are going to get added, right? And we are going to do this operation for each and every bar. There are n bars in total. If there are n bars and for every bar, our calculation requires order n time complexity. What is going to be the total time complexity? Right? So there are n bars. For every bar, we are going to do order n operation. So the total time complexity is going to be order n squared. Okay? Can we optimize this order n time complexity. In the last class, you must have learned that order n is not a very good time complexity, right? Yes, Vijender, you are absolutely correct. Uh, right, guys. So, to, to optimize the time complexity, again, let's make a very, very simple observation, right? So, till now, we have deduced that for every bar, we have to calculate the left max and the right max, okay? Let's talk about the last bar, okay? If I'm talking about the last bar, then we are calculating the left max for the last bar. How, how actually we calculate the maximum for this? The order and operation of the maximum or finding the maximum, how do we run it? So we will be declaring a max, right? And we'll keep updating it after visiting each and every bar. So we'll initialize a maximum value. We can initialize it with a very uh, with maybe minus infinity or maybe a not possible or, or zero, maybe we can also initialize it with the length of the first bar. Okay, so we say that currently the maximum is this and we'll keep updating the maximum as soon as we visit all the bars in this order and loop, right? So if let's let's actually take a complex example. So if, if the bars are of size 2, 3, 1, 4, 5, Two, one, seven. Okay, two, nine. If these are the lengths of the bars, if I have to calculate the maximum from left for this last bar, right? Okay, I'll be starting from here. Okay, let's initialize the maximum with zero. Okay, so we are saying that 
whatever is the maximum uh, between the current maximum and the current bar is is going to become the maximum right so maximum is initialized by zero when we reach here we say that two is the maximum then when we reach here at three we compare this value with the current maximum right this is how we calculate the maximum of an array correct so we calculate current value of of the array with the current maximum so 3 becomes the maximum then we we compare this one with the current max so let's call it the current max okay again 3 remains the maximum so we'll fill 3 here so this means that till here till this point 3 has got the maximum height right or similarly uh, for the next step we'll be comparing 4 with 3 Okay, so this gives us four as the maximum. Then it gives five, and then we'll be having five, five till this point. Then we get seven, and then seven continues to go. So the maximum for on the left side for this bar is seven. Okay. Now in this process, if you have observed, what have we done? We have not only computed the max for the last bar, but we have also computed the left max for each and every bar. so if you just store all these values in an array instead of just making uh, instead of just keeping a variable of the current max if you just have an array and store all these values inside the array these values are corresponding to the maximum height on the left side for each and every index is this making sense till this point 5 is the maximum till this point again 5 is the maximum right till this point 7 is the maximum so while you are calculating the maximum value for the last bar you have not only calculated the maximum on left for the last but you have also calculated the maximum for each and every index so in in a single iteration we have the values of left max for each and every value okay let let me just repeat let's clear each and everything here let's do it once again okay so when we have to calculate when we have to calculate the maximum on the left for the last bar first of all is everyone clear that we will be calculating the left max for each and every bar and right max for each and every bar yes now for let's let's talk about this guy let's talk about this bar if you have to calculate the left max you will be iterating over this part of the array right you will maintain a left max for this bar and you will keep updating that left max while visiting the array right you will initialize a left max with zero you will check uh, whether zero is greater or this is a value is greater right so you will keep updating this left max while updating the uh, while iterating over the array similarly you will do the same thing for the right max as well correct now let's talk about the last element let's not talk about the middle element let's talk about the last element when we are doing it for the last element we are actually calculating the left max for each and every index right left max till now is zero right or or let's call it two here so we have initialized the left max by two or uh, by zero we compare it with two we get uh, two here then we get three here right then we get three again here then we get four here five here five continues till we get a longer height which is 7 right and again we get 7 here what if 9 is not present then also you do the same thing if if 9 is not present you have one bar less in your uh, in your structure then you will be when you calculate the left max for the last index doesn't matter whether it is 9 or any other number when you are calculating the left max for the last index you have actually calculated the left max for each and every index in this process the only thing is that you will have to store these values instead of updating the current max variable if you just store these values in the array you get the left max for each and every index similarly while calculating the right max for this uh, for this index the first index you will be calculating the right max for each and every value correct because to calculate the right max for the first index you will be iterating from from the right side and you will be you will keep updating all the values one by one right 
So you start from here till now, the max is 2, then you get 7, and then 7 continues to be the max till now. Okay. So is this observation making sense? The observation is that we don't need to run this order n loop for each and every index. Because when you are calculating the left max for the rightmost element, and when you are calculating the right max for the leftmost element, you are essentially calculating each and every value which is required in this calculation. So instead of instead of running these two loops of of order n on each and every index, what we can do is we can just run a single loop and we can store all the required data. We can do some pre-computation. Okay. We need to extra arrays. Yes, we will be needing to extra arrays. Let's call this array as the left max array. And let's call this array as the right max array. Okay. If we had stored these values, can you guys now tell me what will be the amount of water stored over any ith index, stored over any ith bar? If I talk about this bar, what will be the answer? What will be the amount of water stored over this bar? We need the maximum bar. We need the maximum bar on the left side of this. From where can we get it? The maximum bar on left side of this bar is here, right? We have already calculated it. The maximum bar, the maximum bar on the right side of this bar is present here. If, if, if we are talking about the ith index, the left max is stored at left max i minus 1 and the right max is stored at right max i plus 1. Okay. You don't need to run two loops for each and every number. We can just pre-compute the left max and right max for each and every index. And using these values, now we can, again, we can have a different loop and we can get these values in order one, okay? What if we store in the ith index itself? Will that work? That will definitely work, Anushka. You will just have to check. Uh, like you can also store for every ith index, you can store what is the uh, leftmost, uh, left max height at this index and right max height in, uh, at this index. You will just have to uh, calculate, you will have to like uh, this, you will have to keep check on the corner cases okay if, if you are able to keep checks on the corner cases then that will also work okay so let's let's quickly see the pseudo code okay so we can have a left max array okay uh, what will be the size of this array size of the array is going to be same as the size of the input array because for each and every index we want this information right so its size should be equal to n, whatever is the size of the input array, correct? And similarly, we'll also be having a, a right max array, which will store, uh, which will store the right max for each and every part. Okay. Then let us initialize these values. So we can say that left max of zero can be initialized from the array zero. Okay, and right max of of uh, Okay, let's let's come to the right max after we finish this, right? So we have initialized this for the zeroth index. That means I'm saying that for zeroth index, this is the answer. The height of uh, the bar is the answer. Now for the remaining bars, we can just run a loop, which will start from some point, go till n, and will be going. From where should we start the loop? Should it start from zero? Should it start from any other number? Yes, the loop is going to start from, from index 1 because we have already filled the value on index 0. So we don't need to start from index 0. Okay. And for every index, we can say that left max of i is nothing but the maximum of the previous max, which is left max of i minus 1 and the current array value. The current height. So whatever is the maximum between the current height, right? Between the current height and the previous is going to be the left max of this iteration. Okay. 
similarly in the for the next value of i we'll be comparing this value and this value okay so we have our left max uh, array filled up now we'll also initialize the right max array so for the right max array how, how did we start we started from the right side right we said that we are starting from here and let's copy the array value uh, the last array value in the last index of the right max array because for this value there is nothing on the right side so we are starting from here okay so right max of n minus 1 is going to be array of n minus 1 and now similarly we can have a, a loop which will also start from some number go till 0 and will be this is going to run from right to left so that's why we are doing i minus 1 so from where should we start it this loop will start from i n minus 1 we have already filled the value for n minus 1 right so this should not start from n minus 1 n minus 1 is some value which is pre required to compute the value at this index so we will be starting from the index n minus 1 right to calculate the value here we need to compare this value which is the previously calculated value and the current high okay so let's go back here we'll be starting this from n minus 2 and right max of i is going to be the maximum of what will come here yes it should be i plus 1 because now when i'm checking for this index i am comparing this value if if this is index i this is i plus 1 not i minus 1. in case of left left max we were comparing with the previous index now we are comparing with the next index right so this is going to be right of i plus 1 and the current array value okay so now we have got the left max and the right max array populated okay now we don't we just have to run a single loop to calculate the total amount of water trapped so you can have a variable water initialized with zero and now we can run a loop and this loop should run for each and every height so we'll start from i equals to 0 less than n we'll be incrementing the i with 1 and we can simply say keep adding uh, the amount of water trapped over each and every bar in this variable so water plus equals to or you can also write it as water equals to water plus the how do we calculate the height of water column minimum of left max right max right minus the array value of cool what is the time complexity of this approach time complexity of this is see first in this course code first we are populating the left max array for each and every bar we need what is the left max so this is going to count order n plus this array this loop is also going to uh, going to be of order n plus this loop is also going to cost order n right so the total time complexity of this approach is order yes order 3n which asymptotically is same as order n right order 3n is nothing but this is same as order n because when you calculate the time complexity you ignore the constants right h case missed right so if this is just a pseudo code okay now you have to attempt this problem you have to solve it on your own and in the code which you are writing you have to take care of all the h cases as well okay himanshu that is on you now so you have to do it on your own okay what is the space complexity guys can you tell me what is the space complexity we are using two arrays of size n right so it is going to be order n in space as well okay let's do one thing let me just tell you the problem okay this is also a very very interesting and very frequently asked problem which is called the majority element the problem says that you have given an array you have to find the majority element in that array the majority element is the element that occurs more than n by 2 times okay 
which means that the number of times that element is occurring in the array should be strictly greater than n by 2. For example, if this is your array, 3, 3, 4, 2, 4, 4, Can you guys quickly tell me what is the majority element in this array? n, which is the size of the array. What is the size of the array in this case? 9, right? Now, which is the element which is coming more than 9 by 2 times? Correct. Majority element in this case is 4 because 4 is occurring 5 times. Okay. 4 is the majority element here because 4 occurs 5 times. Let's take another example. Let's say we have 3, 3, 4, 2, 4, 4. What is the majority element in this case? Size of the array is 8. What is the majority element which is occurring more than 4 times in this case? 4 is occurring 4 times, right? But we need something which occurs more than n by 2 times. 4 is not more than 2. So in this case, we do not have any majority element. Okay? No majority element. So you have to, if there is a majority element, you have to return that element. If there is none, you can return none. Okay? This is the problem. Is the problem clear to everyone? Uh, what, what would be a brute force way to solve this problem? What if two elements are majority elements in the same array? Guys, that is a very, very interesting thing that Satyam has asked. Can there be two majority elements inside a single array? Satyam, think about it. Can there be two elements which are occurring more than n by 2 times? No, right? Uh, how 4 is greater? 4 is not greater than this, but the count of 4 is 5. right? We have to count the number of times this element is occurring. We, we are, don't have to return the element which is greater than n by 2. We have to count the number which is occurring more than n by 2 times. Okay? Uh, cool. So what is going to be the brute force solution here? Brute force solution is going to be simply you run two loops. For each and every element, you just check whether that element is a majority element or not. Select this element. In the remaining array, count the number of occurrences. If the total number of occurrences is greater than n by 2, return it. Otherwise, go to the next element. Check for this element. In the remaining array, if it is occurring more than n by 2 times, return. What is going to be this time complexity of this approach? It's going to be order n square. Why? Because you are running two loops of size n. Correct? Okay. So, brute force is not going to work. This is uh, too slow. How can we optimize it? Using hash map. Right. So, uh, some of you are saying that we can use hash maps. If, if you use a hash map, first of all, uh, how, how can we solve this problem using a hash map? So this is a very, very good suggestion that you use a... What is hash map? Is everyone clear with that? If you are not clear, you can skip this. If you are clear, you can think in this direction. Hash map is nothing but a key value pair, right? So you can have a key and you can have a value in the hash map. Now, every array element becomes the key and the frequency becomes the value. So against 3, you keep 1. Then you again go to 3. You see that 3 has already occurred in the hash map. You increase the frequency. Okay. Then you go to 4. 4 is not occurred yet. You keep it and you put 1 here. So after you have iterated all the array, yes, it, it's totally like the dictionary in Python. Okay. After you have iterated all the array, you will be having all the array elements along with their frequencies. Okay. So 4 will be 5 at the end because the frequency of 4 is going to be 5. And the frequency of 3 is going to be 2 and 2 is also going to be 2. This is the value, the array element. And this is the frequency. After you have... Uh, made this complete map, you can iterate over all the keys and you can figure out which of them is the majority element. This is one of the approach. What is going to be the time complexity of this approach? 
if you are not aware about what is a hash map you can totally skip it we will be covering hash map in details in the upcoming sessions but if you are clear about hash map then you can just think about what is the time complexity of this approach this is going to be order n time complexity correct what is the space complexity here you are using a hash map which is going to cost you order n space right order n time complexity plus order n space complexity okay you have to solve this problem in a linear time with constant space okay this has to be your time complexity this has to be your space complexity is the requirement clear to everyone you cannot use a hash map if you are not clear about the hash map approach completely skip it because this is something that you cannot use in the question okay we have to solve this problem in order and time complexity order one space complexity okay think about it this is going to be something which we'll discuss in the next class right so in today's class we'll first discuss the majority element question that we discussed uh, in the last class and then we'll solve one more problem which will be based on a two dimensional array okay so uh, the problem uh, that we left unsolved in the last class was that you are given an array and you have to find the majority element of that array the problem says that you are given an array and in this array you have to find the majority element okay the majority element is an element which is occurring more than n by 2 times more than uh, n by 2 where n is the size of the array okay so if the array size is 9 the element has to be there at least 5 times okay it is possible that there is no majority element in the array because there is there might be a possibility that there is no element which is occurring more than n by 2 times right correct so the brute force way to solve this problem as proposed by sai is that you run two loops and for every element you check the number of count uh, of that element in the array right so you will start from the first element you will select this element then you will check in the remaining part what is the total occurrences of this element okay you can then see if the total occurrences is greater than n by 2 you can return it then you will check for the next element then you will check for the next element and so on right so you will have two loops one will be selecting a, a prospect candidate the other will be checking if that element is a majority element or not this approach is going to cost you order n square time okay we discussed a more optimized approach also which was involving a hash map if you use a hash map what will be the time complexity if you use a hash map since in hash map you can store a key value pair right so a hash map is nothing but a key value pair uh, if you are using python you can uh, think in terms of a dictionary right so key can be your array element and the value can be the frequency of that array element so you iterate over the array once and you keep the count of frequency uh, of of all the elements in this hash map once everything is done or while calculating the frequency only you can just check if there is an element which occurs more than n by 2 times if any element occurs more than n by 2 times then you can return it okay so this Uh, approach is going to cost you order n time but order n space as well because you will be using hash map okay how to create hash map in c you can use unordered map in c now the question here is that we have to solve this problem in order n time complexity without using any extra space so we have to solve this problem in constant space complexity without using any extra space okay okay so most of you are saying that now you will apply the moore's voting algorithm which is absolutely correct okay okay we have one more approach the other approach says that you first sort the array if you sort the array since the majority element is going to occur more than n by 2 times right and once you sort the array all the similar elements will be arranged together right so some similar elements will be there then if there is a majority element then it will also be there and then some different elements of similar type will be arranged together 
if there is an element which is occurring more than n by 2 time once you have sorted this whole array either you can do a linear iteration or maybe you can just check the middle element and check the count of that element as well right so if if you sort the array what will be the time complexity if you are using the most uh, efficient sorting algorithm even after that what is going to be the time complexity of sorting the array it's going to be order n log n right you can use quick sort merge sort or heap sort right and all these sorts are going to run in order n log n time complexity if you are not sure about all these sort sorting algorithms we will be covering them in the upcoming classes so don't worry about it if you know if you already uh, are familiar with the sorting algorithms then you can sort these uh, this array and then you can iterate over the array and count the occurrences of all the distinct elements right so in that case the time complexity is n log n which is absolutely greater than order n right so this is again not an optimal approach okay so let's let's discuss the idea behind the most optimal approach for this problem okay let's try to change the perspective so uh, first let's consider an example let's uh, take this example only okay so if there is a majority element the question says that the majority element will be occurring more than n by 2 times right the, the count of majority element is always going to be greater than half the size of the array if there exists a majority element can i say that the collective counts of all the other elements will always be less than n by 2 if majority element exists if there is a majority element can we say that the count of all other elements combined will be less than n by 2 obviously yes right because half of the array has been occupied by the majority element if you collect all the majority elements together starting from the zeroth index and if this is the n by 2 mark the majority element will definitely occupy starting from zero it will go more than n by 2 right so the remaining space that is left in the array is obviously less than n by 2 correct okay now if this is the case if if everyone is convinced that the count of all the other elements combined is going to be less than n by 2 now let's try to see uh, this whole scenario in terms of let's say uh, election results okay let's let's actually consider all these array elements as the uh, results of an election result of different constituencies okay so these are different parties this is uh, a party party 4 this is a party party 3 okay and let's try to uh, see the try to see in terms of the election results okay so the party to which the majority element belongs okay in this case is going to have 1 2 3 4 5 5 five constituencies have been won by the majority element right and if if we collect all the other elements together this is going to be 1 2 3 4 okay so we have some other element a a and some other element b right so these are the uh, results from different constituencies these five constituencies have been won by the majority element and all these are won by or uh, different candidates okay so if if you remember the 2019 uh, general elections there was a party bjp which was in majority and then there was something uh, called as mahagathbandhan right so in mahagathbandhan there were various parties which were they combined hands and they were fighting against bjp all together right so you can just assume that these all are the constituencies won by the mahagathbandhan and these all are the constituencies won by bjp now if the election commission says that two out of all these constituencies are being disqualified there has been some cheating in two of these constituencies so we are removing the results we are not counting the results of these two constituencies so if if the election commission says that one of bjp's constituency and one of the mahagathbandhan's constituencies will be will not be counted in the election result if these two are removed who is going to win the election if 
two constituencies here are removed who is the new winner initial winner was bjp right now who is the new winner you can quickly count the total votes and quickly see uh, who is winning it again right it's it's still bjp right so what we have done if you look in terms of this array you have removed one occurrence of the majority element and with that you have also removed one occurrence of a non majority element right so we have reduced the size of the array by 2 and the occurrences of the majority element has been reduced by 1 okay let's say two more constituencies were removed so one from bjp and one from mahagathbandhan again were removed who is the winner who is the new winner now it's it's again bjp right you can quickly see that it is still in majority it is still having a size more than n by 2 right so what we have done here is we have removed one occurrence of the majority element with that we have also removed one occurrence of a non majority element okay again if you do the same thing you can see that bjp still remains in power if you remove two more constituencies we have only one constituency left which is of bjp so the idea is that if with every occurrence of the non majority element if you remove one occurrence of the majority element at the end you will be left with at least one occurrence of a majority element so the idea here is that if i am removing one occurrence of any non majority element with one occurrence of a majority element the majority element still remains the same let's let's try to see it uh, from other analogy as well okay one another analogy could be that there are two countries or let's say there are three four countries and three countries are fighting against one country combined so there is a country c1 there are country c2 plus c3 and let's say c4 okay now c1 has got uh, c1 has got majority of soldiers soldiers right so the soldiers that c1 has let's denote them as s so let's say it has got seven soldiers okay and all these other countries combined okay or let's say that let's represent all these soldiers by i okay then we have uh, some more countries and we have three soldiers in the country c or let's say four soldiers in a country c we have two soldiers in a country p and we have one soldier in a country b okay now since initially the number of uh soldiers in the country c1 have outnumbered all the soldiers in all the other countries combined now if one soldier here dies with one soldier of any of these countries who is going to have majority of the soldiers will it change so initially c1 is in majority right now very similar to what we saw in the election if this soldier dies with this if these two kill each other still c1 has got more number of soldiers right actually here we have one less soldier now it is in majority so initially it is in majority right now if one soldier of c1 kills uh, or dies with one of the soldier of all these countries combined still c1 is in majority the idea is if you are removing one occurrence of the majority element with one occurrence of any other element the majority element still remains the majority element can we use this idea to solve this problem optimally let's now bring back our example again and let's try to do a dry run on the example so we have all these numbers now if if i remove one occurrence of the majority element with one occurrence of any other element let's see what uh, remains the result okay so if i am removing 4 with 2 Four is still the majority element of of this uh, remaining array, right? If I remove three with four, again four is the majority element, right? If I remove three with four, again four is the majority element, and finally we are only left with four. Okay, cool. Now the question is that you all you don't know initially which one of these is the majority element, right? 
if you don't know which one out of these is the majority element how are you going to cancel the occurrences of all the other elements with the majority element the question is do you need to know the majority element if i slightly change the initial observation so initial observation was that if we are removing one occurrence of a majority element with one occurrence of a non majority element the majority element remains the same but if i change this observation to if i remove two distinct elements at a time if i remove two distinct elements at a time the majority element remains the same will this also be correct if instead of always selecting one of the majority element if i am selecting any of uh, any of the two elements making sure that the two elements are distinct that is also going to cause the same effect right because if you are not selecting one of the majority element then this will definitely be in majority because you are not removing it correct so you don't need to know the majority element initially okay what you need is what you need is what is the current element that you have okay and what is the count of other elements so if if we are uh, here if if we so if if you are uh, trying to find the majority element in this array you don't need to sort you don't need to uh, get the counts of all the elements what you can do is you can just maintain a variable and you can maintain the count so initially when you are at 3 you can say that 3 is your majority element count is 1 when you get another occurrence of the same element you can just increase the count now you get a different element when you get a different element you can say that since this element is not same as this majority element you can remove these two occurrences from the array so you are not counting it and you are removing you are changing this count to 1 so this means that you have removed one occurrence of 3 and you have removed one occurrence of 4 then you go to 2 again you get an element which is not same as the current majority element so you will cancel out both of them so now you are removing this occurrence of 2 so you are not counting it and you are also reducing this count from here okay then you go to 4 and now you see that 4 is the new element and the current count of majority element is zero that means if count is zero there is no element uh, that you have here right so now you can change your majority element to 4 and the count now becomes 1 okay then you again go to 4 and you see that this is same as the initial element so you will now increase the count from 1 to 2 you go to 2 you find that this is a different element you can remove the counts so if you remove the counts you are not counting 2 plus you are decrementing the count of current majority element then again you see that here you have 4 so you will increment the count again you get 4 you increment the count the final element that you are getting with non zero occurrences can be your majority element okay great if this is clear will this always be the majority element will the final element which we are getting is it always going to be the majority element no not necessary this is not necessary that this element is always going to be the majority element because there can be cases where there is no majority element in the array right this one so in in that case whatever answer you finally get you will have to actually count the occurrences of that in the initial array so here if you get 4 with a count which is greater than 0 you will Uh, again you will run a loop over your initial array and you will count the occurrences of this prospect majority element this can be the majority element not sure okay this is a prospect this is the only candidate for a majority element so if you get something here with a non zero count you will just check here and count the occurrences if they are greater than n by 2 then you can say that this is the majority element okay i will i will just repeat the counting part again okay how we are counting so is is everyone clear with the idea of this algo the idea is that whenever you get two distinct elements you remove them okay if you are getting two distinct elements you remove the occurrences of those two distinct elements so if i am getting 3 and then let's say if i am getting 4 i will try to remove both of them okay 
so what we are doing here is we are maintaining a current majority element and we are maintaining a count okay so if if you get 3 you increase the count so you have let's consider a different example okay let's take an example given by vijay sai which is 3 3 3 4 4 2 okay so we will be maintaining a majority element and we will also be maintaining a count okay you get 3 you say that 3 is the current majority element i don't know what is going to be after 3 but 3 will be the majority element count of 3 currently is 1 then you go to 3 again this is same as the initial or the current majority element so you increment the count to 2 okay then you go to 3 again you will increment the count to 3 then you go to 4 and now you get a different number what was the algo what was the initial observation that we made the observation was if you remove two distinct elements the majority element remains the same so if i get two distinct element i will cut them down so i will not count the occurrence of 4 so i am ignoring 4 and simultaneously i am also reducing the count here okay then i get 4 again i am again reducing the count then i am getting a, another different number so i am reducing the count count becomes zero if count becomes zero that means there is no majority element if let's say there was uh, another 3 and okay so in this case basically you are not going to get uh, a non zero count but it might be possible that you can get a, a non zero count even when you don't have a majority element right so you can have something like 1 2 3 4 <laughs> and then let's say uh 5 5 <laughs> okay in this case if you run the same algo you will get a non zero count at the end but there is no majority element in this array so after you get a non zero count you will have to check in this whole array you will have to count the number of occurrences of your prospect candidate okay okay rahul is asking will it work for n by 3 problem yes okay uh, so in this case the question was that majority element should be occurring more than n by 2 times now there is a variation of the same question which which was asked in google where the problem says that your majority element is an element that occurs more than n by 3 times okay now using the same concept you have to solve this problem okay yes i wish this will work okay if you want you can also try to see mathematically okay you can just uh, you can just take an array of size n let's quickly see how if if it is going to work mathematically or not right so the initial size of the array size initial is equal to n right if you are removing two elements then the size will be n minus 2 now if if there is a majority element then what should be the uh, what should be the minimum count of that major, majority element in this initial array that has to occur more than n by 2 times right these many times if you have removed two elements if you have removed two elements from this array at least one of them can be the uh, or at most one of them can be the majority element because you are removing two distinct elements right so the count of new majority element in this array is going to be n minus 2 by 2 plus 1 right is it making sense guys so if the initial size of your array was n after removing two elements the size becomes n minus 2 initial count of the majority element was greater than n by 2 so the minimum count would have been n by 2 plus 1 now the count is size by 2 plus 1 right and if you have removed two elements only one of them can be the majority element right so what would be the new count of this element the new count of this element is going to be the initial count minus 1 this is going to be n by 2 okay and if you solve this this is also going to be n by 2 so you can see that this is the count of majority element which should be there in in this array of size n by n minus 2 and this is the count of the initial majority element so you can say that the initial element still remains the majority element now you can do the exact same exercise for uh, n by 3 also and you can check whether 
the, the same algo is going to work or not. Okay. What is the time complexity of this whole algo? So we are running a single loop, right? We are running a single loop and we are just maintaining the current majority element and the count. Okay. So the single loop is going to count you order and time complexity. What about the space? We are using only two variables, right? We are not using any array. We are not using any hash map. We are using only two variables. So the space is going to be constant. <clears throat> so uh, will you be able to write the code for this? Could you go through an example of n by three? Example of n by three is there in the uh, test that you have received yesterday, right? You can just go through that problem and examples are listed there. You just have to check using this exercise that will the same approach work or not? If you are able to do that, then you can solve that problem as well. Okay, let's let's solve the next problem. <clears throat> now the next problem is also a very very interesting problem. Uh, Yes, this the, the algo that we have discussed. This is the Moore's voting algorithm. Okay, so let's let's discuss the next problem. In the next problem, you are given a matrix. Okay, this matrix is sorted row wise. All the rows of the matrix are sorted, and all the columns are also sorted. Okay, what is a matrix? Matrix is nothing but a two dimensional array. Okay, so all the rows are sorted in ascending order. And all the columns are also sorted in ascending order. So here we have a matrix which is sorted all. So you can just quickly observe all the rows are sorted in ascending order and all the columns are also sorted in ascending order. Okay. You are given a target and you have to search the target in this matrix. Okay. So for example, if your target is 37, you have to identify whether the target is present in this in this matrix if it is pre present then what are the coordinates okay so if if the target is 37 37 is present and it is present here right so you will be returning the coordinates of 37 in this matrix okay is the problem clear uh, okay for those uh, for whom the problem is not clear i will quickly uh, repeat it again. You are given a matrix where each row is sorted in ascending order and each column is also sorted in ascending order. Okay. Then you are given a target and you have to find and return the coordinates of the target in this matrix. The dimensions of matrix is n cross n. Okay. What is the brute force here? Can I, can everyone solve this problem using a brute force algorithm? We, we simply have to start from here, okay? Then traverse all the rows, each and every element, check if that is equal to the given target or not, right? If, if you do this, what is going to be the time complexity? If you are traversing each and every element, how many elements are there? This is going to be order n into n, right? There will be one loop which will run from 0 to n, then there will be another loop inside that which will run from 0 to m, right? Okay, now some of you are saying that you can solve this problem using binary search. Now, uh, for all those who don't know how binary search works, you can just skip this part. We will be covering binary search in details in the upcoming classes. For all those who know how binary search is going to work, can you guys quickly think of an approach which uses binary search? See, all the rows are sorted, okay? If all the rows are sorted and you have to search an element in sorted rows, can you use the fact that the rows are sorted? Yes. So in each and every row, you can apply binary search, right? What is the time complexity of doing binary search on an array of size n? If, if you are running binary search on an array of size n, the time complexity is log n, right? And if you are doing binary search in all the rows, if you are doing binary search in all the rows, how many rows are there? So in this case, we have n rows and the size of each and every row is n, right? So in our case, if we apply binary search on every row, if you apply binary search on each and every row, what will be the time complexity? There are n rows and there are m columns. So there are m elements in each row. Right? So this is going to be the time complexity. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> Can we do better? 
Okay, if if we want to do it, if we want to do better, let us try to make some quick observations. Okay, if if this is the matrix, let's draw a matrix here. Where can we find the smallest element of this matrix? Can you guys quickly tell me the coordinates of the smallest element present in this matrix? <clears throat> the smallest element of this matrix is going to be at zero comma zero. Right. This is the smallest because all the rows are sorted, all the columns are sorted. So this is the smallest of all. Where can I find the largest element of this matrix? The largest element of this matrix is correct. It's going to be at the cell n minus one comma n minus one. This last cell, right? This is going to be the largest of all. Now, if if the target element is smaller than Zero comma zero, or if the target element is larger than this element, can I directly say that that element is not going to lie inside this matrix? If your target is less than zero comma zero, or your target is greater than the last element that you have, which is present at n minus one comma n minus one, can we say that this target is not present in the matrix? Yes. What if this is inside the range? What if the target is inside the range? So if we are starting from this point, if if the target is greater than ten and it is less than or equal to seventy one, and I am starting my search from this point, can the target be present in this row? If it is greater than ten, can the target be in in the first row? Yes, because all the elements of this row are greater than ten, right? So target can be thirty, it can be forty. Target can also be seventeen or fifteen, right? So it can also be present in this column as well. So if if the target is greater than ten, it can be present anywhere in the matrix, right? If we are starting the search from here, we are unable to make any conclusive decision because all the elements here and all the elements here are following the exact same property, which is that they are greater than ten. so this is not allowing us to discard any of the search space correct let us start the search from this block now if the target is smaller than this can i say that the target has equal chances of being present in this row uh, in this column as well as in the last row because all the numbers in this column are smaller than 71 because the column is sorted in ascending order right all the call, all the elements of this row are also smaller than 71 so again we don't have any decision that we can take right we cannot discard any part of the search space all the values are still relevant okay let's try to search from this point now can you guys figure out a pattern if i am standing at this point if i am standing at 50 what can i say about all the elements present in the first row and all the element present in the last column if this row is sorted in ascending order can i say that all the elements of this row are going to be less than 50 similarly all the elements of this column will definitely be greater than 50 is it going to help us make any decision so if if the target is less than 50 can i say that target will never be present in the first column if the target is less than 50 the column is sorted in an ascending order right if the if the target is less than 50 all the elements in this column are definitely going to be greater than 50 so the target will never be present in this column now i am able to make a decision to discard some part of the search space the search space has become smaller right all these values are now irrelevant okay so if the target is less than 50 i can directly move to this cell and i can start comparing from this cell now if the target is greater than 40 can i say that that target will never be present in the remaining part of this row if the target is greater than 40 i know that all these elements are less than 40 because the row is sorted in ascending order right so now these elements become irrelevant for us so i can discard this complete row 
okay and now i can start my search from this cell which has 45 again i can check whether the target is smaller than 45 or greater than 45 so at every step i am able to make a decision of either discarding one row or discarding a column so let's say that if if the target that we have to find is 26 okay if 26 is the target that we have to find at this step i know that 26 is smaller than 45 and since this column is sorted in ascending order all the elements below 45 are useless right 26 can never be present in this part because 26 is smaller than 45 so i will move my pointer to 35 right now when i am at 35 i know that again 26 is smaller than 35 so all the elements of this column also are useless for us okay so we move to 25 if 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 currently i am standing at 25 i can see that 26 is bigger than 25 if 26 is bigger than 25 all the elements present here are useless for us right so we move down now when we move down we figure out that this element is nothing but the target so we have found the target so in every step we are either able to discard a complete row or we are able to discard a complete column so you will be running a loop oh, you will be starting from the top most corner right you will be starting your code you will be starting your search from this top right corner and you can say that if this element is equal to the target then you can directly return true or if you can if you are asked to return the coordinates you can do that now if this element at the top right corner here is smaller than the target then what can we say we can say that all these elements are all these elements are <clears throat> if this element is smaller than the target then these are useful but these elements are useless because these all elements will also be smaller than the target right so what can we do in this case we can just switch to the next row so we will be doing i plus plus okay else if if this is greater than the target then what what can we say uh, if if this element is greater than the target then all these elements will also be greater than the target so we can switch the search space or we can switch the column to the previous column right so we can move to the previous column so that will be j minus minus okay <clears throat> and there will be a while here can you guys tell me what should be the condition which should come here when we have to stop all these things when we have to stop the search if we find the target then we are returning so that will obviously break this while loop but what should be the condition uh, what should be the boundary cases for this search we are starting the initial i value from where we are starting is zero right this is the first row from where we are starting the initial column value is the last column which is m minus 1 so these are the initials from where we are starting now what should be the The restriction what should be the boundary where we can go this i so now you can uh, also pay attention to what we are how we are changing these variables right so i is always getting incremented j is always getting decremented i is currently at the smallest possible value which is zero j is currently at the largest possible value right so if you are incrementing i you have to make sure that you are not going out of this matrix from here right so i should always be less than n okay and if you are decrementing j you have to make sure that j does not become less than 0 right so j should always be greater than or equal to 0 so this is your boundary case till which you have to run this loop and if you find the target it's good return true if this current element is less than the target all the elements of the first row will also be less than the target so ignore them move to the next row if this element is greater than the target then all the elements of this column will also be greater than the target so ignore them move to the previous column okay and we search the element what is the time complexity some of you are saying log of m into n is it log what is the time complexity 
So to get to the time complexity, focus on what is the maximum number of steps that you are going to take. Right? What is the maximum number of values that i and j can take? i is starting from zero; it can go till n. J is starting from m minus one; it can go till m. So, what is the total number of combinations of these values that that can be there? In every all, uh, in in other terms, you can also think in this way that in every step, either you are ignoring one row or you are ignoring one column. There are total n rows; there are total m columns. If in the worst case, if the target that you are finding is present here. you will be ignoring all the rows above this and you will be ignoring all the columns after this right so the time complexity is going to be n plus m what if matrix is not sorted if the matrix is not sorted you cannot apply this logic right why not maximum of of n and m that is because you can do both of the things right if you are moving from this corner to this corner you will have to take all the n steps in order to move from here to here and you will also have to take all the m steps in order to move from here to here this is the worst case that you go down as much as possible and you also go left as much as possible okay so that is n plus n moment of every row uh, okay vijay if you can just try to see some of the example just try to dry run your approach on uh, on this matrix itself you will find that chances of finding your element in every row will be there so if let's say i am talking about if if i have to find 30 30 is smaller than all these numbers right so 30 can be present in any of uh, any of the rows 30 is greater than the first number of all the uh, all the elements in the first column 30 is less than all the numbers in the last column so 30 has got a chance of being present in each and every row so you will have to apply binary search in every row and if you are applying binary search on in each and every row then that will be n log m pseudo code we have written the pseudo code right this is the pseudo code or oh, this is the actual code not the pseudo code This is how you are going to initialize your i and j, i from zero, j from from m minus one. Okay. Then I hope you have learned something in today's class. Please do solve the problems and please do subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss any new class update. Okay. Okay. So uh, today we are going to study a very 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 important data structure. is going to be very handy which can reduce the time complexities of many problems significantly just by adding a little bit on the space side okay and this is called a hash map or a hash table okay and the whole process is called hashing in in today's class we are going to study some basics of hashing uh, how a hash table functions and uh, we'll also discuss some problems which have been asked in the interviews and we'll see how you can solve these problems optimally using a hash map or hash table okay i have a question for you guys have you ever encountered hashing in your real life hashing uh, have you ever faced any practical scenario where you have used hashing let's let's talk about those days when there was no corona or let's call it the pre covid era let's let's talk about the pre covid era So during the pre-COVID era, we used to go out on holidays, right? We used to go for trekking. We used to go um, to visit different places, right? And whenever you go to a different place, you need to stay uh, in a hotel, right? So let's say that if if you go to a hotel and you want, if you want to look for a room, right? You go to the receptionist and ask whether a room is free or not. now the job of the receptionist is that he will take uh, all uh, your preferences he will ask you what type of room you want and then based on your preferences he will just check whether a room of those preferences is free or not right so you go to a hotel and in this hotel you have a receptionist right and you go to the receptionist and you ask for a room give me a room which let's say is a single bedded room has a ac has a balcony and all right and this guy will just check whether a room is free or not now this guy has got two ways to check the room 
first is that he can actually go and he can uh, visit all the rooms of the hotel and check whether such a room is present or not right he will go he will knock each and every door he will check whether the door is closed or whether the door is open whether the key is with him or whether the key is uh, with the person who has taken the room right so this is one way now as as all of you can see that this is a very very unoptimized way of finding a room right because if if there are uh let's say 200 rooms in this hotel if this is a very big hotel then he is going to check each and every room for each and every customer right so if there are n customers and if there are m rooms then how many checks is he going to make this unoptimized receptionist is going to make n into m checks this is not going to be profitable for the hotel business whoever is the owner of the hotel he will fire him the next day right the other way that this guy can use is he can maintain a map right he can just uh, against each and every room right let's say room number 101 102 he can maintain whether this room is occupied or whether this room is empty right or he can also uh, have uh, the keys in the key holder itself he can also have the room number data right so now whether he has the key or not that is also visible here whether the room is empty or not that is also visible here he can also have uh, the type of the room written here so he can have uh, that 101 is a single bed room which is empty 102 is a single bed room which is non empty let's say 202 is a double bed room which is empty right so he can have each and every information regarding the room stored against the room number okay is this going to be a better choice yes right that is why each and every receptionist actually does this you must not have seen any receptionist who actually go and check all the rooms right but this is something which you all must have seen correct uh, let's talk about another example okay so let's say that in those days we also used to go to shopping malls right so this was an example when we want to stay on a hotel another example would be that if i want to go to a shopping mall okay now if i want to go to a specific shop in the shopping mall again there are two ways that either i go and check each and every shop in that mall right so there are going to be multiple floors in that mall right each floor will have different shops right and let's say i am looking for a specific shop okay let's say i want to buy uh, the magical drug coronil okay uh, i have a perception i have read on uh, on whatsapp that if i take coronil then corona is not going to catch me right so uh, what i would want is i would want to search this shop which is selling this drug coronil right now again i have got two ways to do this first is that i go to each and every floor and i check each and every shop one by one right or some of the malls who have a, a logical owner or who have a logical management what they do is they put a board or a map of the mall right so what they do is they put a uh, shop number they they give the complete address of the shop uh, floor wise they will say that in the first floor these are the shops which are there in this order right and in the second floor these are the shops so what i can do is i can use this map and i can find the exact location of that shop and then i can go to the shop buy this drug and then i can make sure that corona is not affecting but since this was a knowledge that i gained from whatsapp this might not be true right but this way of searching the uh, the shop this definitely is a better approach right instead of uh, visiting each and every shop what i am going to do is i am going to check this map and then find the exact location of the shop okay does this make sense to everyone these are two examples which all of you must have used like these or something like this in your re real life right where you have to keep track of things and you just create a table or you create some entries and you just mark true false or you just have this. the attendance register that we have Uh, that we used to have in our school classes right that was also an example of hashing if let's say a teacher wants to know whether a student is present in the class or not right what he will do is 
he will just do a linear scan on all the students and doing this linear scan while taking the attendance he also keeps he also marks the attendance right so if there are students let's say in our class we have aman then we have monica then we have an mol right so if if i have to check whether uh, all of these guys are present in the class or not what i can do is just before beginning the class i can just mark their attendance right now if let's say after uh, some time i i want to know who all were present in the class i will not do another scan i i will just check whether monica is present whether aman was present or not right so this again is another example of hashing which we have been seeing from the school days right okay is oyo also used concept of hashing yes oyo must also have used this same concept right okay so uh, this is this is the general idea of hashing now let us see how it actually functions in the uh, in the world of computer science okay so let's try to understand this whole process using an example so let's say that uh, we are given an array and this is just to understand how hashing is going to function okay this is going to be a very easy example to understand the working of hash maps and hash tables okay so let's say that you are given an array and in this array you have all the numbers from range 1 to 1000 so you know that any number in this array is going to be from or, or let's say from 0 to 1000 okay so you are given an array of size n and each and every number of this array ranges from 0 to 1000 okay you have to return the frequency of frequency of every number let's say you have got queries about the numbers okay so uh, you have this array and now you are getting multiple queries you have to answer these queries and each query asks you the frequency of a number okay so for example if if the array is something like this okay if this is the array after getting this array you will get different multiple queries and you have to answer what is the frequency of the given number in that query so for example if your query has 58 you will return 1 because 58 occurs only single time then if let's say uh, you get 3 in the query then you will be returning 2 because 3 is occurring twice in this array if you get 2 you will again be returning 2 because 2 again occurs twice in the array okay is is this scenario is the problem clear how can we solve each and every query in the most optimal time okay let us let us start from the brute force okay what is the brute force way to solve each and every query the brute force way to solve each and every query is that whenever you get a number in the query you iterate over this complete array and you count the occurrences of that number right so if i get 58 i will do an iteration over the complete array which is going to be an order n operation and then i will return but if i get 3 i will again do another order n operation over the complete array and i will return 2 okay so what is the total time complexity of if if i go by this approach let's say there are q queries solving each query takes order n time so the total time complexity is going to be q into n right now this q can be very very large okay so this is something which is not optimal right any other approach that we can use in this case that you might have studied in the previous classes can we optimize this order and factor here let us say if, if i do some pre processing okay if i sort the array if i sort the array what happens to the order now the order is uh, the array sorted in ascending order right now can i find the frequency in a more optimal time can i reduce this factor of n yes now how can we count the frequencies now we can use binary search you must have studied this you must have learned it in the previous sessions that given a sorted array you can count the number of occurrences of any element using binary search right you can just find what is the first occurrence of that number using the binary search then you can also find what is the last occurrence of the number and then you can get the length of this survey right so if you use binary search after sorting then each and every query is going to take how much time only log n time right so now what is the total time complexity of finding all the frequencies so if you have q queries then 
solving all the queries is going to take you q into log base 2 n time this much is uh, the time that you will invest in resolving each and every query but before this you have also sorted the array right so that amount will also be counted now whichever is the greater of these two will be the overall time complexity right this is still is a lot because again n can be very large uh, q can also be very large right so can can we further optimize this right so as as many of you have already already suggested what if i have another array right so i can see here if if i focus on the constraint of the problem the problem says that any array value is going to be in this range strictly right any array value cannot be more than 1000 and it cannot be less than 0 right what if i just have another array where each and every index of the array represent the numbers and the value in the array represents the frequency of a number in this original array so what if i have another array and just call it a frequency array right and and store and count the frequency of each and every original array element in this array right so i can have another let's say frequency array of size what what should be the size of this array what should be the optimal size of my frequency array if if i know that all the numbers are going to be in the range from 0 to 1000 i know that the maximum number that i can have is 1000 to have 1000 as an index i need an array of size 1001 right 1001 this this array is going to be this array can accommodate all the numbers from 0 to 1000 in index right so now what i will do is whenever i am iterating over this array so initially i initialize this complete 1000 sized array by 0 so uh, uh, in this array initially i have 1000 zeros in every index right and then whenever i visit a number i will just loop over this array and whenever i visit a number i will increase i will increase the value here right because this denotes the frequency so initially i am assuming that frequency of each and every number is zero whenever i encounter a number i will increase the frequency right so i will just loop over this array i will say for i equals to 0 i less than n which is the size of uh, the given array i plus plus and i will say frequency of a of i plus plus right if i just do this what will i get in this array frequency of 1 will be increased to 1 right and then frequency of 2 will also uh, be increased and it will be 2 frequency of 3 will also be 2 and so on right so now after i have built this array if i have to return what is the frequency of any given number right what is the operation that i have to do after i have built this array for any number i for any given number i if i have to return what is the frequency frequency is nothing but frequency of i so if i have to return what is the frequency of 58 i will quickly do frequency 58 if i have, if i have to return what is the frequency of 2 that is going to be frequency of 2 and that's it right so what is what is the time complexity of this operation time complexity of this operation is constant right this is a constant time operation i am just retrieving a, a value from the array right so this is going to take order one time correct right? now i have a uh, queue queries and each query is being solved in order one time correct right? so what is the overall time complexity of solving all these queries overall time complexity becomes order q because each and every uh, query is taking how much time only order one time right so this is the time to resolve each and every query and then we have also built this array right so we have iterated over the given original array and then we have also built that array so this takes order n time order n plus q whichever is greater will be the final time complexity okay does this make sense to everyone how we have solved this like optimize the time complexity from n square to n log n plus q log n to order n plus q okay now uh, one of you just asked what happens when array elements range from 1 to 1 raised to power uh, 10 raised to power 18 okay 
what if so in in this problem it was given to us that the numbers are going to range from 0 to 1000 that is the reason why we are able to create an array right i can create an array because i know that indexes can be in this range correct now what if the numbers are going to be very large okay a of i as asked by lucky movies what if the range is this can i use the exact same approach so now i cannot use the exact same technique because i cannot have an array i cannot create a frequency array which has a size 10 raised to power 18 right because this is going to cost me a, a lot of memory right how much memory is it is it going to cost if this is an array of integers one integer takes how much memory four bytes right so if you want to create an array of size 10 raised to power 18 this is going to cost how much time uh, how much memory 4 into 10 raised to power 18 bytes can anyone quickly tell me how much uh, is this in gbs 4 into 10 raised to power 18 uh, bytes how much is it in gbs so if, if you want to create an array of that size you need to have this much of memory you need to have this much of memory in the ram right so this much of memory in the ram is definitely not going to be possible for an ordinary computer right so what we are going to do is now we'll have to be a little more logical and we'll have to apply a little more mind right unlike uh, mumbai police so let let us be a little more logical and let us try to see if if we have uh, an upper limit on the memory right if let's say let us take a smaller example and uh, let's say that the numbers are ranging again ranging from just to understand let's take the smaller example that the numbers are again ranging from 1 to 1000 but the largest array that i that i can have can have a size of 100 this is the upper limit on the size of array okay similar example so what we are doing is numbers are ranging from this 1 to 1000 but the maximum size of the array can only be 100 all right now again i cannot use the exact same method why because having an array of size 1000 is not possible right so if i want to store the numbers as an index in the array then i can only store till 100 is there a way using which i can map all these numbers from uh, in this range from 0 to 99 because the maximum size that i can have is 100 so can i map all these numbers in this range is there a way have we seen any way or let's say that all these numbers are ranging from 0 to 1000 right yes what can we do we can simply take modulo right is everyone familiar about what is a modulo operator this gives you the remainder right so if if i take modulo of any number ai with 100 which is the maximum size of the array that i can have can i say that this number which is ai modulo 100 will always lie in the range from 0 to 99 can i say this yes correct so i have got one way to map these numbers which are in this range from 0 to 1000 to a range which is very very small right this this range has a length length uh, 1000 1001 and now uh, the resulting length is only 100 so i am mapping these 1000 numbers to 100 numbers okay if this is the case how am i going to store the numbers let's have uh, an example let's say i have 492 5 8 23 15 142 and some random numbers okay and now if i uh, if i can only afford an array of size 100 right how can i map these numbers i will first take the modulo of these numbers with 100 and then whatever number i get by using by doing this operation i will store these numbers in that index so i get the index by taking modulo of these numbers by 100 so first number will be stored against index 92 this will be stored against index 5 this will be against 23 15 42 54 and 64 right so if if i have these as the array index 54 and so on till till 99 
then at zero is going to be empty one is empty uh, two is empty at five i am going to have five at 23 i will be having 823 at 42 i will be having 142 and then 654 764 and so on right so now is this going to work is this going to work correctly if these are the indices and these are and i keep the values in array element mod 100 index okay now some of you are saying that this is going to work but there can be collisions right what are collisions okay so let us say let us say that in the array in the original array i have these numbers 100 or uh, 201 then i have 302 then maybe 300 401 2 right if i have these numbers right so in which index should uh, a number belong in index 0 how many numbers am i going to have in index 0 i am going to have 100 then i am also going to have 300 and i am also going to have 200 right all these numbers will try to get inserted against a single index right these are called collisions when there are multiple prospects candidates for a single index right so uh, index 1 will try to accommodate 201 then 401 index 2 is going to have 302 and then who also right so there is no one to one mapping right a one to one mapping does not exist correct if a one to one mapping does not exist is this even possible to use this technique are, are we going in the wrong direction is this a correct way is this the correct path that we are taking maybe right we we have also studied a data structure called linked list right if if you know about a linked list what if we have an array of linked lists i i have if i keep an array of the linked list nodes right can i say that this can work in that case right so currently if if you are only storing a single element if you are if you are only trying to store a single element uh, against one index then since there is no one is to one mapping this will definitely fail we are going to lose some data right because every time you have a collision the previous number will be overwritten but what if i use a linked list so instead of having uh, these integers right if at index 0 i have this complete linked list store so if i have to create an array of linked list what what do i need i only need the pointer to the head stored in the in that correct index right only if if i have an array like this where i have this head pointer then using this head pointer we can have the complete linked list right so we don't need to actually store this complete linked list in the array we only need to store the head pointer right similarly at index 1 we can have the head pointer of 201 at index 2 we can have the head pointer to 302 does this make sense to everyone so we can still manage doing hashing in this case even though the the range which we have to store is very large the size of the array is very small but we are making sure using the modulus operation that we are mapping these numbers to the available size and then using a linked list we can also make sure that we are not losing out any data and we are storing all these numbers using the chaining okay now if if i am storing the values like this now if i have to find what is the uh, number of frequency or let us say if i just want to check whether a number is present or not right what is the worst case time complexity of this case if i am going by this approach if i am storing linked list if i am having an array of linked list nodes what is the worst case time complexity of finding whether a number is present in the array or not worst case is going to be if all the numbers are mapping to a single index right so if let us say that uh, the numbers are these 1 then you have 401 then you have 101 then you have 601 right 701 and 501 correct if i take mod of all these numbers with 100 all of them are going to take the exact same key so all of them are going to map against 1 so what will happen now if i have to search whether a specific number is present in this array or not i will be 
traversing this complete linked list, right? So first, let us say I get a query. I get a query of, uh, uh, let's say, 801. I have to check whether this number is present or not. So first of all, I will try to see in which index is this number is stored. So I will just do 801 mod 100, which is going to be 1. So I go to index 1 of my array. And now I have a linked list of size n. I will iterate over this linked list. And since this is also not in sorted order, right? I will have to check each and every element. And I will then figure out whether I have 801 or not, right? So this is going to be a order n time complexity operation. Does this make sense to everyone? This is the worst case time complexity of checking whether the number is present in this list or not, right? Okay, so this is the worst case. What could have been an ideal case? When can I say that, that this is the best thing that, that I want? What is the ideal case in this, in this scenario? The ideal case would be that if all the numbers are mapping to different index, if all the numbers, if I have uh, a data and like if I have the data in such a way that all the numbers are distributed evenly amongst all the index, right? So if I, let's say, have 401 against 1, then I have 2. So let's say I have 702 and then I have 23. So I have 823 and I have exactly one element for each and every index. This is going to be the ideal case. And what is going to be the time complexity in this case of just finding whether a number is present or not? Since the list size in each and every case is exactly one, the time complexity is going to be constant, right? So this is the best case time complexity and this is the worst case time complexity. Is everyone clear about these two? Okay, great. So the aim is that the mapping function that we are using, right? Currently the mapping function is mod by the size of the array, right? So the aim should be that whichever mapping function we are using should try to evenly distribute the load amongst all the possible indices, right? So this, this function, the mapping function that we are using, this is called, what is it called? Anyone knows what is the name of this function? This is called the hash function, okay? And hash function is, is a, a very, very big topic in itself. There is a lot of research going on. There has been a lot of research already done on what could be a better hash function or for what case, right? So you can just go and Google up and read about hash functions. There are multiple publications on these. You can read, you can go through some of the publications if you're interested, right? But taking a mod, this is the most simple hash function that you can have, but not the most optimal. Right? This was just for the example, you have very complex, very optimally written hash functions, which try to distribute the load evenly. Okay, so you can just go back and read about what are hash functions and you can also read about some of the common hash functions. Okay, cool. Now, uh, if, if I write one of the best hash function, even which is the best possible hash function currently present in this world, can I say that that hash function will guarantee zero collision? Can there be any hash function which can guarantee zero collisions? No. Okay. Why? Why no? You have got a very big range of numbers, right? You have to map numbers from, let's say, 0 to 1000. You have got only 100 slots. Do you guys, are, you, are you aware about the pigeonhole principle? You have 100 slots and you have to put 1000 things. When you put the first 100 things and if your hash function is guaranteeing zero collision, 100 slots are filled, right? Now, when you pick the 101 index number, this is definitely going to collide with at least one of the pre-existing slots, right? So since you are mapping a bigger list of numbers to a smaller list, you will always have collision. So there cannot be any hash function which can guarantee zero collisions, okay? However, there are hash functions which try to distribute the load evenly. That is possible. There has been a lot of research done on that. You can google and read okay cool so this is this is uh, the basics of hashing right uh, you can read about hash functions you can also read about hash tables hash table is nothing but key and value 
right? So you you must have seen what is a dictionary. If you use Python, you must have used hash maps. So hash maps or hash tables, they are nothing but a key value pair. This key is is the result that you get from the hash function. This is a hash code of uh, of any value, and in the value you can store it anything, right? So the key, as you all now should understand, these keys in this case are this uh, are the index from zero to hundred, right? So keys are always and always going to be unique. Values can repeat. You can store the values uh, in list or maybe in some other data structure, but keys are always going to be unique. Okay. Now there was a question that if if you are using a list, is there any specific reason of using a list, or can we have any other data structure here? What do you guys think? Can we have any other data structure in in, in place of list? So Surit is asking. why we use linked list is there uh, any specific criteria correct so komal has got a good solution to that if if i'm using a list what is the worst case time complexity of searching a list in uh, if if you have a list which is not sorted and which is a linear linked list what is the worst case time complexity of searching in this list worst case time complexity of searching in list is order n okay now do we know any data structure which provides a better searching time complexity is there any data structure which can store the numbers maybe in some order and then can give us a better time complexity do you guys know about binary search trees in a binary search tree all the values on the left subtree are going to be less than or equal to the value of the root all the values of the right subtree are going to be greater than the value of the root right so just by using a technique like binary search it it can always discard while searching for a number it can always discard half of the search space right so what is going to be the time complexity to, to search a number it's going to be log base 2 and if you are using java 8 if any one of you who, who is using java 8 must know this that in java 8 they optimize this worst case time complexity uh, of uh, of retrieving from a hash map using a balanced binary search tree in in a normal binary search tree in worst case you can also have in time complexity of n if the tree is skewed but if the tree is always balanced then you are always going to have a searching time complexity of log base 2n so in in java 8 what the hash map does it if the size of the list is uh, till a threshold number which i don't remember correctly i guess it's 5 or 6 till then it maintains a list if the size exceeds the threshold value then it converts the list to a balanced binary search tree so the worst case time complexity that we have seen uh to be order n will reduce to order log n okay cool so guys this is uh in brief about hash maps and how they work okay let us quickly solve a problem also okay in which type of questions can we blindly use hash functions okay in in any question where uh, it it talks about the frequency or counting the numbers or maybe checking whether a number is present or not or checking the presence of anything then you can use hash function or then you can use hashing okay let let's quickly solve a problem and then you will get a better idea of when to use hashing okay so the problem says that you are given an array and you have to check whether there exists a sub array which has some equals to 0 okay so for example if your array is this in this case does there exist such an such a sub array yes right if you see the sum of this sub array what is the sum of this sub array this exactly zero so you can return two if there exists a sub array which has a sum equal to zero the sub array can start from any index it can end at any index it can have any length which is possible but if there exists any type of sub array which has sum equals to zero then you can return to else false okay modify cadence algorithm okay hmm H how will you do that remember that the sub array can start from any point this sub array is starting from this point there might be an input where your sub array 
which is causing a zero sum can be present let's say here or the survey can be present here or maybe the complete array can also be the survey what is a brute force way if if you are not getting any solution can you quickly write down what is the brute force way okay the brute force way is going to be that you actually try to calculate the sum of each and every possible sub array right so you you uh, first check all the sub arrays of size 1 then you can check all the sub arrays of size 2 then you can check all the sub arrays of size 3 and so on right how many sub arrays are possible n square sub arrays are possible to calculate the sum what is going to be the time complexity for every sub array you will also run another loop to calculate the sum so it's going to be an n cube solution right which is highly unoptimized how can we come up with a optimized approach and we have also studied hashing hashing doesn't seem to contribute in this question right okay let us let us assume that there exists a sub array okay there exists a sub array which has got some equals to 0 okay so let us say this is the initial array that we have and there is a sub array let's say this part which has a sum equals to 0 how do we define a sub array we always define a sub array using a range of indices right because as i said the sub array can start at any point it can end at any point right so let us say it starts at a point l and ends at Uh, an index r and i am saying that uh, we we are just assuming that the sum of the sub array starting from l to r is 0 okay now if this sub array has got sum equals to 0 right if if i also have the sum of all the sub arrays starting from 0 stored with me okay what what can we say about this part this part which is in the blue dotted line what is going to be the sum of this part the sum of this part is nothing but sum from 0 to r right and this sum from 0 to r can be broken down as sum from the range 0 to l minus 1 right plus sum of the range from l to r does this make sense to everyone right so sum of any sub array can actually be written in terms of this prefix sum right i can write sum from l to r is equal to sum from 0 to r minus sum from 0 to l minus 1 index i can write the sum of any sub array which starts at index l ends at index r in the form of the sum uh, of sub array starting from 0 which is nothing but the prefix sum everyone here understands what is a prefix sum right so if if i have a prefix sum array p then i can say that the sum of the sub array starting from n ending at r is nothing but p of r minus p of l minus 1 does this make sense to everyone prefix sum is nothing but prefix sum is the sum of all the indices till this till that index so if i have an array right prefix sum at, at any index i is nothing but it is the sum of all the elements including the i and uh, all the elements before the i okay so if let's say i have an array 1 2 3 4 the prefix sum array would be 1 and then this will store the sum of these two is 3 then this will store the sum of all of them which is 6 and then this will store the sum of all of them which is 10 so this is the prefix sum array for this array if i have all these numbers stored with me already in this uh, array prefix now i can represent the sum of any sub array in the form of prefix sums right and if i am saying that this sum is equal to 0 if this sum is equal to 0 can i make any comment about these two values if this sum is equal to 0 this means that prefix sum of r should definitely be equal to prefix sum of l minus 1 right let us visualize this in this diagram and then it will be more clear so i have these two parts right now i am saying that this this represent this blue box represent the prefix sum 
of r this is the sum of all these elements from 0 to r okay this green uh, this yellow box this represents the sum of all the numbers in the range l to r correct and what about this green box this green shaded box represents the prefix sum of the index l minus 1 the sum of all these numbers can i say that if if this is going to be zero right if i am adding the sum of all the index uh, from left to right and, and if this part is equal to zero then whatever sum i get at this point the exact same sum will also be present after this because the contribution of this is zero does this make sense to everyone right so if if i have an array right and if i am just calculating the sum of all the array elements till that index and then there is a part which is contributing exactly zero amount right so this will give some some sum right let's say s then this gives s dash and then if i add this as well this gives s double dash this gives s triple dash and then this gives something 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 after i am here i will again get s triple dash because the overall sum of this part is zero does this make sense to everyone let us take the example as well and then this will be crystal clear so i will just copy this thing so if if i just calculate the prefix sum of this array i will be getting 4 right 6 6 minus 3 again is 3 then 4 and then 10 okay now what i was explaining is since the sum of this part is exactly zero this part the contribution of this part in the sum of all these numbers is going to remain zero right that is why whatever number i am getting here will also be repeated here right so whatever sum i am getting at this point which is this point is l minus 1 right because i am assuming that this subarray starts from l so the previous is l minus 1 and this is the r these two have to be equal if these two are equal this means that this subarray the contribution of this subarray was exactly zero all the values cancelled out each other and we are remaining with whatever we had before starting this subarray right so how can we now solve this problem if we calculate the prefix sum of the array and then if we uh, if we observe that there is a number repeating in the prefix sum can i say that the contribution of all the elements between these two numbers is going to be zero which means that this subarray is adding to zero okay is the idea clear to everyone guys is the idea clear right let's let's take another example let's say i have 4 2 0 1 6 okay now if i take the prefix sums i will be getting 4 6 then again 6 and then 7 and 12 so again i can see that a number is repeating in the prefix sum which means that whatever comes in between these two this is if i said that first number should be l minus 1 this is l minus 1 right and the, this number is r so whatever is from l to r is going to give me a sum equal to 0 l to r a here has exactly one element which is 0 now some one of you asked what if a uh, same number is repeating twice right that can also be possible you will have to understand what is the physical significance of this thing right so even in this case if i just modify this array here i got 4 then i have 0 then let's say again 0 then i get 2 uh, and then minus 2 and then something right now what will be the prefix sum here again 4 4 6 again 4 and then 5 right so this means that all these numbers which are repeating they all are forming a subarray which is going to give a zero sum if these two are repeating this means that we have a sum zero here if these two are repeating this means we have a sum zero here from this plus 1 to this right because this has to be the l minus 1 index so even if you have multiple repetition that points to only like one thing that the subarray between them is giving a zero sum okay now how do we solve this problem so one thing should be clear to everyone that the first step is that you create the prefix sum array how can we create the prefix sum array this is very easy task you can have p0 equals to a of 0 because the first number is going to be the exactly the same and then for 
building the rest of the array you can just keep calculating you can just keep adding the current value to the previous prefix sum right prefix sum of i is nothing but the previous prefix sum whatever is the sum till now plus whatever is the sum of the current element so now we can run a loop from i equals to 1 i less than n i plus plus and then you can say p of i is equals to p of i minus 1 plus a of i this gives you your complete prefix sum now in this prefix sum you just have to check whether there are two numbers which are repeating or not is there any data structure that we know which can solve this problem very optimally you just have to check whether there are two numbers which are repeating or not how do you check for a repetition of a number you can have a hash map right maybe you can have an integer here and a boolean right when you get four you store true when you get six you store true when you get another six you know that six has already occurred if six has already occurred this means that there is a sub array which is giving a zero sum if you also want to find what is the length of the sub array instead of instead of having the boolean you can try to store the index here this also becomes integer and now you can say that four occurs at index zero six occurs at index one then six again occurs at index two this means that from this index this plus one to two we have got a sub array which is giving us sum equals to zero okay let's take this example which we initially had this one right if you can have your key and value key is the sum value is the index in the hash map you get four sum at index zero then you get six sum at index one three at two and then you again get 4 at index 3 right now we, we had discussed right that keys are going to be unique so once you get another same key you can just check that this key is already present in the hash map and the starting index was 0 this means from 1 to 3 I have an array which is giving sum equals to 0 okay does this make sense to everyone what is the time complexity of this complete problem of this this complete algorithm first of all we have calculated the prefix sum this costs us order n while calculating the prefix sum only you can just also enter in the hash map right here only you what you can do is you can do your map dot put or first maybe you can check if if map dot contains pi this means that you have found a sub array you can directly return true right else you can say map dot put pi and comma whatever you you are storing whether it is index or or whether it is your true or false right and this is going to solve the problem overall time complexity here is order n okay so guys i will now end the session please please do solve all the problems thank you guys hello everyone so today we have the topic as hashing and i am paridhi i am a software developer at interview bit so today i have selected two three questions two questions basically that i'm going to discuss here and uh, it's it's basically how uh, important they are they are from interview point of view so i have selected them and uh, so today we are going to do first question is anagram so let's quickly dive into that okay so today we are going to do our first question and that problem is anagram this is very famous problem this has been asked in amazon microsoft goldman as you guys can see very important from the interview point of view let's let's quickly see what it says okay so given an array of strings return all groups of strings that are anagrams okay so represent a group by a list of integers representing the index in the original list fine so we are given a group of anagrams and basically we have to group the same basically the anagrams together okay so let's see the example for clarification 
first of all what is an anagram so it's a word a phrase or name formed by rearranging the letters of another such as spar is there formed from rasp okay so basically uh, anagram is a word in which so uh, two two uh, strings can be said as anagrams if they have same characters right uh, and the frequency of the characters is also same but their order is different okay so here as we can see that s is present in spar and s is also present in rasp then p is present in spar and p is present in rasp likewise a is present in spar and a is present in rasp and uh, r is present in spar and r is present in rasp fine and these are the only characters so these characters are basically jumbled right so these are known as anagrams now given the example we have cat dog uh, god and tca fine so these are the anagrams and we have to group the anagrams together right okay fine so uh, we have cat and uh, i can see that one and four are anagram that means cat and tc are anagrams okay fine they have same set of characters and frequency is also same makes sense and uh, dog is there and god is there they both are anagrams fine makes sense so uh, they have same uh, basically characters and frequency is also same fine okay so uh, what do you think we can do what is the first thing that comes to your mind so what i can think of is that um these two from these two anagrams as given in the example over here the spar and rasp right they have same characters and also the frequency same so maybe if i like sort them they should give the same result right so if i sort spar i should get the same result as if i spar, uh, sort rasp right does that make sense exactly so you guys have started to reply and you are on the right track that uh, we can sort them and after sorting what is the thing that we are going to get let's see so let me share my screen first of all the notepad screen so uh, here we have so in the example we have fine so let me just copy it down so we have cat dog and uh, god and tca so i am just copying it down on here so okay so if i sort them this will become a c t right and if i sort so if if i sort dog i will get d g o right if i sort god i will again get d g o and if i sort p c a i will okay so wait a minute it just got auto corrected uh d g a uh, sorry d g o and this will also be b g o and this will be uh this will be a c t right so that means here we know that c a t as in the example c a t and t c a are anagrams and when we sort them out then a c t and a c t we have got the same string right okay that means anagrams will get, will have the same string makes sense and likewise in dog and god d g o and d g o they have the same string now what can we do to group them up so as someone of you has uh, have said that we can hash them up correctly that perfectly makes sense that uh, basically here the sorted string can act as a so here the sorted string can act as a the key right the key is the sorted string and the value are going to be the indices of the anagrams does that make sense so here the so let's let's actually number them up so we have one this is one this is two this is three this is four and we want the indices only right so indices are starting from one in this case so basically the key here for c uh, c a t is going to be a c t and uh, here we are going to have the value will be a uh, we can say a vector where we can store the indices of the anagrams so act is a string and uh, cat is an anagram for that so that means we can have uh, in a vector we can have one and also this tca is also if we sort it up we will get act right so that means the same string and so the value is going to be four over here right so that means we have actually paired up the anagrams the main task right 
Now the second string is DDO, right? And uh, we can pair the strings that are forming the anagram. So that means two and three. Does that make sense? So, right. We can do it in uh, various ways. We can even hash them up in various ways. We can use frequency arrays as well. So you can do it in any way, right? So let's just code it up. So I think most of you are ready for this. Let's code it up. So here we have the screen and let's quickly code it up. Right, okay. So uh, basically we will be keeping, first of all, we need a vector of vector for, um, for the answer thing, for storing the answer. Right, so vector of vector of n, and also we need the map. Sorry, we need a map, unordered map. So we'll basically do int, comma. Okay, no, sorry, not int. We need string, right? We need string, and we need a vector of int. Let's call it maybe group. Right, this is, these are the groups. And now the task is that uh, we have to basically iterate through the vector of strings that is given to us. So let's iterate through it. So I will go from 0 to a dot size, right? And uh, i plus plus now. OK. So we will take the first string. Let's take it in. Let's say we will actually have to generate the copy of the string because we have to sort them up. And also we need the original string, right? So therefore we are maintaining a copy. So let's take it in here and this will create a copy. Now let's sort the string. So let's sort the copy string. So cpy dot begin, then um, cpy dot end, right? So we have sorted and now the task is that we can actually, you know, hash it. So that's what we are doing. So let's hash it. So the groups is the map that we have taken. And uh, this is copy, right? So string is copy that we have sorted. OK, so we have sorted it. And uh, let me see if there are some comments. OK, so um, now, now what shall I do? May I get it in the comments? What shall I write? So basically, I can push, if that copy is present, I can push the index value, right? So after sorting this copy string, the string at AI, if after sorting, we get a string which is there in the hash, right, which is present in the key, we can actually push I plus one to that. Uh, it's exactly what we have done in our notepad, right? So we will do it for all the strings. And finally, after doing it, we actually have to iterate through the map. Does that make sense that we have to iterate through the map? So let's do it. Oh, groups is the map. Iterator, let's say is it. Now we will simply move through it. So that means it equal to, that is groups dot begin. Then it is not equal to groups dot end and it plus plus right so if so we have to just take the value right so here we have actually maintained an answer variable answer array and we have to basically push the entire vector that we have created in our answer in the main answer right so basically we will be pushing back it that means the iterator dot second and here we can simply return the answer array right so does this look fine please check everyone are you guys coding with me yes so basically for that uh, we are we are actually storing the indices only right so nilesh we are storing the indices only we actually have taken the string in the copy string that means the extra string then we have actually uh, sorted this copy uh, string and here we need not maintain the main string basically we just want the index of that right so here we are pushing the index right just as we have seen in the notepad so that's what we are doing let's try it now let's see if it passes oh sorry so this should be pushed back Great. 
let's see if it gets submitted cool so we have done a good job and uh, uh we have scored 338 out of 350 not bad okay so have you guys got it have you guys got it are you guys with me is it clear shall we move to the next question guys cool do submit it with me right be here with me uh okay so now ne let's do the next question of the day and the next question is so here i am taking the longest substring without repeating characters so here is our question let's proceed to it this question has been asked in amazon and not only amazon i have heard previously as in recently that it has been asked in uh, various other companies as well can't remember the name right now but yes this is a very important question so let's get to it okay so ashish says he has a question in interview we are we uh, are we allowed to use inbuilt function okay so basically it's like when you are asked to implement something uh, which is let's say you are asked to implement a substring function in that case you cannot you know use it or let's say you are asked to uh, sort the array so the trivial question is that so the main question here is that you have asked to sort it so how can you use a given the inbuilt function right in that case you have to actually perform the sorting with the various algorithms you have you can't use inbuilt function in that case right so here the question is different you can use the inbuilt function in this case if it's not mentioned if it's mentioned that you cannot use then you cannot use right so it actually depends you can actually ask your interviewer about it that uh, if you can use it or not make sense cool okay great so guys let's move on to the next question and the next question is longest substring without repeat okay so uh, let's see so the question says that given a string find the length of the longest substring without uh, repeating characters okay so here we are given a string uh, this is the string let's say and here it says that uh, abc is the longest string and the length is 3 that means abc is the longest such substring in which there are no uh, repeating characters as you can see that okay abc has unique characters okay so basically we want a substring out of a long string which which uh, has only the unique characters right which doesn't have a non which doesn't have a repeating character basically in the second example as you see that we have so many b's over here and uh, that means here the substring is just a b that means of length 1 that has a unique character if we try to extend this up that means if we try to take um, try to make the length 2 then definitely we will get bb and uh, length of 2 doesn't have unique characters does the question make sense to everyone okay could you elaborate more the, that what would you do guys please at least come up with the brute force approach i would like to discuss it with you all that uh, what do you have in your mind can you guys think of the brute force approach for this question is the question clear to you all okay so guys please think on this question okay and then in a minute uh, we are going to proceed with the solution okay so garima says that please explain the question again sure garima so here it says that you are given a string okay you are given a string and you have to find the length of the longest substring without repeating characters now, first of all, do you guys understand what a substring is? So a substring is that when you take, uh, so here if I say that uh, this is a string, right? So what are the substrings of this string? So let me actually um, show you my screen. Cool. So here is my notepad screen and let's remove this. So here we are discussing the longest um, substring without repeating characters. Okay, so let's say i have a string a b c d and uh, or b c okay a b c b d now uh, first of all what are the substrings of this string so a is a substring then a b is a substring then a b c is a substring a b c b is a substring then a b c b b is a substring okay then starting from b we have just b then b c then b c b then we have uh, b c b b right 
then uh, starting from c we have c then c b then c b c b d and starting from b we have just b then b d and then starting from d we just have d does that make sense that these are the substrings of this string the consecutive characters garima is the question uh, so the question says that once so basically you have to find the longest length of the substring that has unique characters here such a longest length is just a b c because if we consider any length which is beyond 3 then that has a repeating character so if we have uh, let's say a b c b right so in this case also we have two repeating characters as in one repeating character that is b right so b occurs two times which we don't want so the question says that you have to find the longest substring without repeating characters am i clear with the question guys am i clear with the question okay great okay so let me clear this up right okay so let me actually build your solution then you will be more clear okay so the brute force approach that comes to my mind is that we can generate all the substrings right we can generate all these substrings and we can uh, we can check if these substring consists of unique characters or not right so how to check if that if a substring consists of unique characters or not so basically for that purpose we can maintain a, a hash map what's it so we can maintain a hash map that will tell us that if some character is already present in our string or not does that make sense that we can use a hash map because it uh, tells us in just order of one time that okay if some character exists or not already exists or not right so this is the brute force approach so does anyone know that how many total substrings we can create out of a string how many total substrings are there okay so total substrings are n into n wait a minute n into n plus 1 by 2 okay these are the total number of substrings that we can create and where n is the number of characters in the string okay now so once we generate all the substrings and then if we check with the help of a hash map that uh, if that particular substring has unique characters or not then the time complexity for first of all for generating the substring is going to be order of n square okay because total we have n into n plus 1 by 2 number of substring therefore the time complexity of generating these many substrings is order of n square now we have we also have to check it with the help of a map if it consists of unique characters or not so for that it's again going to take order of n because why because we uh, for maintaining the hash map it's going to take again order of n so the total number of time complexity the total time complexity is going to be order of n does that make sense to everyone cool so the time complexity is going to be n cube but it can be further optimized if while going through our second loop we can actually check on that phase only if we are getting the unique characters or not so what i'm saying is that while maintaining the second for loop in the second for loop itself we can check that up that substring from i till j has unique characters or not and this we can do in our for loop only the checking part we don't have to do it separately uh, for uh, checking the unique string okay so then the time complexity will reduce to order of n square right because here we will be doing it in our second for loop only we will be checking it in the for second for loop only does that make sense guys is it clear now that why n square so n square is because while generating a string let's say i am at a so the string is wait a minute let's say the string is a b c d d right this is our string now i'll keep my i pointer here and initially the j pointer will also be here okay now uh, we will also maintain a map side by side and we will put the character in the map that if uh, so for checking if it's unique or not right now in our map a is not there right so we will put that okay a is not there that means a is unique let's put it in our map so first we will check that if some character exists in the map or not if it doesn't exist that means that character is unique once we get in get to know if that character is unique then we can add that character in the map okay 
so okay now we have done it so we have checked for string a now we will move so now we have a b so we have uh, in the map we just have a till now right now we will check that if the character at b is a, in our map or not if it's not present that means we it's a unique right that means it's unique but uh, once we have checked that if it's unique we will add it to our map because we have already taken it so are you guys able to relate that how in the second loop only that is while moving our j we are able to check in the map that's why the complexity is order of n square okay do try to dry run it on your own right and then i am sure that you are going to get it and if you are still uh, confused then you should definitely try to code that up now uh, i would try to so okay so here we are now so the time complexity of the brute force solution is order of n square right or i would say a little optimized solution is order of n square but here we are generating all the substrings do we really need to generate all the substrings so let me make my point clear from here so we have we have a then ab then abc abc b abc bd right so here we are actually generating all the substrings here i am trying to make my point here that we actually don't need it so i can figure it out let's see if you are able to uh, this is our main substring basically and here we have all the substrings okay so if you see here in the third also so also we have to maintain the length as well right we have to return the length of the longest string so when we had one the length is equal to one right when we had ab ab has unique characters length become two right then uh, uh, we have abc then length become three right because abc has unique characters as well makes sense right then we have abcb that means it doesn't have unique characters length is still three right then again abc uh, abcb d is there and length is equal to three again because it doesn't have unique characters right so that's how we will keep on uh, going on and the length will remain three entirely now the point that i'm uh, i am trying to make over here is that if you carefully look then uh, here we have a b c right we have a b c and once we got this fourth b we come to know that okay this string can have a length of three then as soon as we are moving to b for length of four for checking for length of four the strings doesn't have unique characters now if you see then in the second step we are generating a b c b d do we really need to do that guys do we really need, need to check for a b c b d once we have checked for this no right why because because here we have already checked that a b c b is non unique then even if we add d that doesn't make any sense because here till this point this is not unique so in any way if we try to add more characters that will still be non unique right so that means this is redundant so why are we doing which is uh, something which is redundant right so we can ignore that so this is the first point that i uh, tried to make now we can actually uh, now the second point that here to be seen is that once we have got this b right once we have got this b so here from this a i am sure that that my uh, substring having a unique characters starting from a more than of length 3 is not possible right does that make sense that starting from a if i have already got the repeating character and I, and if i had any more character now it won't create a unique string at all because here i have a non unique character that means starting from a i have just abc as a length right now here we have uh, so uh, the point here to be seen is that even from b if i start i can get at most two uh, i can get get the length of two right uh, where the string length is two of the no, uh, of the unique characters right so that means from a i can get the maximum length of three from b i can get the maximum length of two but from starting from c 
starting from c there is a chance that i get a length of unique characters a substring of length a substring of unique characters which is more than 3 does that make sense so now here uh, here comes the point to do what i can feel is we can do sliding window right as suggested by nilesh in the comments we can do sliding window so let's see how can we do that so let me just remove all of this we have a b c b d now in my sliding window i will keep a window i will start the window from a okay in the sliding window we have two pointers okay one is left pointer and one is right right pointer so i'll keep both the left and right pointer at zero position which is a right okay so a is unique and that we are going to see it from the we are going to do it from the map right so we are also keeping the map so let's keep a map a has a i can so we can maintain a index okay so we can maintain a index let's also put the indices 1 2 3 4 right we can put a index over here that means a is at index 0 and a we have already taken now let's try to expand the window before that we will also keep a length variable which will keep the track of length length right now is a now we will move our r so now the window has become from a to b b is also not present in the map Let's make the length two, right, and add b to the map. Index of b is one, right. Now let's increase r. So r is at c. So c is not there in our map. Let's include c in the map with the index, right. Also the length has become three. Now let's move r. Okay. As soon as we move r, we saw that now the we, we don't have any unique characters. So that means length will remain same and. now we will move our left pointer so that we can actually remove the previous occurrence of d right we will move our l till the point the b the occurrence of b becomes becomes one only right does that make sense that we will move it till the point the occurrence of one becomes one okay so let's move our l now so as i move my l l moves to b right l moves to b and r is still at 3 Okay, L is at one and R is at three. Now we will. So A has gone out of window. That means L to R is the window. A has gone out of the window. So remove A from map. Okay, we will be removing A from map. Now uh, we will check that still is the element is the character at R still present in the map. Well, yes, it's still present. It means that it's still the part of the window. and in that case we will again move our l so let's move the l and l comes over here and b will remain at 3 now uh, b will be gone that means here so we actually remove this this b from the window let's move remove it from here now we will check that okay is b present now is b present in the map well yes it's it's not present now right it's not present that means we can include this b in our map now we can include this b with its current index which is 3 okay which is 3 now we can start moving our r again so let's move our r now r comes to 4 and uh, b is not present in the map length will remain 3 only because l to r the other uh, length is still 3 let's include d in the map now d becomes so d is at position 4 okay and uh, now let's move our r and now r uh, there are no more characters therefore we will simply stop and whatever uh, will be the length we will simply return it so this is how we can process it using sliding window the time complexity of this approach is going to be just order of n because we are iterating to each character not more than twice because one with the left pointer and one with the right pointer right so as we are moving our left pointer and as we are moving moving our right pointer so we are not coming to any character more than twice therefore the time complexity is going to be 2 into n which is nothing but order of n right we don't consider constant and the space complexity is order of n again because here we are using a hash map does that make sense how we have beautifully come across a good uh, just by building some you know observations we have come to this solution does that make sense guys shall we code it great cool so let's code it up here we are now let's quickly do this okay so um 
first of all i have to maintain an answer which is let's say at present int min right we want the maximum value so we will initialize it to int min or we can initialize it to zero as well it doesn't matter right okay so we can uh, the left pointer we will keep which is initialized to zero and also we will keep a right pointer right which is initialized to zero and also we will keep a length right which is again zero now we will be iterating through our string uh, we will be iterating it with the help of right pointer right pointer so let's keep the right pointer in the loop so let's initialize the right pointer here only to make it more uh, readable for you guys so right is less than a dot length then right plus plus okay and um, we will okay so we have to take a map as well right so we will take a map and uh, that will be a uh, map will be of char comma int because we will be maintaining the index make sense we will be maintaining the index with each character now okay so if the character so if the character at right is present in the uh, so it's not present in the map right so how we will check that uh, m dot find right m dot find is equal to is equal to m dot end that's how we will be checking that a character is not present in the map so if it's not present we will simply do what we will simply do m at a of right is equal to i sorry right here we are actually assigning so here we are doing nothing but uh, let's say we have uh, if we have a b c b d right so here we are doing nothing in the map we will be storing a mapped to zero that means the index of a okay that's how we will be storing it now uh, after storing it like this what to do let's increment the length right because we have actually found a new character we have included in our map let's increment the length so after incrementing the length we are done till this point now what if the character is already already present right so for that we will use a else else uh, block and in the else block we will be actually moving a left pointer we will be moving the left pointer till the point so let me uh, just write it and then i'll make it clear maybe uh, okay so let me make it clear first so here what my point is that i have let's say l here and my r is here okay and uh, now a so let me actually change the map the map will be a for a it's 0 for b it's 1 for c it's 2 and again b comes right so i will be moving my l till this point that means the index of previous b plus 1 because we actually have to remove the first occurrence of b so we will be moving our l till the index of this b right plus 1 so here let me write it so while left left is less than equal to a sorry m at a at right we will be moving our left pointer and uh, what more do we have to do moving our left pointer and we have to erase the occurrence of whatever is left behind right so that means m dot erase a at right okay and uh, also we have to do one more thing so we have to reset the length okay we will be resetting the length we have maintained a global variable that means this is let's say this is the answer but as our left and right shifts to this place that means l comes over here and r comes over here again the length so we will also maintain a variable length so now it will become 2 okay it will become 2 that means the current window size and that is given by what that is given by right min sorry right minus left plus 1 okay and also we will be updating our answer to max of max of answer comma length and uh, finally we will return the answer let's see if it works are we missing on something does this look fine okay so we actually uh, have to do one more thing over here and that thing is that we actually have to write the new index 
right so here let's say a was gone and uh, now the new index of b is equal to 3 right so that means it's equal to nothing but m at a at right is equal to right and that's all let's test it um i'm really sorry i didn't uh, see that let me share it again don't worry i will explain the code okay so you guys want me to just explain it cool it's good that you have understood the logic and I'm sure that you will all will be able to code it. Let's see. So here I am maintaining the answer, which is initialized to int min. Okay. Then we have a left. That is the left uh, window. And uh, this length is basically the, uh, to keep track of uh, the length we have, right? This length is actually from left to right. Okay. Now we also have a map that is from, from map to character to int that character map to the index okay now we uh, with the help of this right pointer we will actually be iterating through our string okay and uh, while iterating through the string we will check that if the character is already present or not so here we are actually checking if the character is not present okay so the character is not present so we will actually put uh, the character with the index in the map okay and also we will increment the length so this is when character is not present but if character is present in that case we will be moving the left pointer okay we will be moving the left pointer till the point uh, so actually I, sh I have shown it to to you in the editor i think you have seen it there right you have seen it there so we are actually moving our left pointer till the first occurrence of the repeating character in is gone okay it's gone so then we will do left plus plus and we will erase the character that we have left behind okay and then we will do it till the character at right pointer which we found repeating in the current window so uh, till the repeating character is no more repeating we will then add the new index of that character in our map. Make sense? We will add the new index of that character in the map. Does that make sense? So, uh, okay. Okay, let me complete it and then I'll get back to your questions. Okay. So, here we have the character with its new index and also now we will reset the length to the length of the current window. Right. To the length of the current window and then we, we will update our answer we will update our answer we will keep on doing this right so length will have the size of the current window and this answer is the global answer that we have so whichever is maximum that will come in our answer and we will return the answer okay we will return the answer let me try to submit it let's see if it gets submitted okay it failed where did it fail okay sorry we here we need to erase the left not right okay and uh, let's see it now it's still not passing let's see if this works yes it worked so first we have to basically erase and then we have to do left plus plus right Okay, so there was just a little bug. Uh, okay, so is everyone fine with this thing? Okay, so basically, uh, you should use set when uh, you have just, you just have to keep track of that particular character only, or I would say that particular uh, data only, as in uh, when you don't have to map anything, right? So here we see that we actually map the character to the index, right? So that's why we used a map because keeping the index also was necessary to move our left pointer. And therefore, we preferred map over set, right? Does that make sense? Execute now that why do we uh, need to keep map over here? Why not set? We actually made a streak today, right? So Pavandeep, I would say that yes, maths is important. Uh, but competitive, uh, competitive programming is more um, than maths Olympiad, right? So it's, it's, it's more than maths Olympiad that I would say. But yes, it will definitely help you, right? Because 
in competitive programming we can see maths a lot so yes that's a good question pavandeep that you brought up so this was it from my side these were the questions and i hope that you enjoyed them right so see ya bye bye take care stay safe hey everyone in this video we are going to start study about an interesting data structure known as trees till now you might have heard about data structures like arrays linked lists stacks and so on these data structures are linear data structures for example take a linked list in linked list you have a set of nodes where each node points to the very next node in this linked list suppose there are three nodes let us say this node stores the data 4 this stores 1 this stores 8 and this is an end pointer what is the start of this linked list correct this node points to the start of the linked list as you see that in a linked list there is a logical start there is a logical end pointer and also there is a logical meaning of the next element these are the properties of linear data structures what is a data structure basically data structure is nothing but a way to store and organize data in a computer system how will you choose which data structure is perfect for a particular problem you might choose this based upon some different kinds of criteria the first criteria might be the type of data that you are representing the other decision might be to reduce cost or time complexity for frequent operations example suppose you are given a problem that hey we are given a set of numbers and multiple queries where you have to find if a particular number exists in the array or not what data structure you will use you can use an sorted array and apply binary search or you might also use a hash map sometimes the choice of data structure is based upon reducing space complexity tree is a data structure that is most suited for hierarchical type of data consider the organizational hierarchy of a big corporation there is a ceo under the ceo there might be multiple presidents similarly under each president there might be multiple vice presidents and so on this is a type of data that is a one of the most common types of data that can be represented using a tree why is it even called a tree by the way there is a very similarity between this data and an inverted tree what are these things in the tree yes these are the leaves similarly in a tree data structure the end nodes had there been no other do nodes downside it are known as leaves what is this in the tree this is a root similarly the top of the tree data structure is also known as the root of the tree so basically a tree data structure represents a inverted tree now let us look at some terminology related to trees let me draw a formal tree for an example and let me number the nodes in some way 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 the very first terminology that is related to tree is the root of the tree root of the tree is nothing but the node which is at the very top of the tree or the node under which all the other nodes of the tree lie so in this example one is the root of the tree now let us discuss the parent child relationship as there is an edge from 7 to 9 7 is known as the parent of 9 similarly 9 is a child of 7 now what is the case of 6 and 7 as 6 and 7 have the same parent tree 6 and 7 are known as siblings okay now the very 
common term that you will see when reading about tree algorithms is a leaf. A leaf is a node that has no child. So, in this example, node 8, node 5, node 6 and node 9 are leaves of the tree because they have no child of themselves. Now, consider a path from the root of the tree that is 1 to a particular node, for example, 8. We see that on this path, the nodes that lie are 1, 2, 4 and 8. If a node lies on the path from root to a particular node, for example, 2 lies on the path from 1 to 8, 2 is an ancestor of 8. Conversely, 8 is descendant of 2. Now, we studied about ancestor and descendant. Now, let us see for a particular node 8 again. What is the length of the path from 1, that is root, to 8? As we do here, the length of the path from 1 to 8 is 3. The length of the path from root to a particular node is node known as depth of a node. In this case, the depth of node 8 is 3. Similarly, what is the depth of node 3? As the length of path from 1, that is root, to 3 is only 1, which means depth of 3 is 1. Similar to depth, there is an, another term which is height. People tend to confuse between depth and height. As depth is the length of the path from root to a node, height is the length of path from node to farthest leaf in the subtree rooted at node. Let us take the example of node 3. In node 3, what is the subtree rooted at node 3? Correct. This is the subtree that is rooted at node 3. What is the farthest leaf from 3? As you can see that the farthest leaf from 3 is the node 9. So, what is the length of the path from 3 to 9? It is 3, 7, 9. So, the length of path is 2, which means height of node 3 is 2. So, make sure you understand the difference between height and depth clearly and don't confuse between those. This was the definition of height of a particular node. Now, what is the height of the tree? Height of the tree is nothing but the height of root node. So, in the example above, what is the height of the root node? Clearly, the longest leaf from the root 1 is 8 or 9. What is the length of the path from 1 to 8? As we saw earlier, it is 3. Thus, the height of 3 in the above example is 3. Great. So, we have till now discussed some of the terminologies related to trees. Let us discuss a few properties of the trees as well. The very first property of a tree is that a tree with n nodes has n minus 1 edges. Why do you think that is the case? Let us go back to the tree that we draw above. We see that for all the nodes other than the root node, there is an edge pointing to the node. For example, for the case of node 2, there is one edge that is pointing to the 2. Similarly, for node 4 also, there is only one edge pointing to the node 4. Similarly, for node 5 and all other nodes. So, we see that there is one edge from to any node other than the root. So, for n nodes, all nodes other than root have an edge pointing to them. This means there are n minus 1 edges. Based upon the properties of the trees, different types of trees are also defined. So, for example, if all the nodes of a tree have less than or equal to two children. This means the tree is a binary tree. Extending this thing, if all the nodes of the tree have less than or equal to n children, implies that the tree is an n-array tree. Let us take an example. 
Do you think this particular tree is a binary tree? No, this tree is not a binary tree because we see one node has three children. Implies that not binary. Do you think this is a ternary tree? Ternary is also known as triary. We see that this node has three children. This node has one and all other nodes have zero child. As we see that all the nodes in the tree have less than or equal to three children, this means that this is a ternary tree. Similarly, there are many other properties of the trees of different kinds of trees. For example, there is a binary search tree. We will discuss this in depth in a future video. But as an overview, a binary search tree has a property that all nodes in left subtree of a node in left subtree of a node have values less than the node value and all nodes in right subtree have values greater than the node value. Now let us move to some of the applications of this tree data structure. A tree data structure is a very important data structure and is used in many real life applications. As we discussed earlier, that tree data structure is the by default data structure for hierarchical type of data. So, it is used in applications that re resemble hierarchical data. Example, the file system of your computer. How is a file system type? There is a parent directory or which is also known as the root directory. Inside this root directory, you might have multiple other directories and files. For example, this is a directory D1, D2. This might be a file F1. Similarly, there might be another directory D3. Each of those directories can in turn have other directories under them or files. For example, suppose D1 has one more directory inside it and two files. A file cannot have anything inside it. So, file in a file system will be a leaf node. There might be a directory, for example, in this case D2 that might not have anything inside it, which can be an empty directory. I hope it is clear as to why tree data structure is one of the best data structures to represent your file system. The second application of tree data structure is by different types of trees that exist. For example, there is a tree known as try. Try is a data structure that is very good to represent dictionary. It allows us to search if a word of length m exists in the dictionary in order of m time. We will study try in depth in one of our future videos. Similarly, as I talked briefly before, there is a type of tree known as binary search tree. Binary search tree allows us to find if a data exists in the node, exists in the tree in order of height of the tree. That is why you will see that height of the tree is very important factor in analyzing the complexity of tree algorithm and we will study it in depth also in future videos. One last application of tree that is commonly used is in routing protocols and internet. Are you guys aware of a DNS? A DNS is represented like a tree. Suppose you have to find the address of www.google.com. A DNS server is organized like a tree. There is a root domain dot inside under which there is a dot com under which there will be a dot google under which there will be www. Similarly, suppose it had to represent facebook.com as well. To represent facebook.com, the root domain will remain the same. Dot com will also remain the same, but there will be another Facebook here. Great. I hope it is clear as to how a DNS server might now be resolving your queries. Hey, myself Robin. 
and we will solve some of the simple questions of tree today uh, we we'll like solve some basic questions today uh, let's start with the simplest question for the binary trees now we have been given a binary tree and we need to figure out whether that given tree is height balanced or not okay uh, what is the definition of height balanced binary tree it is defined as a binary tree in which the depth of two sub trees of every node never differ by more than one okay i need to return 0 or 1 for this problem i need to return 0 if my tree is not balanced then i need to return 1 if the given binary tree is balanced this is the input that is being given to me and i need to figure out whether the given binary tree is balanced or not okay as we can see that the height of the left sub tree here is just 1 as well as the right height of right sub tree is also equal to 1 it means that okay the difference between the heights for the left and right sub tree it's equal to 0 okay if it is 0 that means it is less than 1 so the answer for this case it should be true okay fine nice now if i just visualize the this input in this input as we can see that in the left side we have two nodes but in the right side we don't have any node it means that okay the height in the left sub tree it's equal to 2 but the height of the right sub tree is 0 so if i take a difference then the difference for this as a rule it's equal to 2 minus 0 which is 2 and as it is greater than 1 so that means i need to return false or zero in this case okay uh, now we got the question okay, now let's try to visualize how we can solve this question okay the question is we have been given a binary tree let's say this is the binary tree that is being given to us and we need to figure out uh, whether that given binary tree is balanced or not okay the simplest thing is it's kind of a really simple question that what we can do in this case i need to first check if if that given binary tree is balanced or not that means that first of all the left sub tree also should be balanced as well as right sub tree also should be balanced that should be true if both the things are true and if i want if i just calculate the height of the left sub tree as well as the height of the right sub tree if i figure out height of both the sub trees then the difference should be less than equal to if these three cases are true that means i can say that okay that given tree is height balanced okay now if i need to do that in order to solve for my complete tree whether that complete tree is height balanced or not what i need to do i need to check for my left sub tree whether my left sub tree is height balanced or not or as well as my right sub tree is height balanced or not and again when i just reach that my left sub tree and again i will check whether the left child of left sub tree the left sub tree of the left sub tree it's balanced or not similarly i will check for the right side and for here as well i will check for both the sides so it seems to me kind of a recursive approach in which the way i can solve this question if i build some sort of recursion okay i need also some sort of information which will help me to evaluate the height in the left side as well as in the right side simplest approach that is coming to my mind is what i can do i can make a function pass the root and check whether the left side is balanced or not or also check whether the right side is balanced or not and somehow evaluate the height for the left side and evaluate the height for the right side as well and then just check the difference and if this gives true this gives true and height is less than equal to 1 in that case i will return true in other case i will return false if i just apply that algorithm that will give me the answer but now let's try to analyze the complexity of it okay i am going i am doing some sort of uh, one traversal over the tree which will cover my recursion part and also i am evaluating the heights okay if i if i will evaluate the height that means if i am at some node i need to traverse each level if i want to 
figure out the height of the given tree. Okay, again, that can go up to order of n. And at each step, I am just figuring out the height. So the complexity, in, if I solve by this algorithm, will be order of n square. Okay, can I do better? Okay, if I want to do better, that means I want to somehow pre-store the height information. Okay, so one approach that is coming to my mind that what we can do, first evaluate the height of every node. Okay, but then it will take of an extra space. Okay, okay, though, so two solutions comes to us. One of them gives us solves our question in order of n time, order of n square time and order of 1 space. And the other solution solves our question in order of n time and order of n space. Can we think of something better? Okay, uh, such that we can solve this question in order of n time and order of 1 space. Okay, let's try to think first. Okay, uh, the point is just we need to check one thing only. And that thing is basically the difference between the heights of left and right subtrees. Okay, and if I check this information at each level and at, at for each node and each node just give me the answer, the difference less than equal to 2, then I am damn sure that the given tree is height balanced. So what I, but one thing that is coming to my mind that forget about this thing, just try to solve in such a way, I can just figure out the heights. Because I know that if I want to figure out the height of a tree, it, it will be, I need to figure out the height of my left subtree as well as I need to figure out the height of my right subtree. So if that is the case, and and the height of this will be because anyways if i am if i want to calculate the height of a tree i want to evaluate the height of left and right subtrees so so the whole recursion part it can also be covered here so one thing that i can do i just evaluate the height of every node because if i want to evaluate the height of every node i am checking this condition i am doing this thing so and i can check whether the difference is less than equal to 1 if it is, that means I am done. That means, okay, if it is greater than 1, that means I just found a node such that that node is not height balanced. If, if a particular subtree of a given tree is not height balanced, that means I can't say that the whole tree is height balanced. That means the whole tree is also not height balanced. Fine. So I can, the one thing that is coming to my mind that what I can do, I can keep a one global variable which just track this information. And if I just solve in that way, I am done. Sounds like a good solution. Okay, let's try to solve this now. So the way I think is, so let's first make a global variable. It's, it's complete tree. It balanced. And I can initialize the value here for this global variable. Is completely height balanced and I should initialize it with true. Okay, now what I can do, I can calculate the height for each node because I know that while I'm calculating the height, I can check the overall height balancing thing. Let's calculate the heights. Let's say first for A and uh, it should return me integer value. So Let's calculate height for a given tree now. This is the case. Now, if A, let's try to handle the H case. If we don't have A, then I need to return 0. Otherwise, the left, left sub 3 height, if I need to evaluate, then I need to call, calculate a left. Hide again that function with the left node. If I want to evaluate right sub three height, same function with the right side. I need to follow this procedure, and now I can check this thing. If the difference between left sub three height 
and write subtree phi is less than equal is greater than one. That means I am done. I just found a node or I found a subtree in more specific sense. That is not balanced. So I can change my global variable is completely high balance or not to value false. Nice. If I do in that way, I can surely achieve something. And I need to return the height of that given tree, which will be equal to max of left subtree height or right subtree height plus one. Nice. If I just solve in that case and I can return that global variable because if it is true, I need I need to return integer. I just need to check if it is complete. The high balanced. I need to return one. Else I need to return zero. That is it. Let me check. Uh, I just created a global variable. Is complete tree height balance. Okay. Now I'm checking the height. Calculating the height. The left sub tree height is. I'm calling the same recursive function again. And for calculating the right sub tree height again, I'm cal calling the same recursive function again. Now I am checking whether the left if the difference between the left sub tree height and right sub tree height is greater than one. That means I am just updating my variable. Otherwise, I'm returning the x of left sub tree height and plus one, adding one to it, and I'm initializing it with two, and I'm calculating my height, and I'm done. Nice. Let's submit my code. Nice. Oh, we already got two sixty-one points. Nice. Let's solve some other question. Okay. Uh, he said you. Took some basic question. Okay, let's try to solve some good question. Let's pick this one. Okay, I don't know, but this okay. Okay, uh, given the in order traversal of a Cartesian tree, and we need to construct that tree. Okay, what is Cartesian tree basically? Cartesian tree. It's basically a heap ordered binary tree where the root is greater than all the elements in the subtree. Okay, you may assume that duplicates do not exist in the tree. Okay, nice. So the the thing is, we have been given a Cartesian tree, and he cleared me the definition of Cartesian tree as Cartesian tree is basically a heap ordered binary tree. Okay, if it is heap, that means whether the root contain the maximum value of the given tree or it 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 will contain the minimum of the given tree, and it. Says that the root is root is greater than all the elements in the subtree. That means uh, root maintains the information that is the maximum value of that given tree. So I need to construct a tree. Or I need I have been given in order traversal of the tree. Okay, if if somebody or if if most of you who don't know about Cartesian tree, let me briefly tell what the Cartesian tree is and all those things. Cartesian tree. It's basically the concept. Cartesian tree comes. Because uh, the thing is, it's a kind of BST plus heap, or in some sense, we can also call this tree as tree. And uh, the way we have the the definition that we have been given, we have been given a Cartesian tree in that form. Uh, that is, that is, we have been given the in order part of it because we know that if the given tree is BST, we can if we have been given some order. We have been given some order with the some specific in order. Let's say that in order is one, two, three, four. We can construct so many binary search trees. One of the binary search trees that we can construct is uh, simply one, two, three, four. Because in that given binary search tree, the in order is one, two, three, four. And with the same in order, we can construct so many binary search trees. The point is, uh, so the way Cartesian tree comes, it just gives us the unique binary search tree. And that uniqueness comes because of that heap part. Because in that case, uh, why that heap thing uh, helps me? Because the way heap we design the tree now, such that the root contains the maximum value, and it also maintains the in order part. 
that's the basic property of bst okay let's suggest let's say uh, we have been given a tree 1 2 3 4 uh, let's say uh, the maximum value is 4 so i can say that okay the 4 should come as a root and the elements let's say uh, the elements before uh, after 4 are let's say the elements are 3.7 2.8 something like that and that is the order i know that that is the maximum value that means that and i need to maintain in order as well so it means that all the nodes which are less uh, which are which has having a index less than 4 that means all these nodes should come into the left subtree why because i need to maintain in order i know that the in order of bst is left root right if that is the case that i know that the in order is left root right it means that okay first i need to evaluate left and then root and then right so i can say that the all the nodes after this node will definitely go into the right side and all the nodes before this node will definitely go into the left side so so we have been given the in order of a tree and the heap is kind of a max heap we need to construct that tree that is our question the question is quite simple okay uh, let's try to first uh, con construct a tree this question is also not too complex but the point is we have been given the in order of a given tree in the form of an array okay and i need to construct the tree fine okay in this question as well i can just somehow apply some sort of recursive approach and in that recursive approach what i can do first of all i have been given a complete vector what i can do i just figure out the maximum value in it i just figure out the, let's say i just figure out the maximum value in it maximum value in that complete vector and i just make it as root and now what i can do all the i can just now recursively call for the left side as well as recursively call for the right side and now what i can do uh, i can just construct this as a tree as well and i can mark the left child for this root as the root of the root root of the left subtree and i mark the right child of that node as the root of the right subtree if i just solve in that way then i can do solve this question now first before jumping into the code let's first try to analyze the complexity for this question okay first what i am doing i am just calculating the maximum value at each instance i am calculating the maximum value okay uh, I am calculating the maximum value, which is of kind of order n, and I am calculating the maximum value at each step. Let's say I have a function which gives the root, which gives the root, so it has a node, which gives me the root of the tree when it takes a given array. Now, what I need to do first, I need to find the maximum element in that given array, and then I need to call the recursive function again. Let's say the index I just got after calculating the maximum value from that given array. It's let's say i. So I need to call the function from the left side to the i minus one, and that same function again with the i plus one to right, because this should go into the right side and this will go into the left side. And what I can do, I can mark the left as this and right as this, and I will return. I can return this. Now the complexity is the order of n just because I am traversing over each of the nodes, over each element of the array, and also I am figuring out the maximum value in that array as well. So the overall complexity for this solution it will go up to order of n square. Okay, so we just figured out the solution which is of order n square. Now the point is, can we solve it in a better way? that is the point can we solve it in a better way one thing just we just figured out that what we are doing we are just concerned about the maximum value okay and somehow i know that if that is the maximum value and so all the nodes here are come comes to the left side of it okay let's say i have a sequence let's say let's see the sequence let's see the example let's say we have a given sequence as 5 4 8 3 1 okay if we have that given sequence what we can do now as we can see now that we have a 5 and if we just found an element which is lesser than this element so i can safely say that 
as 5 is greater than 4, that means the 4 should go to the right side of it. For sure. Okay. Now, if I figured out 8, now can I say anything? If I figured out 8, now I know that, okay, if I have some elements, let's now try to construct something such that we can able to solve our question in less complexity or better complexity. Now, let's try to think what we can do to solve our question in a better complexity. Okay, uh, the thing is, let's say I have 5, nice, then I come across 4. If I come across 4, I know that 4 is less than 5. That means what I need to do, I need to make it as a right child, uh, as a right child of 5, for sure. Let's say I just do that operations as well. Let's say I just keep it as right child. Now, okay, uh, do I need the information of 4 ahead? Will it help me in any further processing? Okay, I don't know. Let's see. Let's say I just found a value 8. If I found, found a value, let's say now 3. After 4, let's say I found a value 3. Now what I can do? Okay, if I found a value 3 and I know that, I know that 3 is less than 4. And 3 has a greater index. That means... 3 will go into the right side of it. Okay, so I just figured out a solution. If we have been given an in order in such way, then I just need to map as a kind of a right child of that particular. Okay, if that is the case, then I'm happy. If so, that means I'm just keeping the information and the, the time I'm getting the value, which is less than the particular value. In that case, I just need to mark it as a right child. Fine. If that is not the case, Let's say I'm just getting a value which is greater than this value. Let's say I'm getting a value which is 4.8. Now, so that means what should be my structure now if this information is given? If this information is given, then I know that, okay, let's say we have 5. I know that all the elements, these are less than, these, the elements I'm storing here, it's kind of in reverse sorted order. So if it is, it is greater than 3, Nice. So that means all these nodes should go into the left subtree of this because I need to maintain a heap kind of information. So this particular node should be the root for these two nodes for sure. So what I can do now, the overall structure at the end, it will be something like 5. Then the it, right child 4.8 will come and in the left subtree, I will have 4. And I know that structure. So what I need to do now, what I, what I am just doing now, if I am getting a value, which is, let's say I am iterating over the array. If I am getting a value, which is less than that particular element, then I am just making that node as a right child of it and just push that something. And if I am getting a value, which is greater than this thing, then I just pop all the elements, which is in the stack or some data structure because I just said stack because it is following that property. Why? Because what we are doing, we are adding the elements in the end as well as we are removing the elements from the end. And if we follow the same procedure, somehow we will able to achieve our solution. Isn't it? Does it sound good to everyone? The way I am approaching or the way I am dealing this problem, if I want to achieve it in a better complexity. So the point is, if we follow the same way, we can... Now the complexity, let's try to think about the complexity if we just try to solve in that way. The thing is what we are doing, we are just inserting an element in the stack. If that, if that element is lesser than the topmost element of the stack and I'm marking it as right child of the topmost element, fine. Otherwise, if the given element that I just encountered, it's greater than the topmost element of the stack, then what I need to do, I just need to pop out some of the elements from my stack. Let's say I just popped out these two elements in that case. So the last element which I popped out, I need to keep track of that information about the last element. And I need to make the left child of that particular node as that particular element. And now the topmost element which is present in this stack, I should make that particular node as a, the right child of that particular node as 4.8. Because in the end, my structure should be something like this. Isn't it? If my structure is something like this, 
only then I can say that that is maintaining some sort of heap information as well, as well as maintaining in order as well. So if I will solve in that way, I can solve my question from order of n square to order of n. Nice. And we know that we can't solve better than this complexity. This is the best complexity that we can achieve for this particular question. Now let's try to solve this question. So as I just told you, uh, we need a stack to maintain all this information. Let's say I created an empty stack and uh, okay, now let's iterate over my entire array. Let's first keep n as size. Now, now what I can do as I know that, okay, let's first check the big edge cases. Let's say if my stack is empty. If my stack is empty, that means, uh, that means I don't have any elements in my current stack. That means that the particular element should be the root, should be the root. Or if that is the case, or, okay, let means let, let first create a root. So that means in that case, let's say my root will be root in on, and I have been provided a constructor in which I can just pass the value of integer and it will create a root. It will create a norm. So I just need that value, which is a of i. Nice. And kind of I'm there. Okay. Now I figured out the root. And it's better to maintain a stack of tree now. So I can push into my stack you know, oh, the value of root. Fine. Now the point is, now the case is something like I have an element in this stack, but the current element that I figured out, it is less than the topmost element of this stack. Uh, the topmost element of this stack and I need to just concern about the value of that particular element. So because I am adding the basically nodes into this stack. Now, if I just do in that way, in that case, what I need to do, first of all, let me create a new node. Okay, with the value AI and uh, mark the right child of the topmost element of the stack as that given node and I can push that given node into the stack fine okay if that even if that is not the case that in other case the other case is i have a value that means a is greater than the topmost value of this stack then in that case i need to pop out some elements and i need to just concerned about the edge case as well if my stack is not empty and the value at the top it's basically less than AI. We are happy because we don't have given any duplicates in the tree. So we can do in that way. We, can, we shouldn't ha have to handle the duplicacy case here. So we are good with that. Now, if that is the case, then what I just told you, then I need to keep track of the last element which gets popped out. Because that last element will be the left child of that particular element of AI. Isn't it? So if that is the case, then uh, I can make last and I can update my last as proto and I can remove the, I can keep it as null. Okay, uh, now what I can do, I just figured out the last element. So let's first create a new tree now for that particular element. Uh, with the value of AI. Now what I can do, uh, the value for uh, that particular node, the left child of that particular node will be my last and the right child for the topmost element if let's first check whether we have a topmost element in this stack or there might be a case that my stack gets empty. 
So I need to check that thing. If my stack is not empty, then but I need to check whether the sorry I need to mark the rightmost child for the toe as the given. If I just do in that way, I will somehow solve this question. Looks like a good approach to me. And I need to return root. Let's again check the way we think and the way we applied the algorithm. Are they both matching or not? Or have we missed any case or not? Let's first check. Okay, what we do in the starting, we just created a stack and which contains all the nodes. Nice. And we have, we just take our end, which is the size of my array. Nice. I just iterating over my array and I'm just checking whether my stack is empty if, because I know that stack will be empty only in that case uh, I need to push now that element as well sorry I just forgot that thing okay because if that stack is empty that means this is the first node kind of so that means I need to make it as a okay oh sorry sorry, sorry. I just need to push okay okay uh, so that means I can't say that it will be my root. The root must be the topmost element in this stack, for sure. But yeah, I need to construct a node here and I just need to add the node if stack is empty because I can't do anything else. And the other case will be if we have our value, it is less than the topmost value, then we are sure that in that case, we need to mark it as our right child for that particular element. So we are doing this thing. So it seems right to me. Now the other case will be if AI is less, if it's not less then it is will be greater. So that means uh, it should be the root of some of the nodes. So I'm just checking out all the nodes. So for that, what I'm doing, I'm just checking up till when I have that given value, it's greater than to the topmost value. So I'm just maintaining my last node because it is required and what I am doing, I am just creating one new node and just what I'm doing and just mark the left child for that particular node as a last. Nice. If I do in that way, it will, it uh, seems like a good thing. Now let me test. Okay. Oh, sorry. Nice. Let's submit this code. Oh, okay. Uh, what's wrong? Let's try to see. Have we done anything wrong here? We have been given the tree as 231. If we have been given tree as 231, first, what we can do, what we are inserting two here, and uh, it shouldn't be that. It will be the first element, it shouldn't be the last element of this stack. Okay, uh, so I need to maintain the last information. Uh, let's say it as null. Because the way we are maintaining our stack, it's in reverse sorted order. If it is in reverse sorted order, what does it mean? That means the maximum value should come in the front of my stack. And I am popping the element in that way that if we have a maximum element, it, it won't be go out of my stack. And it will always be appeared in the starting of my stack. So I need to I need to update as this and I need to pop. If I do in that way, then it should work. So sorry, sorry. Why now? Uh, I'm updating my last here. Okay, it's not stacking. Sorry, I'm doing some silly mistakes today. Let's check. Nice, we solved this question. It took us some time, but we solved this question in order of end time. That's that's good. That's good for us. Okay, uh, let's solve one more question today. Okay, let's solve this question. I don't know what's this. Okay, the question is: we have been given two binary trees, and we need to check whether they are equal or not. Okay, two binary trees are considered equal if they are structurally in the identical and the nodes have the same value. Okay, I need to return 0 or 1 depending upon this. 
okay let's say i have been given this tree and this tree i just need to check whether those both of the trees are equal or not it's kind of a very simple problem but i need to check if the both of the trees are equal that means their the node itself will be equal as well as the left sub tree and the right sub tree both all of them both left sub tree and right right sub tree also should be equal if all those things are fine then i can safely say that the both of the trees are identical to solve this question it shouldn't take much time then what i can just first concerned about the edge case and you can see that this question this simple question has been asked in amazon as well so but the point is uh, are we handling all the edge cases are we come up with a good solution at one go or not so what are the edge cases what will be the edge cases in this question the basic edge case for edge case for this question will be uh, kind of let's check whether we have been given both the nodes as empty or not if we have both as empty both the trees as empty tree then i can safely return one because i know that in that case both of the tree are identical if any of them if any of them kind of if it is both are not kind of empty one of them is empty that means both the trees are not identical and in that case i need to return zero so this will be kind of the uh, kind of one more edge case now i end up with the both the trees such that both the trees has some elements now in that case the idea is very simple but i need to check whether the basically value for both of them are equal or not and it is equal and i i say that is the left sub tree for both the nodes are they equal or not oh sorry i need to concern about the left sub tree only and uh, also we need to check whether the right sub tree for both the nodes are they equal or not if all these three conditions met then only i can say that both the given tree is identical otherwise the both the given trees are not identical if i just solve in that way i am done sounds like a simple solution to me okay oh, oh sorry but i have done lot of silly mistakes nice let's submit our code now nice uh, we got a really really good point goel dono non null hone se true kaise keh sakte hain uh i didn't say that goel uh, but i just but i just said to you that basically uh if both of them are null if both of them are null only then we are saying that as true because in that case both of the trees are empty if both of them are non null then i am checking if then i am checking all the three condition the where the first condition is whether the value of the nodes are equal or not if the both the trees needs to be identical okay fine hey guys in this video we are going to talk about the problems of code drift day 1 the topics are binary trees and trees so let's get started the first problem is bst sum the problem description states that the cost of an array arr is the sum of all the values in the left subtree of the binary subtree formed by inserting the elements of arr in the order they appear in it find the sum of the cost of all the permutations of length a since the answer can be large we need to return it modulo 10 to the power 9 plus 7 a permutation of length n is an array consisting of n distinct integer from 1 to n in arbitrary order the problem constants are n can vary from 1 to 10 to the power 5 Now let us discuss the problem with an example. Now let us look at this example. We are given a s three. That means we have an array of length three, which have elements from one to three, right? So all the elements are one, two, and three. Now the permutations we can make out of these three elements are this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. These are all the valid permutations we can make. Okay. Now we need to create binary search trees out of all these permutations. So let's do that now. So the first binary search tree will be. first we have one as the element then we'll insert one here then we'll have two for two we know two is greater than one so it will come to the right of one then for three we know that three is greater than two so it will go like this from one three is greater than one so it will be on right of one from two 
it is greater than 2 so it will be on right of 2 so 3 will be here okay now let's talk about second binary search tree in second binary search tree we have 1 3 2 so first we need to insert 1 after that 3 is greater than 1 so 3 will be come on right then after that we can see that we have element 2 as the last element so we need to insert 2 here now from 1 i know that 2 is greater than 1 so it must be on the right of 1 okay from 3 i know that 2 is less than 3 so it must be on left side of 3 so 2 should be here so in that way we can create binary search trees for the third one it will look like 2 1 3 similarly in this fashion we can create all these six binary search trees now the answer to our problem is sum of all the values on the left subtree of each and every binary search tree right so the left subtree of first binary search tree it has nothing on the left right so we don't have to add anything to the answer from this subtree now again for second one we don't have anything on the left so we don't have to add anything here again now for third binary search tree we can see that we have one value here so we need to add one to the answer let's say our answer variable is stored here and currently it is 1 because of this right after that fourth binary search tree have 1 in its left subtree so I am going to add 1 here as well so the value will become 2 here now for the fifth binary search tree I can see that we have 3 on the left subtree 2 and 1 that is 3 right similarly here as well I can see that we have 3 on the left subtree so I need to add 6 to the answer so our total answer will be 8 so that is our final answer in this case now let us talk about the solution to this problem let's say we are given any binary search tree which is rooted at some integer a right now all the values which are less than a should be on the left subtree of this a okay let's say all those values are x so these all these values should be less than a right similarly what will have on the right subtree all the values which are greater than a right now from this observation the conclusion that we can draw out is that all the values which are less than a should be present on the left subtree of a right so if we have any binary search tree that starts with a and it is it is some permutation then i need to add all the values from 1 to a minus 1 to the answer because all these values will lie on the left subtree of our current binary search tree right and as we know the root of binary search tree is the first element of the array right so for each permutation basically i need to add 1 to a minus 1 to the answer sum of all these values to the answer now again let us look at this example and try to solve it using the observation we just made so for the first element i need to add 1 to 1 minus 1 that is 0 to our answer since this range is invalid we don't need to add anything for this again we don't need to add anything for this one i need to add 1 to 1 or basically 1 to the answer for this again i need to add 1 to the answer for this i need to add all the values between 1 and 2 so i need to add basically 2 plus 1 3 to the answer for this one again i need to add 3 to the answer so the answer of all these permutations will be 3 plus 3 plus 1 plus 1 and that is 8 again right so basically we but we can observe here if i know the root of some array then i can calculate the answer for this array with a simple formula right what i need to do i need to sum all the values from 1 to a minus 1 if that range is valid now the next thing that we need to notice is we are given all the elements from 1 to a which is a permutation then let's say i fix the first element to x then then i have to choose rest of the a minus 1 elements right so that i can do in a minus 1 factorial ways right so if i fix my x i know that i can choose the rest of the elements in a minus 1 factorial ways so that basically gives us the contribution of this element to the answer now for any element x the sum of all the values from 1 to x minus 1 it will be x into x minus 1 by 2 and i'll multiply it with a minus 1 factorial because i can have this permutation a minus 1 factorial times with x as the root element right now let us talk about the code so our formula was we need to iterate from 1 to a and for each number x we are using this formula x into x minus 1 by 2 and we are multiplying it with a minus 1 factorial right so that is basically what we are doing here but since we need the answer modulo some number in this case 10 raised to power 9 plus 7 so instead of dividing by 2 i have already pre-calculated a mod in 2 it is basically the mod inverse of the current number so instead of dividing by 2 i am basically multiplying by inverse of 2 or 2 raised to power minus 1 now 2 raised to power minus 1 modulo 
10 raised to power 9 plus 7 is stored in this number right so now whenever I need to divide I'll just multiply by this mod n 2 and each time we also need a minus 1 factorial so we are pre computing a minus 1 here okay so after pre computing what we'll do we'll run a for loop from 1 to a and we'll use our formula i into i minus 1 this is divided by 2 right so that's why we are multiplying with the inverse of 2 and then we are multiplying that value with factorial a minus 1 and then we are taking the mod and after that we are just adding it to the answer and then we are returning the answer so it's quite straightforward now let us move on to the second problem the second problem that we're going to talk about is max base pair and the prerequisite to this problem is tries you should know how the tries data structure work so i'd highly recommend you to learn about tries first now the problem description is you are given an integer array a there's a function f for two integers x and y with another variable b base right now for calculating the functional value first convert x and y in base b and then the ith bit of f x y b will be x i plus y i mod b you have to return the maximum functional value possible for any pair of elements of array a in base b please note that you can take two elements for pair from the same index note array elements are in base 10 and you have to return your answer also in base 10 calculated value from equation in base b and the problem constraints are a can vary from 1 to 10 raised to power 6 and each element of the array can vary from 2 to 10 raised to power 6 and the basis can vary from 2 to 9 now let us talk about this problem with an example let's say we are given this example here we are given an array of length 10 and we are given the base as 3 that means we need to first convert all these elements to base 3 so let's do that first now here i have converted each and every element to its base 3 representation i need to find a pair whose sum is maximum base 3 right and the sum that we are talking about it let's say we are given two numbers let's say i choose this one 12 and 101 then how do i need to sum them i'll write them here 1 2 and 101 so what i'll do i'll add these two it will give me three i'll add these two it will give me one i'll add this it will give me one now for each digit i need to again do a modulo by three so for 3, if I'll do it modulo 3, it will become 0. 1 modulo 3 will be 1 and 1 modulo 3 will be again 1. So the answer for adding 12 and 101 in this manner, I am getting is 110. So that's how we need to add when we are talking about two pairs. Now we need to maximize the answer, right? In this example, we can see that if we take these two pairs, that is 100 and 101. And if I repeat the same procedure that I did here, that is 1 plus 0 that is 1 0 plus 0 will be 0 1 plus 1 will be 2 now doing modulo by 3 it will remain 1 it will remain 0 it will remain 2 so i'll get 201 here so for this specific case 201 is the best we can do okay so that's what we need to calculate for any array given to us and if i convert 201 back to integer it will be 19 so for this specific case the answer to our problem is 19 so in this way we need to solve this problem now let us talk about the solution to this problem with the same example so basically i have taken that same example these elements here they represent the value of 1 to 10 in base 3 right so we have b equal to 3 here so what we can do basically we need to find any pair which can maximize our sum right so the first thing that i'll try to maximize is the most significant bit right let's say we are given some number here 2 1 and 6 now if i'll add 1 here then i'll get 217 but if in the same number i am adding 1 here i'll get 316 which is way bigger than 217 so basically the whole concept is first off we'll try to maximize the most significant bit and then we'll move on to maximize the second most significant bit and in this manner we'll go from left to right now that we know we need to go from msb to lsb let's say we are at some number right now let's say it is 101 let's say we are at last number right now then what i'll do i'll try to find any number which can maximize it okay so what is the maximum i can get at the most significant bit right now the maximum value that i can make at most significant bit is b minus 1 right 
that's what I can make. Currently we have 1 here, then what is the value x that I will add to this most significant bit so that I can make b minus 1, right? That means I need to add b minus 1 minus 1, okay, that is x, right? So the first thing that I'll try to search for is, do I have any number which is equivalent to b minus 1 minus 1 or basically b minus 2, okay? So in our case b is 3, so 3 minus 2 is 1. Do I have any number in the third place? which is 1. If we look closely into the array, we can see that we have one candidate here, okay. The third digit of this number is 1, right. So we have just one candidate here. So we'll put 100 here. Why didn't we go further? Because we have only one candidate, right. But let's say we don't have one candidate now, okay. Let's take one more example here. Let's say we are given these four values which are in base 3 already and we need to get the maximum pair I can have for each and every value, right. So let's say I want to maximize this 100, I want to find some pair that can maximize it. So what I'll do, I'll write 100 here, then I'll go from the most significant bit, okay. So what is the best I can make out of it, that is b minus 1 or 2, b minus 1 is equal to 2 here. Now what is the number I need to add to 1, which will make it 2. So obviously that number is 1, right. So I'll search for the candidates which have 1 on third place. The first candidate will be this one second will be this one, third will be this one, all three satisfies the condition, right. Now let's move on to the second most significant bit or, or this one. Now the second most significant bit is 0. Now again I'll do the same procedure, I'll try to maximize this 0. So what is the maximum I can get at this position? It is again 2, right. So I'll do the same calculation here. What is the value I can add to x that will make it 2? So I'll see that x equal to 2. So I'll try to find among all the candidates that I have selected, do we have any candidate which have 2 at its second place? So I'll see that I don't have any candidates, right? None of them have 2 at second place. Okay, fair enough. That means we cannot make our second digit equal to 2. Now since I cannot make 2, I'll try to make 1 at first digit, right? So what is the value I'll add to 0 so that I can make 1? So that is 1 obviously. Now I'll try to search for a number which has 1 at its second digit, okay. Now out of these three candidates, I can see that this one and this one has 1 in its second position, right. Now this candidate is also neglected. So now we have two candidates which is maximizing my value currently, right. Since we have two candidates, let's move on to the last digit. Now again, I'll try to maximize my last digit. In order to maximize it, the best I can do is, I'll try to make it 2 first. In order to make it 2, I'll try to find the number which have its last digit as 2, right. Now if, if I look at my candidates, these two, I don't have any of those values. So I cannot make 2. Now I'll try to make 1. Now again, I'll check which one of these have 1. So I'll see that my last candidate has 1, right. That means this guy can actually maximize my sum while I'm talking about this. 100 value. So in this manner we can solve this problem real quickly. But there is a catch, we need to find these candidates each time, right? For each digit, we need to iterate over all these candidates. But we can do it faster by using prefix trees or tries. So let's do that now. So basically, if we are given some array, what we'll do, we'll iterate from left to right. And let's say we are currently at this element, ith element, then what we'll do, we'll try to build a try over all the previous elements. And I'll try to maximize my current element using the try I have built on the previous element. Now let us try to build try over these three values first. Let's say this is the root node of our try. Then the child at each level a try can have is b. Why? Because we can have values at any position between 0 to b minus 1. I'm going to insert this element first. So it has 1. So let's say this is 1. Then again 1. Then let's say this is again 1. Then 0. Let's say this is 0, okay. Then I'm going to insert this value. Then it will be like 1, here 1, then again 1, now another 1, right. Now let's try to add this value. It is 1, then it's a 0, then it's a 1, right. Now this is the try structure that I have built right here. Let's say currently I'm at this value, then I need to find the optimal pair for it, right. So this is my value right now. 
so i'll start from msb that is one now i will try to make it two first okay so i'll search for a one and in our try we'll see that we have a node which corresponds to one so we'll iterate on that we'll go there we'll say okay we are here now now from this node we'll try to check the second digit okay what is our second digit this is our second digit we say that we need two here okay so from this node i'll try to search for two and from this we can clearly see that we don't have any node which corresponds to two right we have just two nodes the first one corresponds to one the second one corresponds to zero okay so we cannot make it two so now i'll try to make it one now we can see that we have one here so i'll go there okay we can make one okay now that we are here now i'll iterate on the last digit so what is the best i can get at last digit i'll try to make it two so i'll search for two here i won't find any twos right we have only two nodes zero and one so again i cannot make two here as well so i'll try to search for one now we'll see that we have one here so it will go in this direction so what is the value that i got i got one 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 so again i got the same pair one 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 right so in this manner with the help of try data structure we can do it efficiently now that we got the optimal pair for this element so we can do it for each and every element of the array by iterating over elements from left to right so that's how we can solve this problem for better understanding let's look at the pseudo code now now let us talk about the pseudo code so let's start off with the solution function so here is the solution function we are given an array a and a base b right so basically first we are converting each and every element of the array into its corresponding base b form and then we are pushing that number to a vector name vec after that we are creating a try node which is basically the root node and we are inserting one element why so because in order to get a pair we at least need one element already inserted in try right after that basically we are iterating from 1 to n minus 1 here and what we are doing we are searching for the best element before the current element which can pair up with our current element so as we have done already it in an example for 100 this function will return 1 1 1 okay after that we are combining that and using another vector so if we combine these two i'll get 1 1 plus 0 1 1 1 plus 1 2 and doing it modulo 3 i'll again get 1 1 2 right so that's what is going to get stored inside this answer vector after that i am getting the current answer by converting this digit back to decimal or base 10 okay and after that i am checking if this answer is the best answer then i'll just insert it into the global answer variable right and after doing all these things i am inserting our current element into the try data structure okay so in this fashion we can get the answer and whatever we get at the end that will be the maximum optimal answer we can get okay after that we are returning the answer now let us quickly see what these functions do this first function it converts a number to its base b form and returns a vector okay in this function right here it basically converts the given vector back to its base 10 decimal representation okay and after that we have the standard try node and then we have a insert function in order to understand these functions of tries you need to understand how actually tries work and in this function we are basically iterating over the try and trying to find the best we can get for our current element okay and this combine the last function is this combined function this basically do this operation it basically adds up both of those vectors and then do the modulo thing okay and then it returns the answer which is again a vector so that's pretty much it and if you enjoyed the video please hit the like button and do subscribe thank you for watching Today I got Vimanyu to talk about some of the operational and human aspect of uh, when things go down in uh, production and uh, what are the things that teams do to you know prevent that to happen again, how to do post-mortem, all of these things we will discuss. Uh, I think I will start with uh, the first thing is I think very interesting whenever you know these uh, somebody joins uh, a back-end team in any company after college. Uh, back in my college time, seniors used to tell stories about yeah, today my on call pe duty hai. So, you know, bahut badi baat hai. Main main on call pe. Yeah. So, what's the concept of on call? What is on call, and why do right. we need on call in in you know back in teams? Right. You know, on call is something which has gone uh, a little, I, I may say, you know, infamous thing. That sometimes when you join a company, you just leave it on call. Pe rakh dete uh, 
तो वन आई वुड मे बी फर्स्ट टॉक अबाउट की है क्या भाई ऑन कॉल वाई इज इट सो ट्रीडेड और इज इट डज इट इवन नीड टू बी ट्रीडेड राइट तो ऑन कॉल इसेंशली इज रूटेड इन यू नो इट्स इट्स नॉट अ टर्म नेटिव टू सॉफ्टवेयर इंडस्ट्री अलोन इट्स अ टर्म रूटेड वेरी डीपली इन टू द मेडिकल इंडस्ट्री फॉर हंड्रेड ऑफ ईयर्स एंड एक्चुअली इवन द मिलिट्रीज ऑफ द वर्ल्ड विच मीन्स बेसिकली ऑन कॉल वॉट दैट सिंपली मीन्स इज दैट इफ वी आर हैविंग एनी सिस्टम वेयर देर हैज टू बी सम वन अवेलेबल एट अ मोमेंट्स नोटिस तो फॉर एग्जाम्पल जैसे दो कंट्रीज के बीच में अगर वॉर सिचुएशन ऐसा था कि अभी वॉर है नहीं बट यार कुछ हो सकता है तो देन देर आर लाइक दिस माइट बी अ फन थिंग टू नो दैट ये जो फाइटर पायलट्स होते हैं वो टायरमैक पे लाइक इन द एडवांस एयर बेसिस देर विल बी फ्यू पायलट्स विद देयर फाइटर जेट्स इंजन ऑन सिटिंग इन द कॉकपेट वेयर दे कैन टेक ऑफ विद इन थर्टी सेकेंड्स राइट दैट इफ देयर इज लेट से इफ द फ्रंटियर रिडार डिटेक्ट लेट से एनी होस्टाइल एयरक्राफ्ट एंटरिंग द स्पेस then within 30 seconds these uh, aircrafts will be in the air right so even these pilots are called on call right that you know if there is a uh, like from the higher command if there is a order to get airborne then like say there can be five fighter jets in the air within 30 seconds right so it is started from the you know the defense forces then in the medical space always that you know if there is like there are icus or let's say there are uh, you know critical icus uh and then the hospitals need that you know any patient there can enter a state there they need to be given cpr right there can be a emergency at any point so there will be some doctors on the call all the time uh, doctors or the medical emergency staff that 24/7 there has to be someone who is available within very short span of time uh, you know if the requirement be of course as a software engineer we do not expect ki you know raat mein 3:30 baje mujhe koi call karega and within 30 seconds like a fighter pilot i have to you know be on my laptop and doing something right that's not expected i start my day at 10 i end my day at whatever time i do but once that's done uh, one shouldn't keep expectation from me but of course then when we talk about any large business right any business which is doing things which is pretty critical you know of course like any company might not be as critical as fighting a war for the country or you know saving someone's life but uh, still actually you know actually uh, now, now software given it is so ingrained in our day to day life as well there actually might be software systems uh, where people's life depend depend on that right like actually even if we talk about let's say medical uh, systems uh, the largest hospitals majority of their things run on certain software right and let's say if some right. of their softwares are cloud hosted if systems are not working someone might even die right so now if you are at that end like actually as they say that you know with great power comes great responsibility right so now as software has become so powerful so it also comes with a great responsibility uh, so let's say let, let take example of amazon now while amazon right. as a typical software engineer of amazon doesn't need to be uh, on such a high alert mode but someone from the entire tech team has to be on this high alert mode where let's say let's say for example if amazon's uh, payment things you know when when you go and make payment if it starts failing what that would mean is that un- as long as it is down amazon cannot make any money right there will be no revenue for that period <laughs> right, right, now, right? <laughs> and which uh, might be surprising but that might be in the scale of millions per minute and might be even higher right? it's hard for me to estimate that but it might be that if it is down for a minute, a minute amazon might lose millions of dollars right how do companies solve for that again that all the fighter pilots of india they cannot be sitting in their cockpits all the time right that if they need to take off but they can say that five of them can do that at a time and this is rotating that let's say today this person will be on call for 8 hours uh, and fine you know in that entire period there might be nothing they might never need to take off but if they need to then they are available right they will get off duty and some other pilots will then get on call and then they will be available right so given now we have large teams you know amazon might have 10000 engineers so they might put a small chunk and it will be that let's say in a month like of course sitting in a you know a fighter jet with engine on it's not easy it's very hot in there right uh, with your entire gear so but however if i ask someone that can you do that once in a month for it hours right that is something we can do fine you know in a month rest of the days i have not that intensive tasks to do but once in a eight month i will be there that you know if if it is required i am there uh, so that is what essentially on call means no one remains on call forever uh, you know it would be more of that once in a week or once in a month you have to be on call but then it is expected from you that you will have immediate access 
to your devices you will be in connectivity you will always remain in a high speed internet connectivity so that you know whatever you need to do you can deliver on that and you know if there is any alert you are watching the alerts if there is any alert you will be able to act on it whether you got you will be able to do on that you know we cannot say you know like of course as i said a fighter pilot who is on call he might be sitting in his you know maybe uh, you know what we bought for a fell recently right so the person might be sitting in a rafel if there is any intrusion he will get on airborne he will try to defend but he, whether he will be able to or not whether he will call for more reinforcement we'll see you know but at least there is someone right. who is able to respond to the threat right right, right. actually uh, on call uh, you know ecom companies i think becomes yeah. generally very important in these uh, sale kind of scenarios so at a target i used to see there is to be this uh, weekend called cfbm so uh, cyber uh, friday black uh, something else black right? monday so, black friday actually uh, uh, black friday cyber Cy- monday ha ah, black friday cyber monday uh-huh. so, yeah 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 uh-huh. Uh, during that period, I think that weekend used to earn more money than any yeah, other particular months, quarter used yeah. to earn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, any, yeah. any quarter would, would not earn money as much as that weekend used yeah. to earn. And that yeah, time, yeah. I think uh, we used to have a bigger on-call team. Uh, generally, there are three, yeah. four people yeah. on call, but during that time, yeah. there used to be like every team had to dedicate one person for on call, like any component if it fails, because and at that time, every fifteen minutes, a billion dollar revenue is getting made. <laughs> if yeah, anything yeah. fails then it's a big big difficulty for right. people so it no, this is also i think i can i can relate that with again you know the defense things that uh, for example in the indian air force probably there will be even if there is no skirmishes there might be just maybe one two fighter pilots on call that then you know on on command they can get airborne in 30 seconds when there are heightened tensions or let's say if there is some geopolitical instability then there might be much larger volume of fighter pilots on call because they yeah. perceive that there can be something a bigger offensive at any point in time right so uh, right. same same as that that you know on a cyber monday on a, on a black friday on a cyber monday etc now this might be new for our audiences but this is you make uh, say this is similar to let's say pre diwali sale of flipkart in us uh, and the, the western big, parts of the world big billion day and uh, billion amazon day. festival all that stuff happens right all right so in us or in europe uh, just before the christmas Uh, people get on a shopping spree, and then there is this Black Friday where there are very heavy discounts on everything, and then people just go crazy buying. Right, right, right. Uh, so uh, next question uh, is that uh, you know obviously a lot of people get on on call uh, duty, and I have been on a lot of on call duties. I have never actually had to face any incident. It, so on yeah. call is like अच्छा चलो ठीक है रात को आज जागना है on call है but now in that uh, you know unfortunate situation where you are on call and you know something actually goes down. Then yeah. you know, as a level-headed person, how do you go about like what what are the steps we should follow? What should we keep in mind? Right, that's right. Yeah, actually, you know, that is one. Uh, you know, as they say, again, I'm I'm uh, feeling that I'm giving too many references to you know armed forces here, but uh, I think in this situation, this on call or you know production down situation, a lot of things relate very well with that. That one of the core, uh, you know, very important quality to possess is being able to perform with the same efficiency or you know very very high high efficiency, even under the situation of extreme uh, pressure, right? Where you know there is a lot at stake, you know that uh, you know right actions at this moment, you know even every single moment, every single second, every single minute has extremely high value. Right actions might lead to huge value. or well, and at the same time wrong actions might also lead to extreme amount of damage to you know the organization that you have uh, be it reputation be it revenue anything uh, but these are such environments right and of course very candidly it's not um, uh, you know everyone is not cut for that uh, however as they often say that true leaders are that are tested in the toughest times right uh, in the in the peace time of course it's hard to know who is the best uh, you know general of the army when there's peace time you cannot say right uh, but uh, right. you know who were the best generals of the army is get gets tested in the you know uh, hardest of the time so you know in such situations the same thing happens that the best leaders get tested in such time i think one of the most important thing uh, you know when in in such situations is being being calm right uh, being able to have this bigger picture that you know there is a situation there is something that has gone down of course if something has gone down something in the past was not perfect right right but right now like priority of thinking 
you know it's very important like you know prioritization of what should be done at this point in time is one of the most important skill to uh, to possess to kind of you know be a hero in such situations right and not a person who actually uh, further damaged it which is what is the prioritization now let's say something is broken is my priority figuring out that why did it break or you know who broke it or you know starting the blame that you know this person did this that is why this happened no that no is not supposed to be the priority the pri- that this is still a good you know valuable thing to do in the in a right way at a different time so that it doesn't happen again right but at this moment the priority has to be what is broken and how we can make it less broken if not per- perfectly fixed right even that is high value right let's say if if 100% of the orders are not getting through let's say in a e-commerce company let's say you are amazon you are uh, in leadership or you are an engineer at amazon and uh, it's a cyber monday or let's say it's pre diwali sale and the systems have gone down you know 100% of the orders are not going through and you know that within 5 minutes you can do something which will make sure that 70% of start, uh, orders start getting through even that is great right and then you can tell that all right here is another thing that uh, you know like here are the patches which could be done in another 30 minutes which will make sure 100% of the orders start getting through right yeah. now the third priority would be that you know then we when it's all over we know that you know lives have been saved then we figured out figure out that exactly what are the series of events which led to this and then like this could also be done one week afterwards right this can also be done one week afterwards it you know so i think that is one like often people fall into this some of people who are in the audience might have been in the situation where you know the person who is leading is kind of panicking and asking who did this who did that uh, and you know why did you do this that is absolutely the worst kind of thing like you know if you are seeing this actually even if you are a junior person it might be a lot of value to just you know calm down the environment that all right we will get to that right now priority is fixing this let's talk about how do we improve the situation here and even putting it out out there like one thing that i do believe is that uh, you can do that even if you are an intern trust me like that is one very beautiful thing about the you know uh, good product companies and the world of technology that even as a intern if you put it across that all right here is what is broken here is what we are trying to achieve in next 15 minutes uh, do everyone agree to that even if it might be you know your engineering manager with 15 years of experience and if they say that yes this is what we agree to and what caused this what series of events led to this we will look at that maybe after one hour once we have addressed this all right so even if you are an intern like have the confidence to say the right things and get things back on track if you see that and of course as a leader it is your job you cannot all consider yourself a leader if you are not able to prioritize things properly and if you are not able to focus on the things which are most important right now being calm being more mindful you know that what am i thinking what am i acting what am i saying and are all these things going to improve the situation in the most quick way and in the most uh, outcome driven way that is something i think that every leader has to be mindful of and if you feel like actually trust me uh, it's very natural let's say as a founder i am founder of a company or i am the let's say head of engineering for a company where i know that every single minute millions of dollars are being uh, you know lost it is very natural it is human to get agitated in that situation but instead of if you know that you are agitated instead of jumping into things right then it is okay to take 2 minutes to calm yourself down 5 minutes to calm yourself down put your thoughts you know have clarity of thoughts that what you want to execute and then get on to things right those 2 minutes are not wasted those 2 minutes might create a lot of value right 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 then the next thing uh, i would like to talk about which is actually title of today's talk as well is about uh, yeah. you know uh, war rooms so yeah. lot of scenarios i have seen war rooms getting formed so it might not sometimes it's yeah. like you know on call you find out some error and then okay we have to yeah. fix it maybe you put a patch and then you have to properly fix it next two yeah. three days another kind of scenario yeah. i have seen so at zomato we were using some order ids with an integer and yeah. we were about to run out so then a war room was uh, created that okay within right, right, one right. week we have to change everything to strings everywhere right. because 
Right. At the current volume we were doing, and the volume was growing also. Within a month, it will all turn into it will overflow right. integer. So before that, we have to right. make sure. Right. So sometimes, like there is you know one month long war room also, but sometimes one week yeah. long war room that okay we have right. patched something right now, but let's figure yeah. a proper solution. So what's right. the situation? What's the atmosphere in a war room? You might have been in war rooms also before. Right. So right. what's right. the mindset? Right. What's the pressure? And right. what good practices you must follow when right. you are in a team which is. working in a high pressure scenario for one week at a time or something like right. that right 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 yeah actually you know it's it's a very i think um, not everyone gets to experience that but those who do i would say they are all very very lucky because as they say that the best war stories are written in the trenches right uh, you know <laughs> these are the times which which kind of you learn a lot as well and like amazing memories a, a different kind of adrenaline rush right uh, so that all is there Uh, i think however at the same time it needs a lot of you know great leadership and level headedness to execute to be able to execute under pressure right so some of the things uh, that i see that you know which must be avoided as the highest priority is which is that under pressure often some people end up doing things which are you know there is there is a word a funny word for it as well i'm uh, not able to recall that right now but which essentially mean you know like something similar to let's say cascading failure that you know in uh, under pressure you are doing things which are causing further damage than actually improving anything right just because compounding you know the issue you are doing compounding the issue yeah. right so most important yeah. thing is just try to make sure that you know you are not furthering the damage right it's okay to you know kind of say that this is fine this can remain as it is we don't know how to improve this so we are not going to touch this and we are whatever we are doing we will do it in a way which definitely doesn't cause any further damage data loss prevention uh, which is you know uh, like again uh, you must make sure that which is kind of a sub part of uh, preventing any further damage that you do not make any changes which cause certain data damage right because its data is is gold uh, it is the you know for any tech company <laughs> data is what we all live on right so you cannot lose that uh, imagine if if let's say if amazon loses all the past data then amazon <laughs> probably as a business would vanish right they will not have any upper hand over any other right. company you know because they know about me they know that what i buy what i do not buy that is why they are able to get me to buy more right they are able to take out of decisions basis you know uh, data of millions of or billions of people that they have so ensuring that you know you are not doing anything which will lead to further data loss or if there is data being lost already then first thing you have to do is that you have to kind of prevent that right Yeah. another important thing is that often again in the stress environment it is possible that we start doing too many things that you know do this do this do this do this and then when we are trying to run it we do not know what is the difference what thing is making and then you know like i have changed 10 variables at the same time and then i do not know that which of them are actually improving which of them are not improving but rather degrading i only know net net right mm -hmm. so another right way to do it is that change one thing at a time see that whether that change is doing the improvement that you intended from it or not right do not get into you know do not get overwhelmed and start doing 10 things at a time even if it is a team as a team as well i think it is important to compartmentalize and you know let's say when there are five or seven people trying to do something together so you compartmentalize you tell them that you are only doing this i am only doing this and these two are sandboxed so we know that how they are working right so doing one thing at a time is also super important another one is that you know uh, one should document this i have had personal experience of a counter case that you know the system was down uh, two three guys you know in the war room they did bunch of stuff and it, it is working right now and when they were asked what did you do you know can you tell us that what all have you done uh, after which it is working because you know can it go down again <laughs> because you know like it is magically working but it might the core issue might still not be fixed it is working maybe because just because there is lesser traffic right now and the moment traffic yeah. comes back again it will go down again and they were able like you know we don't know we were just trying out bunch of things we had run some 20 30 commands and it just started working right so this is a very bad state to be in right that let's say your system was down suddenly it came up and bunch of people were doing certain things but they do not know what all they have done there is no trail of that all right what all they have changed what all commands they have run right and then it's it's a worst situation to be in because you do not know what is working is going to continue working or it will crumble down again right 
so it is very very important that you document every single thing that you are doing when you are in the war room it is super super important that you are documenting every single thing you are doing so that you might be doing a lot of experimentations you might be trying out things right? that happens in the war rooms all the time right that we just let's say i see that system is down the monitoring is in place but let's say some of the variables we are not able to monitor i will say let's in, just try to increase the let's say ram of our, all our servers and maybe that works right maybe it is uh, you know it is all in a deadlock because the ram is low right but i should document that i have tried increasing ram after that these were the system monitoring readings right so whatever changes you are making or i might say that you know i'm going to let's say increase the u limit right so like in any linux operating system there is a limit set that how many parallel network connection a machine can open all right and that might be the bottleneck right one might say that uh, because my u limit which is the number of parallel network connection is set to let's say just uh, 32 or 64 so that is why my system is you know kind of overwhelmed so maybe i may say that i have enough ram i can say that my u limit can be you know 256 instead of uh, you know 32 and that might just make everything work it is all clogged on the network if i make that wider then you know it will start working but again if i am changing u limit i should document that across all the servers i have changed u limit from 32 to 264 and whether that worked whether did that didn't work after that right after that there might be some consequence that you know you changed the u limit and then suddenly your ram users have a spike right but documenting is super super important keep documenting every single thing you are doing what observation this is again you know uh, those of you who might have seen chernobyl uh, <laughs> yes, yes, so yes. <laughs> right so uh, like in nuclear reactors for example if you are trying some things out the assistants were insisting that you know like let's follow the manual let's keep documenting everything we are doing and the boss of course said like you know fuck it i'm <laughs> saying just do it and that is the disaster that actually you know this simple thing not following documentation and not documenting things you are doing might even lead to you know disasters like chernobyl fortunately we like of course there are even software systems at nuclear power plants as well so you know if someone is kind of you know in the war room actually you know like there might be a software engineer who might be fighting a war room story in a nuclear power plant as well right so it is equally course, course. like it's harder to imagine and perceive right but there might be software systems which might lead to a disaster like like chernobyl as well and there might be Correct. you know even maybe some any software engineer can end up in that situation right so it is important that you follow the documentation you know that what all have been done before you document what you are doing so that better decisions can be taken every single moment right after your actions as well that's i think super super right. important i think the take away is actually not to give up the basic scientific principle that yes. when you change one thing at a time and then you document what was yeah. changed and what was the effect yeah. then you change yeah. the next thing i mean whatever yeah. is the pressure but that principle right. should not be it's right. not negotiable uh, right. so that's on uh, that actually trust me on this that do not leave the scientific uh, method even if there is anyone sitting on top of your head and continuously shouting ki why are you so slow why are you so slow don't leave the scientific method on this i have a very funny anecdote one of my uh, ex colleague uh, and you know like back then the project we were working on and the person who was on top of all of us you may call the cto or someone he said this guy was like we used to make fun of him that this guy is so cool that even if the cto is sitting on his on his head and shouting he will just calmly be on his laptop and if he is asking that you know what are you doing he will just say i am reading the logs <laughs> that you know like very calmly ki dude i am not going to run 50 random commands that you might be insisting just go ahead and run i will follow the systematic process because i know that is what is going to lead us to right outcome that is the fastest way to restore the systems you know just doing random things just trying out random things without understanding what they do what that might lead to can only end up in even worse situation than making anything better so even you know being able to remain calm and stick to the systematic process of fixing things is i think super super important no matter what people might be shouting no matter and it's natural imagine understand this that when there is a war when there are bullets flying there will be some people who will panic that's natural but a good leader mm-hmm. despite people panicking they will be able to hold the grounds plan out an strategy out of the situation and lead people out of it 
makes sense makes sense uh, next uh, we have uh, you know I, i asked some people who have been in uh, war rooms and on call and i asked them what are some of the common terms so i asked across like people in the community and friends and i got a list of terms I would like to you know go through some quick explanations on them for people who have never been in a situation they might have not come across these terms so yeah. what are these and what do they mean when they are very fancy sounding terms i think first one is yeah. kill switch what yeah, is yeah, kill switch yeah. for <laughs> what's the purpose right 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 yaar yeah, kill switch uh, of course the name uh, you know it's always self explanatory so again let me give a uh, analogy from the you know from the front lines war front lines right now let's say you have a bunch of uh, you know you may call them your armory or your shoulders and uh, there are there's a new kind of armory you know that you want to deploy right but you know that uh, you know it's not really tested we are in second world war there is a lot of machines that we are trying to deploy that uh, you know might not or might or might not perform as we expect them right, right. so i would want to uh, have you know a way to kill them if they are kind of counterproductive to you know what i want right so this is something that companies do that let's say if there is a new aggressive feature that we want to roll out and it is very hard to you know fully fully test it in the production environment right and there are certain risks that it might affect the system negatively so let's say it got deployed and right after that we notice that you know it is maybe high probability that it might be because of this new thing that we deployed right so now what are what are our options our option might be that you know now let's revert back all the changes that were done for this feature now that is going to take a lot of time that cannot be done in like you know 30 seconds so while developing the feature itself companies keep a kill switch that let's say this entire feature will get deactivated if there is a certain record set in the database right uh, that the moment let's say there could be a simple product feature name and true or false against it if this entire feature will work or be on production and only and only if this flag is set to true if i make it false it is as good as this entire code not existing right mm-hmm. so this has to be however part of the development if something is built then you can yeah, suddenly inject it with switch precaution right? measure basically it's a precaution measure when you are developing the feature itself right so companies right. do that any you know any experienced seasoned leader if they see that there is a possibility of this affecting anything negatively once it goes to the production so in the development itself we will say that let's have a kill switch so that when we put it on production after 5 minutes if we something is going wrong production went down we will just change this to false and this will be pulled out then fine you know our feature will not be on production anymore but no one can tell us that we took the system down right so that is what a kill switch is if you ever feel if you are developing anything where you see any risks then you should definitely try to incorporate a kill switch and then kill switch can be removed over time let's say if it went on production and then for quite some time we know that it is fairly stable and it is you know additional code baggage that we have we know that it this kill switch is never needed then fine you know like in future refactoring the kill switch can be removed or it can be kept as well that no harm that you know it is if there is no additional overhead it can can be kept forever uh, but yes that is what kill switches are about right 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 at that uh, zomato also we used to try out actually kill switches before uh, december because yeah. that's when peak used to have been yeah. like you know that 25th yeah. december 31st to that period uh, maximum orders yeah. so you should test yeah. out things like if say review service is down so we can turn off reviews and still people like when they search restaurants they will see listing but they will not see the review of items but yeah. it will yeah. uh, continue to work because yeah. generally if review service is down then it brings down the menu service as well because menu has to query yeah, the review yeah. to show that review thing but we need to have a feature yeah. to okay disable reviews whenever you want to right. this is interesting right. Right. another term i think uh, gets thrown around a lot in war room scenarios database rollback so how helpful yeah. is that is it something commonly used yeah, yeah. no so database rollback again uh, the term itself is uh, self explanatory that uh, most of the times of course as we mentioned that um, most of the you know larger systems they all they are all on top of you know data is their blood right they are just working right. on top of data so when we are saying that uh, you know data is the blood and then any new feature might change the schema might create new records might you know kind of have certain structural change to the database right now what if that uh, this new feature caused 
um, you know big change to data and now that is uh, that is what is causing a lot of issues right how do you change that now let's say like a simple more more uh, concrete example let's say my new feature to build my new feature i changed schema of certain tables right but i i was a very shabby developer and i didn't realize that the same uh, tables schema etc is also being used by a lot of other features right and i just okay. pushed it in uh, now like all those services which were using the older schema which were not refactored they're down now now of course my one option could be now go and change all those other features right which is of course is not possible in you know 30 seconds or maybe even 10 minutes or or even in hours it's going to it might take weeks or months to do that right so my only option then is that again i do the kill switch on my feature that that is stopped and then i also have to revert the database back to where it was so that other things can continue working right so that is generally when the database roll back come into the play fortunately most of the modern databases provide a very smooth way to do that like you know be it mysql be it you know postgres etc there is always a way where you can kind of uh, like basically your database is not just you know a snap in time uh, you can have a snapshots of the database is taken at an interval right or you know there are a lot of you know like whatever commands have been run you can kind of run the reverse commands and uh, revert back all the changes that have been done to whichever state you want to go right so that is what database rollback does of course in the process of database rollbacks there is always a possibility of losing some data now let's say you know a certain database changes were done and then it was live for 10 15 minutes and certain additional data was collected in this time and then you are doing a database rollback so that might lead to you know like whatever data was collected in 10 15 30 minutes you might end up losing that but then there is a you know kind of a, a vetting need to be done that what is better is it okay to lose 10 minutes of data might be you know a few hundreds or few thousands of the records but we ensure that our all the systems go back become stable or you might take a snapshot of this database right now and then immediately roll back so that you do not really lose lose it it might be lost in the data that is in production but the actions in this time are also stored in the snapshot that you have taken and you you might see that you know if you want to kind of refresh them and then put them back in the database uh, but yeah you know data that is how database would that work might not be the best best strategy all the times you will have to vet out that whether doing the rollback is gives us more value right. or not doing the rollback gives us more value right 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 and that also means uh, when we are choosing databases the ability to do rollback is also an important factor yes. to consider yes. absolutely absolutely because when you are building the software at that on that day it might not be a consideration at all but now let's say right. you are multi billion dollar company and then you are at a stage where every single second you are losing millions of dollar and whether your database supports rollback or not might lead to you know like at that point in time it might be you know very very important consideration again this is where i think you know experience and you know knowledge comes into the play of the leaders that you know they would be able to say that this is not something that we might need now we might not even need it for next 6 months or a year but we might need it when we are, you know 2 years down the line and it might be a very expensive issue to have if our database doesn't so support rollbacks and to what extent it supports rollback right 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 then apart from data similar term i think uh, gets thrown yeah. around for the code base right. itself a lot of times you know right. security right. says right. you know, just right. check out last commit and try to see right so, Right. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. Uh, does that work right. well or not? Yeah. Right. Right. No. So actually, you know, even uh, binary search, which is often algorithm that we use for the fundamental data uh, data structure <laughs> algorithm problems, but you know, even applying binary search on commits is also a very powerful tool. Uh, so right. basically, now let's say suddenly you realized that my systems have gone down. Right. Now it cannot happen without any input. Right. There has to be something that changes somewhere. That is when things start breaking. Right. right? uh so check out last commit would be the obvious one that let's see ki you know just before things went down what was the change made to our code running on the production let's see that is there something that might have caused it it might not be you know maybe nothing in the last commit caused it but there is a high probability that whatever is the last code added to the code base is what caused it right uh now there might be an intern who just you know he didn't know his stuff and you know just uh, wrote some fancy code and you know get that got pushed into the production without much proper review uh, or it might be you know a new feature who was pushed by the most elite tech team of the company which is causing that it could be anything right, uh, right, right, right. but seeing that what was the last thing 
and even then you know like often there's another thing that the last push might have 20 commits in it right there might be a you know a pr which just got merged but there were way too many commits to it right so again doing a binary search amongst all of them that we know that in this deployment these there were these these 60 commits which went in which of them might have caused it we don't know but quickly you can do a binary search on them let's just start with the first uh, the last commit right is it causing that if i just revert that is the system coming back in no let's try the last one is the system coming back in no then let's try the middle one and then within just three four iteration we would know exactly which code line caused it uh, so right. that is about you know kind of going through the last commit and figuring out what might have caused the issue right 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 bisecting the git history basically bisecting the git history basically and then you know instead you might just be trying everything and that might take a lot of time and this way just two three iterations you will end up to which might have caused it and it it right. could also be done on your local machine right it doesn't you do not need to deploy everything on production but you can just do it in your local machine within 5 minutes you would know that exactly which commit caused the issue right right actually uh, my experience is like uh, when i have been on call this is very important because i don't always have context of all the code that was written in the last exactly. say one month or something so i have to exactly. go by the commits and then i will find the faulty commit and then i will read that code and understand okay what happened right. otherwise right. i don't have understanding of the entire code 30 right. people are writing code right. every right. 30 right. commits right. are coming in right. right so i think one important thing is that good leaders know that they are not superman no one is superman right one might right. say that no 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 i am not going to do this i am going to read the code in detail and then i will figure out what is going <laughs> wrong so you know understand that you are not superman you cannot read thousands of lines of code within few minutes and understand that what is going on it's okay i don't know it's a black box thing i don't know what is going on i will just try out which commits make system work which commits do not make system work and when i have zeroed down that this was the commit which might be 100 lines of code or 50 lines of code after which system doesn't work and before the system works then i will probably just go and read those 50 lines and try to maybe get my head around it or maybe try to get inputs from someone who might know that better but understanding do, do not try to be a superman when the systems are down <laughs> <laughs> correct 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 uh, then there is another term uh, often gets yeah. uh, used is like you know as a yeah. mechanism for recovery is like let's yeah. throttle our request so what yeah. does that mean when we are saying this yeah so throttle basically you know uh, is essentially you know it's also a word in the vehicles as well right that throttle yeah. uh, and it like as english word it means that to reduce the speed of engine right by closing the throttle that is what it means that uh, throttle basically what throttle in uh, automobile does is it's a part in any automobile what it does is that uh, you know when you press it or when you reduce the intake it essentially reduces the intake of the fuel to the engine which is definitely going to lead to slower uh, throughput from the engine right exactly same thing in the tech world as well that if your backend systems are the engine and let's say the request being sent to them or the load being sent to them is kind of you know what pushes them to you know uh, the outcome that we expect from them you can reduce that right you can say that you know these shouldn't be sent at this rapid speed we are able to see that our systems are not able to serve to that so let's throttle that what that means is that let's say i may say that right now my servers are experiencing rpm of say 1000 requests per minute right my servers are experiencing 1000 requests per minute and i am able to see that the systems are not able to handle that so what i can do is that i can like if I, there is any way i have to kind of throttle that to say that let's reduce this speed let's say i might just simply say that from the clients from where i am getting too many requests i'll put a captcha on them which will force them to reduce the speed at which they are you know kind of sending the request some of you might have sent a captcha popping up on google search that you are doing a google search and then it shows a captcha which is in a way also google is throttling the request they see they feel that there are very high volume of searches coming from your side which they do not see as natural which might lead to system degradation on their end so they will say solve this captcha first and then they will be let you search right so this is essentially different ways of Uh, throttling the request, and then of course in the later tiers there can be ways of purely technical way of throttling the request. If you know that one of my service is calling another service, and this call is happening at a very high rate, then you can just say that let's reduce it, and that might get our systems back up. Right, 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 right. Uh, actually, very interestingly, I mean right. these days even these cloud providers like AWS etc. They sometimes come with out of the box uh, throttling debouncing yes. services in the load balancer yes. itself. Like you just install a load balancer with throttle service available, so you turn on, turn off throttle automatically. 
very useful uh, and then uh, finally very common term gets uh, <laughs> talked about a lot uh, so sometimes uh, you know techies are discussing that you know we are under a distributed denial of service uh, attack so what essentially does a denial of service attack mean and you know what can you do to also recover from something like yeah, this yeah yeah so dos you know in the technical words its acronym is dos right denial of service uh, yeah. or ddos which is distributed denial of service so uh, dos is simply denial of service attack is that you know like of course there are shitty people in the world uh, who are <laughs> making other stuff break rather than building something but of course we have to admit what the world is and uh, thrive in that uh, so often there are you know people who might launch a denial of service attack on your services right uh, which simply means what does denial of services mean that uh, let's say if you have a shop and you know that their shop can only cater to 10 customers at a time you only have let's say four or five shop assistants they can cater to 10 uh, customers at a time now let's say there was a weird person who says i want to make sure ki is bande ki dukaan se kuch nahi bike so what he can do is <laughs> he can start sending thousands of fake customers to your shop every hour what they will do is they will come they will just waste time of your uh, shopping assistants and not buy anything they will waste their 10 minutes and then go right they will not buy anything so the real customers who are trying to come to your shop they will see a huge line in front of your shop uh they might wait for some time and then they will leave right that like you know maybe i'll buy from the next shop so effectively the real customers are not able to buy from your shop because there's a huge queue created in front of your shop and uh, you know people who are actually queuing up they are not really people you want at your shop they are just you know they are random people so how could one do that for your online services Right. now let's say there is let's take example of interview bay now there are genuine people or let's say scaler that there are genuine people who want to come learn and uh, do stuff here right now let's say and we know that our systems are capable to serve 10000 or 100000 live users at the same time there can be 100000 people studying at the same time using interview bay and our servers will work fine we know that it is very hard in india even if there are let's say uh, you know uh, 10 lakhs or 20 lakhs students at a time only 1 or 2 lakhs will want to study parallelly so our systems are capable of that so our systems we have only built systems in a way where that can be catered right now let's say there's a city person and he starts sending a lot of fake requests there are a lot of fake requests that are being sent right which exceeds uh, you know 1 lakh uh, requests uh, that we can handle right so naturally when the genuine person comes then the site might be down it might say that you know site is not opening it is just forever loading right so that is just denial of service now to create that volume of request one it is very hard for one to create this volume of request from one computer right so what uh, these uh, you know hackers or you know i would rather call them not hackers but city people <laughs> they do is that they will create a botnet you know like often you might install certain browser on your uh, browser you might install some plugin or extension on your browser or you might install some uh, app on your mobile which might not be actually genuine app you know these uh, hacking applications created by you know uh, these uh, people who operate botnets and these applications might start sending let's say now i am a person i am a black hat hacker uh, and you know i just do shitty stuff to earn money and i let's say there is someone who want me to take zomato down i am let's say you know for whatever reason i want to take zomato down i paid money to this uh, bad person he has botnet created he has created some city mobile application that he got installed into mobiles of 10 million people and from his con- computer he can say that all those mobile phones start sending request to zomato.com when that is happening so th- there are so many there will be so many fake requests going to zomato or interview bait uh, from you know these uh, people who don't even know that their phones are sending these requests right uh, and this is distributed in app of service because now there is no users it is very hard to identify that these requests are coming from so many different ips that even for interview bait it is hard to know which are genuine which are not genuine right because when people right. from whose mobiles or browsers these requests are coming they themselves not know that you know these requests are being sent from their devices they might be very well genuine users as well right so it gets even harder to kind of uh, tackle them but again throttling the point we were talking about earlier throttling helps with that that if there are requests coming at a very high volume from a single ip like for example in interview bit as well we have that that if you start sending 
request above a certain rate, which we know cannot be a genuine user, then automatically it will present you a captcha that fill this captcha only then I will, I'm going to serve future request of yours. Correct. Right? Okay. So then that way so DDoS sure can be avoided. Yeah, yeah. So that prove to me that you are a human. And if you prove to me you are a human, only then I will let you access my services now on those. Now, of course, there's another bad, uh, you know, flip side to that, that often in colleges, campuses, you know, institutional campuses, often what happens is that everyone in the college is behind a proxy. What proxy means is that there's a singular IP to the outside world and everyone in the college is behind that singular IP, right? So to interview bit, it will seem like that all these high volume of requests, which are all genuine requests uh, are coming from one single IP. Right, which is the uh, IP of that, that college problem. campus. So then uh, there are also ways to kind of uh, handle that. That of course you can create, let's say for example, at interview bit, we kind of listed, whitelisted that these are, let's say set of 50 IPs. We know these are the campus IPs of these uh, most popular, biggest campuses in India. And we are not going to throttle right. requests coming from these colleges. At least, or we can say that the throttle limits are going to be much higher if the requests are coming from these okay. places. But if we see very high rate of requests coming from any other IP, then there will be a throttle uh, deployed, which is, you know, prove yourself that a human and then only you can use the services. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now that college thing, I, we also used to face similar thing whenever we used to have some competition or something and, uh, you know, the, the competition would stop working because their IP would get blacklisted very early because all the requests yeah. coming in from same uh, right. campus uh, right. land network. Right. Before I actually move to other uh, questions, I, I have a few more, but there was a very interesting question that uh, came up on the chat. So, and, and I feel it's a super important question to you know answer to yourself as a techie as well. If in your tech team, you are the only one who is always solving the problems, mm. then what's yeah. the path to growth? There is not like, of course, we all as a human, we all learn from people around us. There's always a lot to learn from people around us, right? But even if you do not have, you know, if you are the only one, uh, you know, in the team, that's okay. Because, you know, as there's this concept of first place, second place, third place, right? That uh, uh, your office might be the place where you can be surrounded by people and learn from them. But even if not, there are various online communities that you can be part of. Like to be very candid, uh, we are very proud of the scalar community. Uh, where, you know, like people might not have uh, the most inspiring people around them at work, but in the scalar communities, they thrive, they have, they are able to have great conversations, great discussions. So getting involved with, you know, like internet is a superpower, of course. And what it has done is that it has kind of made the entire, uh, you know, ecosystem an open field. We can get connected to the, you know, most inspiring people. Uh, for example, you know, like I do believe that here we are able to converse. Uh, so I think getting involved in even online communities, the right kind of online communities where, uh, you know, there are people with the right kind of experience, uh, aspirations, uh, etc. It does help a lot. It's not necessary that you have to be, you know, it, it has to come from work itself. Sometimes it comes from work. It might come from the friend circle. It might come from the communities that you are part of. Right, right, right. Communities, obviously, very important uh, where, where you learn from. Right. Uh, coming back to another question, so you know this again. After the war room is uh, sort of the you know sol solution is found out, war room is closed down. Then RCA documents are created uh, everywhere, root cause analysis documents. And uh, I heard most uh, companies follow. I think you know, this is Six Sigma and, and all operational companies have this principle like five level five whys you should ask to create an RCA. So, what are generally practices that are followed and why do we need an RCA? So, anything will shed light on. Right, right. right. So, as we were talking earlier that, you know, uh, RCA is essentially root cause analysis, right? Uh, that, uh, you know, what caused it? You know, when, when things broke, of course, you know, if, if there was a, for example, let's take an example of Cargill, right? That Cargill thing happened. We realized that there are people who have entered our territory and now we have to repel them. At that moment, of course, the focus was on how do we repel them? We claim back our territory, right? However, the second thing would also be, which generally is not that glamorous and we don't get hear about that much. I'm sure that, you know, our national security agency then would have figured out that what caused people to enter our territory at the first place, right? And then uh, we had to work so hard to repel them, right? So at the first place, ideal would be, but that is not the question at that moment. At that moment, of course, the thing is that you repel them. But then the RCA is going to unearth the thing that what were the lapses in our processes which allowed people to enter our territory and then, you know, be remain undetected for six months, right? 
So that is essentially what RCA is. Let's say system went down. At that moment in the war room, it's gonna be that how do we get them back up? That's all. But once that is done, then we also do not want that we keep fighting this war every year, right? Uh, so then we are going to figure out that what is the what was the root cause of this being happening? So companies also, you know, all the good tier one product companies, they follow a very structured process for that. They will create a document out of it. They will figure out that what were the things, what were the series of events. And often these series of events are also, you know, it's a science in itself. It's very, very complicated. The series of events, you know, there is something called as butterfly effect uh, in physics, right? Where like basically what butterfly effect mean is that even a butterfly uh, flapping its wings might cause a cyclone in some different part of the world because of the cascading effects, right? So even in the software system, such things are possible that something which doesn't look like a cause of what happened naturally, but when you go in detail, when you start following the trail, then you realize that some very small minor things done, very unintentional, very innocent things done many months back might have caused it, right? So that is what RCA do, five level why, that you do not just put it on this, but let's say when you are, the first question would be that, you know, this is also a psychological, uh, you know, structure framework that when you are trying to find root cause of something, you have to ask why at least five times, right? That, you know, let's say if I say that, why did the system go down? Then there would be one answer that, you know, like let's say databases went down, that is why system went down. Then my question would be, why did databases go down? Then my would be all right. The, the, you know, the number of requests coming to the database was too high, uh, which was more than what databases could handle. That, that is why it went down. Then I would say that, you know, why did the number of requests coming to the database went so high suddenly when earlier they were never high. So basically at least asking why five times will get you to the real root cause, right? So that is, you know, that is what we do in the root cause analysis. Exceptionally important thing that of course, you know, the system might have gone down. You might have immediately within 10 minutes, 30 minutes, you might have gotten it back up, but you do not want it happening every day, right? You do not want fighting that war every day. And right. similarly, let's say there were people who entered Kargil, our forces repelled them back, but we do not want that happening every single year, right? So then we will do the root cause analysis and like, for example, uh, defense forces, then they ensure that there is fencing done across the border. There are floodlights installed across the border. There are sensors installed across the borders that even if we are not patrolling those areas in the peacetime, even then if there is any movement that gets reported and then that can be tracked and that can be repelled before it leads to these kind of things, right? So that is what root cause analysis is about. Right, right, right. And it's very, I think, valuable these documents uh, because mm -hmm. uh, in bigger teams, mostly uh, part of onboarding also is you have to read some of the older RCAs in yeah. it. Many companies I've seen, yeah. they say that, you know, whenever you work on a new system, you read these are five last RCAs, please read that. And that's important to have that context for everybody working on that uh, system. It right. becomes part right. of knowledge base. Right. Right. Uh, then we have this uh, question, uh, which is, uh, I have been saying recently, actually, as the work culture everywhere, tech across everything is improving. SRE roles, DevOps roles uh, these days, uh, they generally have uh, this in perks of the work that we have blameless post-mortem culture. And right. uh, on Twitter, etc. also people right. post like, you know, uh, can you recommend companies which have a blameless post-mortem culture? So mm -hmm. what is this blameless post-mortem culture? Right. Why right. there is so much focus on it? Why is it important? Right, right, right. right. No, so this is also an important, uh, you know, mindset shift or, you know, uh, the, you know, the belief shift that the purpose of RCA or post-mortem is not finding the culprit and, you know, hanging him. That's not the purpose at all. It's nature of the, you know, any doing anything big that things might break at one point in time. And the nature of, you know, this is as Jeff Bezos say at Amazon that it's always day one, right? That we consistently, we never say that, you know, we have arrived. We always behave like a young kid trying to struggle to build something, right? Uh, so things are going to break. That is part and parcel of doing big things, right? When someone is uh, making something big, some things will break. What is important is that whenever something breaks, we learn from it. And it's not about blaming. It's not about someone like, you know, even the best coder in, in the team, even the founder of the company who is a coder might make a mistake and it might lead to things breaking, right? Correct. The reason is that we learn from it. The purpose of post-mortem is not firing someone, not at all. So actually, even when you are working in an organization, if you are confident that you are in an organization with the right culture, 
like even if you know that there is something that you did that might have caused it do not hesitate about putting it forth as quickly as you you know figure it out uh never try to hide it because you know in any company with good culture you will never be hanged for it rather you will be probably rewarded for the fact that you are able to come up with that you know this is what i did and this might have caused this issue let's make sure that everyone knows that in future we shouldn't do this right so as a part of a you know a fast moving team of capable people everything you do you do it with best of your intent even if something goes wrong because of that it, there is a value that can be created out of that which is the learning that this thing cannot happen ever again right so never try to hide Uh, because you know it's as as we say that it's blameless port mortem right uh, i can share my personal uh, you know story here uh, i think this was 2012 and uh, we basically had uh, like now of course aws has uh, you know a lot of uh, indexing services but back then i think uh, aws didn't have that so we we had our own cluster of uh, you know servers running solar solar is basically you know indexing uh, service and uh, i was doing some stuff around that and for whatever reason what i did was that what was the data in my local machine i copied that over into the production system okay. not the database but the indexes the index server index. of solar right what that led to was that on production in a particular section on production what was visible was the dummy data from my laptop right okay uh, <laughs> uh which is you know of course very stupid thing to do and but yeah i did that i like you know until unless we break some things on production uh we are not true engineers uh and then it was like across the world you know in our new york office pune office berlin office everyone bells are ringing that you know this what are we seeing on production why suddenly you know this content which doesn't look like which is kind of placeholder content for text dummy images why are they surfacing on production right uh which have very absurd you know sales price so there might be let's say a photo of bunny which is being sold for 100000 dollars on the website but then immediately i you know while uh, i was not even part of the team which handled solar and i saw that you know this is happening and then like in the common group i quickly typed that uh, guys i had just run a script on my local machine uh, related to solar might be related you know i i cannot be sure it does i am not able to connect the dots that how me running something on my laptop might cause this right uh, but then with that we were able to fix that within 5 minutes because you know or you know if i had not spoken that out then the production would have remained in a bad state for many many hours right or if i had tried that you know let's my let's let me try to cover my tracks right uh, and then as an rc when we did rc of that as well i was part of the team which was then working on the rc of that of course i did it so i am supposed to be part of the team then it was very very clear that the production credentials shouldn't be in the code base like it happened because the production credentials were in the code base that we were checking out it was on my local machine when i ran the command there was just one command which was missing like one parameter to the command which was missing and it defaulted to the production credentials and pushed all the data there right Got it. Uh, yeah. like because i was upfront about you know telling that this is how it happened and there was no blame there was no blame you know the issue was not me running the command on my laptop the issue was the credentials being there in the you know in the code base the the production credentials shouldn't be there in the code base right which is a big security hole as well uh, so yeah this is about blameless post mortem that you know uh, like we all have to like this has to be a culture and you know if if you see it happening again i would say no matter where you are even if you are the director of engineering or you are an intern you should call it out that post mortem you know doing the rca is not about blaming anyone it is about figuring out improvement in the process right, right and actually like you were saying i think it's good for the company too right i mean if you don't have absolutely. a culture of blameless post mortem then people will right. try to put things under the carpet and then right, you will absolutely. find your solutions later rather than earlier absolutely absolutely right. so this uh, you know the company i used to work for uh, fab like this is something very i very fondly remember this that our cto nishet you know very very inspirational person of course uh, uh he had this weird thing that when the systems will be down and then he will come laughing he would say okay okay kya pad gaya hai theek hai koi baat nahi side down hai koi baat nahi chalo dekhte hain kya pad raha hai batao <laughs> and that you know that is very very important that you know being able to laugh at such situations and then like the little fine pad gaya koi baat nahi let's figure it out let's fix it right and there is no no blame on anyone you know tumne kya tumne pad diya bahut badhiya so yeah. you know i think that culture is super super important and another important thing is that often uh, you know we believe this that 
the culture has to only be top to bottom that the you know how cto is behaving is going to define the culture that is not so culture also gets defined bottom to top as well uh, no matter where you are never hesitate to call out the right thing say this is how we should be as a company what we should be as a company stay humble remain open to get corrected as well but you know do not just say that you know if there is something wrong happening and the big guys are doing it so let me just live with that call it out that you know i believe of course in a polite and you know way where you are also open for correction but you know i believe that we should do it in this way this is what is the right way to handle this instead of you know just let's say shouting at people or trying to shift the blame game etc so interesting actually i mean so at uh, coding blocks also an, an, an anecdote is uh, you know varun who has just joined our product team so he was yeah. uh, that time uh, you know i was co-founder he was cto and we had a team which was largely very young people in terms mostly so i think is to break a lecture lo acche chalo office chalte hain and aaj to raat ko baithna padega to yaar matlab kisne phada to bhai chalo ab tum biryani mangao aur ab to raat ko yahi yahi office mein jayega aaj to we stop karna hai so that we always try to set up that you know culture that you know let's all sit down we'll do a hackathon and we'll yeah. fix all of these things let's let's order food and you know yeah. we'll order good food and we'll eat well <laughs> and fix uh, all of that because uh, yeah. solutions come in systems like mistakes happen by yeah. humans but the solutions has to come right. in the system absolutely Definitely. actually on that a very interesting thing that you know in our fab office of new york we had a big board uh, in the office which read make mistakes it is totally okay to make mistakes uh, but keep learning because the more mistakes you make more you will learn yeah. right and similarly i think this quote of uh, facebook was also famous in the very early days they had it actually a board with that in the office move fast and break things right uh, uh. that build things very quickly it's okay if some of the things break in production will like you know we'll learn from it we'll make sure it doesn't happen again but let's move fast it's okay if things break that culture and actually i think that is what this culture is what led to you know massive success of these companies like facebook etc right 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 and it is very encouraging that these days i see all yeah. the jds for sre devops team having this blameless right. postmortem they are writing yeah. in big letters out right. there so it's a it's a good right. culture shift that across the industry right. Right. it's right. happening right. it's getting promoted right. uh, right. and then i think we have our final question and uh, so this is i think uh, again it's a community source question and uh, people have uh, asked this actually Uh, especially people who are in early stage startups uh, so yeah. when the company starts growing na right? so smaller tech teams you generally have uh, people uh, on whom a lot of dependency is there so yeah. if that person is out sick then you can't even fix certain thing that only that person has credential to the yeah. production server to up something yeah. or only that yeah. person knows uh, exactly the certain steps that are needed so those kind of dependencies uh, end up existing as teams uh, grow uh, explode and grow then this can create like a massive problem uh, any tips around you know how to mitigate this kind of a thing as teams grow uh, what are the steps we should uh, follow for this right 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 no so see you know of course it's it's uh, pretty natural that if it is a very very young company there can be certain know hows that the person knows right let's say when interviewed was a company with four people back in 2014 15 it's possible that there are there is some stuff that only i know or there is some stuff that only anshuman knows or some stuff that only tushar knows right uh, but as a company go it is very very important that you know we start putting the processes in place right when you are a small company which is being used by just 10 20 50 000 people fine you know even if it is down for some time maybe you know be like fine big deal and however the human dependency as we say that you know we need to admit that as humans we are very very fragile right and we are not really that efficient so it's very important that uh, you know th- that that is why the you know habit of documenting things habit of writing things down that is super super important that you know whatever you are doing whatever like it might be credentials it might be know how it might be the design that how things are uh, together what are the dependencies between different systems i think the sooner a company starts this habit of documenting it also helps with building greater clarity right let's say if i am doing something and i write it down then immediately after writing it down i might be able to see that how it could be even better so that is one and second is that when when i have written it down and it is a shared knowledge base across all the team then let's say even if i am not available let's say if i am out of network or you know i am uh, i am not well whatever it might be right as i said that humans are very very fragile right there's always someone who can say that nothing to worry i mean you you take rest you are not well 
uh, we will go through the documents and you know we would most likely know everything 99% of the things we would know and we would be able to manage it right however you know when like of course we never want uh, to be part of a team where even if i am having high fever but only i know it so i will have to do it not a good situation to be in right so it's very very important to reduce the human dependency and that doesn't mean that that makes anyone redundant they will still be very highly relevant um, for uh, now i may call out you know i have even like of course uh, the banter across the software developers i even even heard that you know let's not document that so that there is you know no one can fire me because only <laughs> i know this right <laughs> but that's that's generally you know your value is not about what facts you know but your value is about what you can create right uh, so that is a misconception to have that if you just uh, you know will be more relevant if you have know how rather you will be more valued in the company if you are able to set processes create documentations which create such a high value for the company that you know then company is going to say that you know this guy is so structured he puts brings so much structure to the company and our processes it makes us so much robust that we should give this guy promotion and more better hikes than anyone else rather than the person who is just trying to just keep them everything to themselves right so the uh, yeah. even for your growth i think to grow into leadership and keep you know being an important person in the team it's it's a better strategy to kind of set up processes that we are going to document everything we are going to put processes around everything that even if i'm not around you know there is nothing dependent on me right 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 very very actually add to that because recently talking to a lot of you know tech leaders myself as well for yeah. you know, some some product related stuff and i hear keep hearing that SD one to SD two people say that you know understanding yeah. system design is important to grow. Yeah. SD two to SD three everybody says that you know being able to explain to your juniors what you are doing that is the most right. important skill. They say by the time yeah. you become SD two tech wise you know almost everything. But now are you able to explain it to other people? If you can't, then you will not go from SD two to SD three. That's what all these tech leaders uh, are saying. So that's uh, super important that I think like you know I mean that's the crucial part of reducing dependency on yourself as well. Unless you can teach people, mentor other people, yeah. uh, you won't be growing. Uh, I think uh, great insights. Uh, thank you, Vimanyu. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hi. Uh... I am Mohit Yadav. I teach at Scaler. I have I have led teams at Hotstar and Nutanix where I got a chance to build uh, massive scalable products. Uh, the pipelines out of that I build uh, scale to one terabytes of data per day. Uh, the API will be able to scale for ten million users. So that's my background. Uh, we have other guest with us uh, who's Arnav. Uh, Arnav uh, was basically the founder of Coding Blocks and he heads. Uh, mobile department of Zomato, right? Uh, so both of us are here today to talk about how do you debug applications in production, right? And we'll give both perspective this time. We'll talk about front-end and client-side, and we'll also talk about back-end, right? Uh, and for that, uh, we launched a couple of polls on Discord and our Telegram channel to identify what are the major uh, issues and what are the major questions that are coming up? And we've, you know, uh, sort of added them on the right side of the chart if you look at. So we'll go one by one over each question, right? So uh, let's get started. The first question uh, that we sort of want to talk about is what are some of the key points we need to take into consideration while designing applications? Anna, do you want to take it, uh, like talk about the client side first, and then maybe I can give some back end perspective. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so that's uh, basically like uh, keeping the broader theme in mind that you know uh, how how to you know debug in production, how to make things in such a way that it's possible to uh, debug in production in that uh, angle. I'm just answering about uh, design. So uh, there are a bunch of things. I think the, the most important thing is obviously having uh, monitoring and alerting in place before you go to production, before your product is up there with millions of people. So there uh, there are actually a bunch of things there, you know, uh, when we talk about monitoring as well. So one is that, uh, you know, your crash reporting framework. So that sort of Firebase and crash statics have almost become a de facto standard with, with mobile apps at least. With web contents, in fact, by the way, Firebase can be used with contents for crash reporting as well, but there are other frameworks like Sentry and all also uh, exist. So that's uh, basically your, uh, whenever some crashes happen, uh, you have uh, the, the logs for that and you have the stack traces for that. And you should be able to uh, sort of 
trace exactly why that happened there one caveat one more thing is very important is that you should have your source mapping properly set up so basically for web front ends you generally minify your code your javascript code gets minified so your variable and function names are all mangled Similarly, when you are uh, on iOS or on Android development doing that as well, then also you're obfuscating your code. Again, same thing happens. Your symbols, variables, function names, they're all mangled again. So you should have like a reversing uh, those back to your actual so that you can map to exactly which line of source code, which function actually crashed. The source maps need to exist. Um, you should have the source maps properly in place with your crash tracking framework uh, so that the stack traces make sense. Otherwise, the stack trace will come and you won't be able to make sense. That's about the crash uh, part. The other part is uh, user behavior tracking also needs to be there so that you can sort of recreate the exact way the user reached that particular place. So there are a bunch of things. The click streams uh, are there, which is, you know, you basically log what all IDs of uh, entities in the screen buttons and cards and all, which the user clicked one by one. And there is log of that. And uh, there's something called breadcrumbs. So breadcrumbs, like generally every page transition that happens, we generally drop a breadcrumb. Breadcrumb is basically just a log line that, you know, okay, this activity opened, this fragment open or in a web app be like this root got changed slash articles went to slash users something like that okay uh, so breadcrumbs are dropped they help you recreate the user journey how they reach that place where uh, that uh, happened uh, right. and then for the for product people for analytics people we set up things like you know uh, elk or kibana based things for you know just collecting the logs uh, as well those things also need to be set up that's about basically the monitoring part. Another thing that when you're designing applications, it's uh, I feel very important is the you know it's it's gonna be running on your user's device, not on your device. It's a client uh, app that will be running on a browser or mobile phone. Uh, resources could be scarce depending on what kind of device that person is using. Um, so properly profiling memory and being able to detect memory leaks uh, wherever those are happening, reporting on that uh, should also be available. Uh, so that you can keep track of the fact that, you know, if there is some resource bloat that is happening on, on your apps, and that will put off a lot of people that, you know, this app or this website slows my computer down or when this app is open, then other apps are not able to work, things like that. So being able to monitor uh, your memory profile is important. And uh, finally, one very important thing, which is not only really about debugging as such, but general, you know, performance, I would say, is that, uh, you know, uh, working with these streaming HTTP responses using HTTP 2.0, where before the entire response has come, you can start showing something on the screen, or uh, you can use compressed API response. There is a gzip available, and there is an even newer one Google has made called Brotly, B R O T L I. It's a compression screen. So those, uh, you know, using compressed uh, APIs, those are important wherever you're using. Um, uh, images on, on the front end again, you know, probably having a separate URL for thumbnail, which you can first download, uh, you know, one KB, two KB size thumbnail and then download the 200, 300 KB sized actual image so that there is a okayish looking placeholder before the actual image is downloaded. Progressive loading of images we basically call. Uh, those kind of things are, uh, sort of set up properly. Uh, pagination of your APIs again, uh, those things are needed. So I think roughly. Keeping these things in my mind, I would I'd say are important uh, when you are uh, designing uh, front end. Off to you, like what do you think are sort of important uh, steps for the back end? Yeah, that uh, that really helps. Uh, so I'll also start with the same uh, monitoring setup, right? Uh, so I think irrespective of whether it is infra issue or a, a client issue or a back end issue, one thing that really really helps in debugging is uh, the kind of monitoring metrics that you have set up, but in uh, on the back end side uh, it's primarily uh, on the percentile metrics right uh, that how many percent of your users are able to get a response within x amount of time or people typically measure average latencies or maybe uh, you know what is the mean latency but if i have to extend it uh, right i want my 99% of my users to be happy or maybe 99.9% of my users to be happy so measuring these matrices uh, like in terms of the response time and uh, how many 4xx are coming, how many 5xx are coming. If the 4xx are alarmingly high, I just go and check whether uh, I'm getting, uh, you know, lot of unauthorized or un uh, 403 kind of errors. That means that that will give me a hint of uh, attack, right? A, a person is basically trying to game my system uh, because I'm getting lot of forbidden error. If the uh, just imagine a scenario where 
you know, 50% of the users are, or 50% of the requests are translating to uh, 4x6 errors. That is a hint to you uh, that it is an alarmingly high number. Maybe somebody is trying to game your system. Bump up your infra, infra security team can be alerted based on that. Uh, if the number of 5x6 are really high. So typically always look at the kind of HTTP response that you are getting and log it. If that response is alarmingly high, then raise an alert. So this brings me to the second point. After you have captured all the metrics in monitoring path, you raise an alert. Alert can be automated, right? Uh, in automated alerts, you can typically, uh, one type of alert can be that, hey, uh, my CPU utilization for one server is really getting high. So I might want to add more instances because the kind of request that this particular server can handle it's no more able to handle those many requests. So I might want to add new instances. So this is an automated trigger and automated resol resolution as well. Similarly, if the CPU utilization, for example, is very low, that means there is very little load on my system and I can typically decrease the number of servers. So these are automated kind of responses. There are automated checks that I can have. Then there are unautomated checks or which would need manual intervention as well. Uh, those kind of checks would be, for example, the uh, security vulnerability that I pointed out, right? So uh, if you're getting a lot of unauthorized access, that means you need to, to maybe uh, tell a person that, hey, this is something unusual. Please go and check, uh, have a look at it. Why is this kind of error? Is It might be due to uh, maybe the API function. Uh, I've changed the API token, but my clients have not, you know, I've not sent that token to the client and they're still uh, sending the wrong token or wrong salt key due to which I'm getting the error. So it might be due to a bug as well. So uh, net net, uh, this is where a man manual intervention would be needed, right? So classify your errors based on whether you can, you know, resolve them automatically. If not, have an alerting mechanism. Uh, alerting mechanism should be such that, that the team who's responsible for that particular error is alerted, right? Uh, not everybody in the team would be able to debug a security issue, for example. Or if it's a particular microservice, then you might want to alert the person who's written that particular microservice or who's the owner of that particular product, right? So those are the typical things uh, on the monitoring and the alerting aspect. Another important aspect when it comes to debugging is distributed tracing, right? Uh, so I'll explain you what distributed, what I mean by distributed tracing, right? Uh, imagine that you uh, have designed a homepage of a a website like uh, Netflix or Hotstar, right? Uh, there, if you notice, you see a lot of personalized content and then there are promotional content as well. For example, if GOT is releasing, I'll probably push GOT uh, recommendation, even though uh, whether you watch, whether or not you watch English TV series or not. But since it's a new release, I have to place that content uh, in your homepage. So typically on the backend side, how it's done, it's uh, from the UI, it'll call just a single API, right? It can be a back. Uh, back and front front end, we'll go into that aspect as well in the later part of the discussion. But uh, assume that the entire home page is getting fetched from a single uh, API. In that case, to get the response of that particular home page, you would need to call multiple microservices or multiple services. One would be giving the recommended content, one will be giving you the editorial content. And let's suppose you get one user gets an error. How would you go and debug this? The problem in debugging, what uh, what I'm trying to highlight over here is that that particular request is flowing through multiple systems, right? And let's say the exception occurred in the recommendation part, you would not be able to trace what was the original request because the first system gets a request, goes to two systems, and this system got an error. So error is here. You don't know what was the request, what is the request look like in the other systems, right? Or the first system or the second systems. You need a system which can uniquely identify every request that is getting uh, you know, added to your particular system. And this can be easily achieved by adding a unique ID or a UUID with every request. So what typically people do, uh, I'll just uh, explain briefly what distributed tracing is and how it works. So what people typically do is uh, as soon as the controller in the application gets a request, the API controller or the REST controller that you've uh, exposed uh, gets a request, what happens is it associates itself with a unique ID, right? Uh, it can be a UUID, which is guaranteed uh, almost uh, every time it will be unique. Then that unique ID is 
uh, within the scope of the application also it is passed to different circles like you can just place that particular id in the heap and anyone who wants to refer to it uh, can uh, typically refer to it from the single heap location that it has uh, added to pass it to external application via http call there is a rest like there is a rest guideline you can place that particular header particular value inside the headers so that the, my dependent application also knows what is the request that i am trying to process and that is how every system it can be 50 uh, you can be calling 50 different microservices or services right uh, even then i have one id as soon as i go to my logging framework and i encounter an exception i can just check what is the id associated with it and i can totally try uh, you know draw the entire set of uh, how the request flow through my entire system and that is something that typically you know very uh, speeds up your debugging process to a great extent so uh, yeah these were the top three things that were coming to my mind uh, initially let's go and see how problem changes when it comes to scale scale brings in lot of uh, different challenges in itself right uh, and scale have different meaning for back end and for client uh, as well right uh, scale for back end means that uh, earlier my system was catering to let's say 10000 users but it shoots up to uh, let's say 100k users of 1 million users or maybe 10 million users and if you are at facebook scale maybe a billion users as well right uh, so so scale basically varies for uh, back end and front end so uh, obviously the way of handling uh, the scale also differs right uh, i'll start by talking about a little bit on the back end how it is handled at back end and uh, then i'll let arnav uh, talk about how we can manage it uh, on the front end as well uh, as i said uh, on the uh, back end uh, when the requests are increasing right so if you all know to uh, one single system cannot ca- cannot handle all the requests that are coming to it right so we try to scale it horizontally how do we do that we place all the instances behind a load balancer and if the need comes that there is a lot more scale a lot more other users are also coming then we add more instances behind the load balancer and that's how we scale the application servers right uh, there is a scaling requ- required of the database there as well which is stateful scaling the one that i just told you was uh, primarily a uh, on the load balancer side was primarily a stateless scaling the benefit of keeping my system stateless is that uh, so by the way state uh, if you guys don't know what stateless and stateful means the difference between the two is that uh, data one line of difference is that the data if it is stored within the instance it is stateful if the data is not stored in that particular uh, instance and that is only used for compute or maybe calling you know multiple services you know club the response then it is a stateful uh, stateless system right so when it comes to scalability it does make sense to keep your system stateless why the routing becomes very easy right uh, whenever there is a increase in the load uh, you can just go to the load balancer and add more instances and your system will run the reason it will be able to run is that there is no data which is stored right um, we are only using it for compute so it will be able to scale much faster and have a automated trigger built in right uh, when i said in the beginning that have some monitoring and alerting set up and if the disk is fair, you know uh, getting full or cpu is getting clogged you can add or remove more instances when it comes to automated scaling and when you are talking about a scale where you have you know millions of users it becomes absolutely necessary to rely on automated triggers because you will never know humans can make uh, errors right uh, maybe uh, you have deployed a person whose basic job is to look at the metrics and if the metrics is spiking he adds five instances to it now the kind of errors that can come up here is that the person can come back to me and say that hey i forgot about it right mai to bhul gaya maine chill le liya ya fir mai coffee peene gaya tha i forgot about it so to avoid such human errors or negligence errors we should have automated triggers and the kind of instructions or the kind of uh, you know uh, rapidness that comes with having automated triggers manual process cannot ha- uh, you know match that and uh, using that we can basically set up that hey if my you know uh, disk is 80% full uh, add attach one more volume to this particular ecd instance if my cpu utilization is uh, you know 
going beyond seventy uh, percent. Add one more instance, right? Uh, so these are basically strip functions, uh, and maybe you can have a max count that do not increase the count beyond hundred instances or one uh, fifty instances. So this was one point. I'll come to more points, uh, but I'll let uh, Arnav also uh, talk about the scalability challenges that uh, you know typically come up in the client applications. Right, right, right. Uh, so now this is a very, I think, challenging space. Uh, there's also a lot of misconceptions. If if people have not worked at scale, uh, then when we talk about scale for front end, people uh, have a lot of misconceptions around this. Not front end. The thing is that uh, scale works in a very different way. By the way, like there is a famous story that you know WhatsApp had I think some 500 million users when it was getting acquired and. they had a team of only 19 people entire company i think uh, as far as i remember that new story that broke 19 people not just front end team i'm saying a whole of whatsapp was 19 people uh, 1920 people when i get acquired so uh, how were they able to do that and then does that mean that if you have 500 million people you can always run with a 20 people team some companies might have you know 200 people team also at that scale now what happens with front end is that the scale is more about the variety of scenarios in which your client is running it obviously is not so directly dependent upon how many people are running because uh, at a individual level the front end is always running on one device at a time so you if you have 10000 users if you have 10 million users your front ends each instance is only running on one uh, device uh, but what uh, starts becoming challenging is that say there is some particular uh, you know random laptop on which some particular very not so frequently used browser inside which a certain you know say css thing does not work or similarly you know there is one particular android device made by some particular manufacturer on which you know background services don't work now if you have 10000 users maybe two people are affected by that and it's a rounding error you check it you say yeah theek hai two people will not be able to use it what can i do but then when you are 10 million kind of audience and uh, there are two things can happen one is obviously just extrapolating from that from two people it becomes you know 2000 people and all but more than that uh, what happens is that because the audience has increased now you get a lot of people so uh, for my experience i'd say zomato was that as we expanded from top 20 30 cities of india to 500 cities we found people using much lower end devices on much worse internet connections right so then we have to cater for uh, many more types of environments in which the app is end up going to run and that becomes the challenge of scale uh, at that point that you know what was a corner case you know one tenth of that traffic now it's not a corner case anymore it's it's a pretty significant problem uh, for us so that's there um the other part about scale is that you know your uh, backend can only suffice in terms of performance up to a certain level a lot of the points that you know mohit you were saying uh, till now very helpful and and you know as your backend partners for, for when you are making the app or whoever is your api partner community partner in your team they they are going to be doing a lot a lot of effort they are going to be putting making performant and all but beyond a certain level you will have there will be limits that you reach at, at the speed of the query and the size of the data that you can fetch so then you need to add some client side augmentation for that so you know paginated api requests you know api layer optimization where the client can sort of you know uh, fetch only the part that is shown in the screen first and delay loading the later part so that the server does not have to send you maybe a list of 50 items they can send you a list of 10 and the list of party can be loaded later something like that these things come then there are uh, i think a little bit more just touching upon is like bffs start coming so bff uh, for example at my my you know most recent workplace which is target so there a bff the the front end team's responsibility is actually maintaining a bff a bff stands for back end for front end now the back end itself has a bunch of microservices listings detail of products is coming from some place the order detail is coming from some place the user account detail is coming from some place and uh, then the app team basically creates a middleware server which collects them together and makes one single response that becomes the home page response so that the app can make a single response home page api uh, what happens is for example in client uh, a lot of slowness also happens out of the latency rather than actually server transaction speed uh, maybe 
for showing the same page for showing the same data if you are fetching it from five different places the latency of each api hit also adds up so there's going to be 100 150 milliseconds of latency that will get added up if not you know edge is not in the same country if the edge is in the same country then it 20 30 milliseconds will get added up for every api transaction that's happening right uh, if five api calls have to happen and then only you can show the data uh, on your screen then that five into latency you won't be able to sort of prevent that now that's the place where something like a bff can help that it will do the aggregation at a you know server level at the edge level itself and then from edge to app there is one api call so latency is only uh, one time uh, then uh, there is also the scale of features, which I, I say. So scale is also about features. Now, too many features are there, too many pages are there in your app. The team that you're working on becomes big. There you have to work on scale is that you split your team in terms of features or, you know, different user flows. And then you do something called client sharding. Very hard to do, actually. Uh, basically, you divide your front-end team and then they take care of different, different front-end parts. And uh, in, in terms of front-end frameworks, there's a concept of micro front-ends that you develop features of front-end very independently and then they can be plugged together. And similarly for iOS apps, you create separate, separate frameworks. Android apps, you create separate, separate graded modules, which together uh, become the app. I have some friends, for example, who are at Gojek. It's a very uh, popular example of something called a super app. So they have a bunch of completely end-to-end -end user flows, etc. you know, food delivery to, uh, you know, shopping. Like, like in India, there are a lot of different apps we use for different things. In Indonesia, many people use Gojek as a single app for 10 different use cases, for which we all have 10 different apps. So they develop it like 10 different apps, and then they compile it together into one package, and they distribute it as a single app. So that's something uh, that comes up. Uh, and then finally, in terms of design is also very important is that having a cohesive design across the entire app, what happens over time, bigger teams, they generally start having separate design team or a design platform team, and they create your dictionary of components that you use to build the front end. So, you know, how the button would look like, how a card will look like, how a checkbox would look like, how your input forms would look like, how your page animations would look like. They need to be same across the entire app. So why should every team working on every feature put effort into that? Instead, you create a, a very atomic design tool that, okay, smaller components, one common team will build, then every feature team will pick those components and use it uh, in, in, in different places. So, uh, yeah, I think these are uh, some of the uh, steps that, that you need to uh, keep in mind while, you know, your front-end skills. Right, right. So uh, I think uh, next question that uh, we have, I think... Uh, I'll add a couple of points uh, on the sure, same sure, sure. Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, the point you mentioned about client charting, right? I wanted to give one anecdote uh, that I uh, I saw in Hotstar, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, we came to a point that uh, our backend team was like, I'm not going to and I can't do anything now. Uh, and it was up to the client team to uh, assist the you know backend teams to uh, have the scalability. The uh, use case was that uh, if you saw a uh, play and watch, uh, right? You can just uh, watch a cricket match and uh, guess the outcome of the ball. Uh, it was basically a game within a, uh, within a particular app. Right. There we were basically uh, calculating the score uh, of every user on the client. And if after the end of every over, uh, initial design was that uh, once the over is finished, then uh, we'll, the client team will basically fetch the data from the backend and that is how we're going to be uh, using it. Uh, but what that led to is... Uh, after end of every over, right? So uh, that event is same for every user who's there, who's basically uh, watching the match. And th that led to a huge spike in the, whenever the over ends, uh, we, our backend server was bombarded with multiple requests. And throughout the over, uh, there was no, there were no requests. So that is where we assigned a ID to every client. And we said that, hey, modulo 10 is what is the delta, uh, you know, you're going to add that is basically a delta delay uh, that you are going to call after one second or two seconds or three seconds. And mm. that is, they'll continue doing that. So what we doing this, what we did was we reduced the load on the uh, backend server by one tenth, right? Uh, so like that really clicked me when you said uh, client sharding. I don't know if I've... Uh, I've yeah, actually, used we, the we did data. something similar at uh, coding blocks as well uh, at yeah. a much lower set of scale itself. But the problem was like, I mean, uh, we did not have sort of 
auto scaling kind of a thing where servers can automatically increase in number when load comes and mm-hmm. and uh, we used to conduct some of these scholarship tests and uh, generally like the backend is running code is getting judged even like 2 3 uh, requests per second are uh, sort of coming and and these are heavy requests like entire mm-hmm. code is getting submitted test case has to run right so uh, already uh, a lot of servers are running but then when the scholarship test happens then you know first of all the people who want to start the test that usually suddenly 50 60000 users together want to start the test and that's a very different scale from at any other time there are only 200 300 users online and here 50000 users will start right uh, so there we used to do something similar that uh, we used to uh, divide people into buckets and uh, if if the test is supposed to start at 5 pm then for 1/10th of the people it will start at 5 for next people it will start at you know 30 seconds later for the next 1/10th 1 minute later uh, like that we used to distribute that so yeah these kind of hacks are sometimes needed because sometimes it's like either there is a you know physical limitation itself on the back end that you just can't scale beyond that and sometimes it's like a prudent call on your end like why set up 20x exactly. more servers when you just need it for that one spike you can probably distribute that spike a little bit more so like you know people were saying flatten the curve for that coronavirus thing which is kind of similarly like that if your capacity can't handle such a big spike you flatten that spike during that time that's right uh cool so i'll uh, come to i'll add uh, more back end points uh, that you should consider when you are scaling the application uh so i already spoke about uh, you know uh, keep your server stateless uh, set up infrastructure for that supports auto scaling uh next point is very critical for auto scaling perspective right uh, that is that you have added a stateless server but when you add a new server what are the typical things that are in, uh, involved one is the os should boot up after the os is boot up the app server itself will take some boot up time uh, so if you start a java process and run something like java minus jar then you run the process it also takes some time it will start up a tomcat server if you if you're running a you know a spring boot application it will or it will start a jt server or maybe a under tau or netty or basically some server which is able to communicate via rest apis so that also will take time so keeping or choosing a stack especially when you are you know create dealing with millions of users uh, choose a stack which has least amount of boot up time and instead of booting up instances try to dockerize or containerize your application so that you know launching a container is much faster than launching an ec2 instance on aws right or maybe launching a new server in itself so keep that in mind that your boot up time should be as minimal as possible then uh, another thing that we need to scale uh, when it comes to scalability in the backend system uh, especially when you are uh, you know trying to scale your databases is so databases does two things right uh, it support read queries and it support write queries right uh, they need update also comes in the uh, they write but so when uh, you are not able to let's suppose you are designing a system which is write intensive in those cases try to shard the data uh, so that you know uh, you have multiple multiple servers keeping the which are basically needing uh, meeting your storage requirements but the other kind of problem that comes up is uh, the read as well let's say you have stored the data in one one place but the number of reads that you are getting are enormous right uh, for example aadhar data right? once you have entered the data many time uh, it will be read multiple times but updates are going to be very less right uh, or or maybe entry uh, creating a new aadhar will also be a very less frequent job as compared to reading it similar is inventory showing on an e-commerce website your inventory is fixed but the number of users who are reading that particular inventory are huge so what you do is you copy create multiple copies of this particular data and keep it at multiple places there are 10 servers who are keeping the exact copy of the data and uh, whenever the request comes to your application server all the 10 servers are basically capable of returning a valid response so replicate for read scalability and shard for write scalability or write throughput and whenever possible try to add a queue whenever you are having a batch uh, operation right uh, for example uh, if you have to let's say calculate monthly payroll uh, of employees that is a batch process right uh, you don't have to calculate the payroll of every employee every time right uh, it's after maybe at, at the end of the month it is a batch process you'll run it and then you're done 
in those case you don't have to let's say if you have 200 employees uh, and your servers can process only 10 uh, requests per second you don't need 20 servers right you can live with maybe one server and process it start the process maybe on 30th or 50th month and by the end of the day all the 20 200 employees will be processed so try to uh, keep utilize workflow systems and queues for uh, having such kind of scaling challenges so yeah those were a uh, few scalability tips that i wanted to add uh, i think next uh, question is also very interesting which uh, which will give you an idea about what kind of tools uh, that are you know quite essential when it comes to debugging a particular application uh, right the uh, no, i'll let you answer this first and then i'll hmm. uh, come back to this so tools uh, uh, i think uh, one thing i i feel uh, actually a little bit off with front end is that there aren't a lot of actually very uh, open source tools in uh, as such for monitoring and all uh, sadly the current state of how open source software is like like for example mobile and all it's it's mostly common is that people are using firebase now uh, firebase has a lot of things inside that so when i say firebase i don't mean entirety of it so firebase has got database firebase has got push notifications bunch of things the crash analytics which actually used to be a separate service got acquired by twitter uh, then like that whole bundle called fabric was acquired by google uh, so it has a long history so uh, but it's a fantastic tool uh, for uh, crash monitoring uh, that's there and uh, then there are a few other tools as well which like crash analytics is very very android focused but uh, you know these days ios is also uh, using it in most big companies android and ios native apps would most likely be using uh, crash analytics sentry and bug snag i have seen uh, also uh, getting used a lot right uh, sentry uh, essentially is uh, uh, open source though and it's available as a docker container you can run it on your own server as well uh sentry does get uh, used a lot uh, which which i have seen and uh, then there is for for application monitoring there are a, a few tools that are there datadog and neuralic uh, kind of tools get used uh, i have seen uh, one more important thing is that along with these you know tools that we need for you know debugging and monitoring and uh, etc we also need you know a little bit of security uh, side tools as well uh, with our apps uh, so code obfuscation and and you know encryption and these things so uh, using things like you know app guard and pro guard which basically obfuscate your code or when you're using something like web front ends um, mostly your you know bundlers which is like roll up or web pack they those will automatically also do the same thing uh, for you uh, so those are not like some bulletproof security measures they work on opus security by obscurity so that you know your code does not really remain much readable anymore uh, because uh, most front end uh, setups are such that you can't really make super you know hidden code uh, binary level which you like you compile a c++ program it becomes a hex file you can't really get back to the original c++ code at all uh, with which front end what happens is you know you can sort of decompile bytecode of a java app back to some kind of java source code and uh with the javascript javascript directly runs on the browser there is no source code and production code so their obfuscation kind of methods are the only way to you know add some um, security uh, there uh yeah i think uh, that's uh, sort of the things that are there for front end i think uh, what what do you use for you know uh, monitoring telemetry uptime and all, alerting and all what what tools do you use for back end uh, any ideas for that sure sure so i i'll uh, structure my content like uh, what tools are required for monitoring and maybe distributed tracing and for alerting and then what are the uses uh, so for uh, monitoring and alerting the major tools that i typically use is uh, so i'll talk about the open source first uh, and then we can talk about the paid ones as well so open source in the, uh, in the open source world elk stack is something that is very famous right uh, elk stack uh, is elastic search log stack kibana you can uh, push matrices to uh, elastic search and uh, have a d- detailed monitoring of all the all the components if you just want to push logs and search based on logs that is also possible using logstack uh, there is filemeet which will periodically look at uh, the logs that are getting added to your particular file and it will push it to elastic search and kibana is basically used for dashboarding and if you want to visualize the data and maybe set up alerts as well these alerts are not that uh, great uh, what i typically use uh, specifically use for uh, alerting is uptime 
which will give you a very good status about which services are up and which services are down. It works on a health check kind of a uh, URL. For example, if a particular API is down uh, or if a particular service itself is down, it's health check will fail and we we get an alert for that. Other variants that you can typically use uh, for you know visualizing the metrics. Uh, let's say you want to measure the latency of a particular function. Uh, in that case, you can use uh, uh, you can yeah you can use Grafana and Grafita for basically visualizing, and you can use StatsD for uh, sending out the matrices. Uh, let's uh, just annotate or write a aspect which will uh, measure the latency of a particular method and push it to StatsD. StatsD will uh, you can integrate StatsD with Grafana for visualization. visualization right? So every developer who's basically developing it right, and wants to work in a uh, open source kind of a uh, setup uh, needs to know this tool. Right? Uh, these are the de facto proven regardless of what kind of microservices you are. Uh, if you are working in a uh, you know company which is you know uh, which has a lot of fortune and you are willing to uh, spend it on tools, uh, then good good paid variants would have uh, Splunk. Uh, there is. New Relic, there is App Dynamics. These will, in fact, give you the memory profile of a particular server as well. So let's suppose if your application is running into 10 servers, it will list down all the 10 servers, what are their memory profiles, what are the objects that are getting passed, what is the latency of each uh, server. It will raise alerts, alerting and monitoring both, uh, it will take care. It will also integrate with paid uh, other paid tools, which can basically give you a call if a particular service is down. Right? So, most of you would have heard about on-call duties in Amazon, right? So the the funda of on-call duty is that one person will be available 24 plus 7 for uh, for a, a certain period of time. So uh, funda over there is uh, they they'll get a pager duty, they'll get a call, they'll get a Slack, they'll get email, they'll get bombarded with all the uh, on all the channels, and if there is any error that is not noticed. So that was basically around error monitoring and alerting. Another important aspect that I touched upon uh, initially was around distributed tracing, right? And I, I think there is some question around that as well. So what should we use for distributed tracing, uh, Jagger or Zipkin or... Uh, so what I have used is uh, I've used Open Telemetry and Zipkin both. Uh, I've not used Jagger, so uh, both of them are good. Uh, Zipkin is primarily Java based. Open telemetry is a polyglot system. That means that you can use it with Golang, Python, any any language, right? It works on the HTTP standards, not on the uh, Java uh, standards. So you can use open telemetry for that. And yeah, so those are primarily the tools I use for my monitoring purposes. Any uh, thing else uh, that you want to add? Uh, uh, so, uh, when talking about tools, uh, another thing I, I feel is that uh, your development time tools are also very important to have. Like, like one is that in production, how do you debug and how do you find out things and all. Uh, one thing I'd definitely like to point out is that for front end, actually, uh, when things really go wrong at that point, there is very little to do because for web front ends, it's already cached with the user. You can't, you know, like that redeploy front ends everywhere and people will get the new website that does not happen with apps it's even harder actually uh, your deployment cycles are generally two three day long so even if you can fix it within five minutes uh, you put the app on the app store or play store they will take two three days to review it and then uh, the user ramp up is also going to be very slow so something like on call like you were saying and that actually uh, sort of triggered me to say this is that uh, in front end teams, you will never have somebody on call because there's just no point. Like, what would the on call person even do? They can't fix it. So, uh, being able to, you know, sort of uh, monitor, replicate, and and fix a lot of the issues at uh, the development and debugging stage then essentially becomes a lot more important. And uh, kill switches become also very important uh, in terms of maintenance. So, basically, uh, the ability to uh, sort of like most bigger. Uh, projects that I have worked with, they generally do is like say when the app boots, whether it's a web app or whether it's a you know a mobile app, like boot up being in terms of a web app, generally when a SPI hydrates, like you know your web request is made, the web bundle is downloaded, and websites like you know Facebook, Twitter, and all these are actually like essentially like apps running within the browser. These when they boot up, they generally they would do is they would make a 
configuration call generally to the server which would tell them that okay say for example a certain service is not working the server would you know send our appropriate response as a result of which that particular tab will get disabled on the front end so those kind of things also need to be in place being able to have uh, fallback mechanisms and and being able to disable certain services uh, as well based on some configuration request in the beginning uh, that's important to have in place because if something is actually sort of crashing then then you know it's it's very hard to kind of you know uh, resolve that and then get a fix in place and deploy it and get it adopted very soon what is possible is to prevent people to get to that place where that crash is happening till this happens and you need to have systems in place that can probably do that <laughs> like we can, we can't uh, we can't really do anything if uh, something goes wrong in the uh, client side Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kill switch is the only thing that we can do. <laughs> cool. Uh, so we'll uh, start taking questions. Uh, we can configure rate limited or rate limiting on the API gateway. Uh, I guess he's uh, basically uh, referring to the first uh, example that we said, right? Uh, where the load on the system is getting really high, and we can typically add rate limiting. I, I think we are. Uh, I'm aligned over that. We can. Uh, do that. Uh, just that uh, if you add rate limiting and because of rate limiting, X number of requests are uh, getting failed. Keep an eye on that as well. So uh, if you're rate limiting, maybe uh, you'll send a five x six error, and keep an eye on the five x six error also. It should not be that you know more than five percent or two percent of your errors are uh, of your requests are actually getting rejected because of the API rate limiting uh, aspect. Uh, and i think for, to add to that uh, the rate limiting uh, can happen at multiple layers uh, right. like from my experience with vanta was that uh, there was a sort of rate limiting logic on the clients itself then there was rate limiting logic on the edge and then there was rate limiting logic on the application layer so so on the client actually what kind of rate limiting happens is that uh, we are tracking a lot of user metrics like everything like you know a person is searching opening a restaurant all those events are going these days every app collects a lot of data about you it helps them you know give you more curated uh, responses and all right now this data that's collecting it's it's all going into a data engine analytics server it's going right now there if uh, like for example the last chunk of analytics if i try to upload and it failed for example then it will retry one second later if that also fails then the second retry happens 5 seconds later if that fails then another retry happens 10 seconds later like that it's a throttled retry happens so that is there because uh, the uh, api where the sort of logs are getting collected somehow if that's clogged or something then we don't want all these you know 30 40 million active zomato users to sort of ddos our own server if the uh, you know uh, logs are getting clogged so so the client should throttle back they should you know if they are not able to send the request they should slow themselves down those kind of so that's basically like an a set of a rate limiting that's happening on the client side itself so there's multiple layers where you can add that rate limiting logic uh, where do you think uh, routing should take place in the front end or back end so any kind of uh, routing that we do on the client side or uh, then we we'll talk about the back end so so i think uh, here uh, he's talking about probably spas versus mpas kind of a thing where single page applications and multi page applications are there uh, where uh, sometimes the routing is actually happening on the like like appear to happening on the url bar but the page has not actually been refreshed just a uh, ajax call happening and data is getting updated in either way like even if you are doing what is essentially called front end routing in that case also like at an api level you need separate routes from where the data is getting fetched mm-hmm. so you back end will definitely have routing and yeah. front end you might have like front end level routing via an spa or you might have a more dumb front end which is not handle routing i think uh, one more aspect to this question is uh, that uh, i i think this question popped up when i was giving the example of uh, you know designing home page for netflix where uh, mm-hmm. i was supposed to call uh, multiple apis so right. uh, from that perspective i think uh, this question lies uh, so back end may obviously you can do such kind of routings and we can talk about the trade offs uh, so 
this is kind of uh, that uh, scenario bfm right our back end for front end kind of a scenario where you're right. calling a single api and uh, that that server is basically routing the request to multiple servers the right. benefit that you get out of it is that uh, i can dynamically change the places where i'm uh, fetching the home page for right uh, from a client right. perspective you just have to call one api and uh, that will fetch the entire home page content for you but uh, if you do it uh, if you give this particular logic to the client uh, that hey uh, to render the front end uh, call these 10 apis then render the client uh, you know home page the downside of this is that uh, this particular logic has to be implemented by every client right uh, so uh, in hotsa we had uh, 10 client 10 different clients right we had ios android i uh, fire tv was there the playstation there's web uh, mobile web application then there is uh, the website so there were multiple clients that were that were there so if we give this particular responsibility to the client every client needs to do it in a uniform manner and typically clients team are different right uh, you'll have separate uh, set of team for ios developers separate uh, developers will be working on uh, and making the android app and there will be single single developer for uh, you know less prominent devices like uh, you know fire tv or roku tv uh, so bringing them all the uh, different teams on a single page also becomes a uh, operationally challenging task so uh, if that's the case it makes sense for a backend uh, happy to hear your thoughts also and all of you yeah i mean uh, apart from having to implement in every the client it's also that client logic is harder to update uh because some of the clients uh like like if it is a you know like like that app properly like an installed app whether it's a mobile or playstation by tv these kind yes. of cases then then the user has to update that app to get the new logic as well which is a challenge okay. in terms of user adaptation you have to support pretty old versions uh so so that is also a downside like like when you want to update the logic you can't immediately get 100% of the users to the new logic and that's why a bff right. is much better in that respect makes sense makes sense all right uh next question is uh hey what is what about setting uh, setting up staging and production environment for an android app this uh, yeah i mean this is a, a very common practice of course like like you should have a sort of uh you have the production and then just beneath the production usually something that people call the uat user acceptance testing we call uat environments are sort of one is to one equivalent to production but they are not used in production they are used in in, in staging we could call it staging or or, or uat now with uh, uat kind of environments uh, essentially uh, you know uh, what also is often done is that in many places like there is going to be a debug build of the app and a prod build of the app now the production build would generally point to the production server and the debug build would be pointing to your uat servers so you are sort of mapped out uh, in that sense and then uh, you might have even further uh, what we used to have is we used to have team level staging as well uh, at that at zomato we had that is that every team also had their separate separate staging server so if they are working on a new feature Uh, then uh, we, we, you know in the app which points to the staging version there used to be like you know a hidden screen basically which you can't reach on the production app but in the debug app you can basically reach on that screen and you can change the staging server you have 10 15 staging servers you can use a different staging server on which maybe you know uh, a new feature has been enabled but it's not enabled to the production yet so you can point to that server and 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 test those features out so those things should be there like you should have a proper end to end environment set up where a debug version of the app pointing to a debug version of the bff pointing to you know the entire debug suite of uh, your uat or staging suite of your servers you should have a as as your sort of you know organization scales you would end up having a full end to end setup exact replica of your production and staging as well which you can you know very safely uh, test it out I think it's uh, for uh, you Adam uh, again. Uh, Android <laughs> app performance improve trips, please. So, so <laughs> I think covered uh, some of those there. I think it it really comes down to using the profiler very well in your uh, Android Studio is very useful. Uh, uh, keep keep track of memory issues uh, and uh, you know CPU spikes and all. So use the Android profiler. Not a lot of people use it properly. So just 
connect that to your phone and run through your you know debug build uh, once through all the screens and see where there are cpu spikes then you can sort of generally double click that it expands and it shows which threads were doing too much work at what point of time and it shows which methods in your app are running as a result of that it's a fantastic uh, profiler if you're using java on the back end the intellij id and then eclipse those have also very good profilers and similarly if you're using android then these profilers exist and ios also similarly export as uh, profilers so uh, these tools like profilers exist and you should definitely uh, use them to to you know to their uh, best capacities so, uh, apart from that other than that pro tips would be general good development practices obviously having a understanding of the, the you know low level design uh, patterns right like, like you're doing something like a dependency injection you're using a single turn and some memory leak can happen because of static scope uh, is getting you know uh, removed there so those things obviously low level design having robust idea of low level design is very important people who are good with low level design they generally produce systems where performance standards are much much high i think uh, profiling is uh, important for any development you do right uh, be it back end development also to measure the performance how uh, much your one machine can handle right uh, for that uh, profiling is uh, important for back end as well Uh, and that will give you a very good estimate about how many uh, actual uh, amount of data can be there or uh, can be there in a particular application uh, in a single server. Right? Uh, cool. So we move to the next question, uh, which is, what uh, tools would you suggest for a backend? Uh, sorry, full stack developer. Uh, the follow up is that he means our technology that uh, we suggest. So I think. Uh, So I, I'll tell my favorite, uh, and then maybe you can uh, uh, jump in, uh, Adna. So uh, I think here, uh, if you don't know any uh, language, right? So primarily, I, I think you can start learn JavaScript because you can typically uh, write front end uh, in JavaScript. Plus, uh, learning Node would be easier for you. Uh, so uh, mean stack is getting quite famous uh, these days, right? So. Uh, Have a knowledge about MongoDB that will give you a knowledge about the database. Then Angular will basically again a flavor of JavaScript, so that will also give you a uh, you'll be able to design web applications using that. And then Node obviously for uh, you know, backend uh, development. That that will get you started. Now this is not for a good scalable uh, design, but you can develop a MVP in my opinion. Right. right. No, I mean I I concur. I think I also generally suggest like. For people starting off, I just I sort of you know blindly suggest Node.js because you know same language using that you can build and to a reasonably good scale you can build as well. I mean, yes. there there is a certain point you reach maybe sort of switching to more performant language like Go and Rust and all and can come into the question. But but to a very reasonably high scale you can work with Node.js. It's it's a good language and that's the same thing. Like, The advantage of using the same language on backend and frontend is very, very good. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, AWS key resources. Uh, so uh, I think one of the best way to learn about AWS is start uh, apply for the AWS free account and uh, start playing with it. Right. Uh, that's how I how I learned it. And whenever you're stuck, right, uh, AWS has a very good feature. There's a question mark after every uh, step you are taking. So, for example, uh, when you create an EC2 instance, right? Uh, it's quite intuitive on the UI. You click on EC2 instance, it will launch an EC2 instance. Then it asks a bunch of uh, jargon terms that uh, initially I didn't understand. For example, it will ask for you uh, ask your VPC information. Now I don't know what what a VPC is. So there is a question mark uh, around that. Uh, once you click the question mark, you'll be landed to the official documentation which explains what a VPC is. So that is the best way to learn. Right? It will give you a practical exposure first of all, and it will always be an updated one. If you follow any tutorial or something, it, chances are that it might not be the updated one, right? And you'll only uh, on a tutorial, right? Uh, one of the uh, things that I typically face is that uh, they are not quite up to the, up to the date uh, with whatever is the latest offering, and they are gated by whatever he is teaching, right? You learn only what he is teaching. Whereas if you learn it. Uh, you know, on a self pace, you'll try to dig deeper and understand it. You know, in all the in all the depths that you like. So, 
staggered spike handling but you uh, but say you don't know the number of uh, users before and and the number of users are increasing faster than the time because for some other uh, way added uh balancer how do you scale uh, the answer to that is you cannot scale that uh, right uh, this is one problem that uh, i have faced a lot uh, trust me and uh, the only thing that how we handled that is uh, that we aws provides you one metric to scale on right uh, that will basically give you uh, those metrics would be uh, static metrics like 70% se zyada cpu utilization so add one more instance of five add five instances but boot up time would go for a loss and this is exactly what happened uh, what actually happens uh, when a when a cricket match also starts right uh, ipl starts at 8 uh, 8 o'clock till 750 or 755 there are uh, close to 1 lakh or maybe max 2 lakhs uh, user on the platform as soon as the match starts at 8 pm so this quickly jumps to 10 lakh or maybe 15 lakhs or maybe 20 lakhs users so there is a 10x jump within 5 minutes gap right so the time to scale up those instances in this uh, amount of time is very less so uh, if we just rely on uh, you know the infra uh, identifying this and then uh, you know doing it it becomes prob- uh, problematic so the first thing that we did the, the first solution that we had was to predict the users uh, we thought that predicting is basically the best we can do and we over provisioned a lot uh, right uh, the second version was basically to take a derivative of the number of uh, users and that will give you a slope if the slope is very steep that means instead of adding one instance i'll add 10 instances so the slope became the deciding factor of how many instances i'm uh, actually adding uh, after uh, a certain time so if i add 10 more instances together instead of adding one instances one by one that becomes problematic right uh, one instance again my cpu load is high uh, it will take some time uh, it, it, it's on sweet time to add more instances uh, the third thing that we typically did was we moved away from ec2 instances to dockerized containers the reason is that uh, now i have free cpu uh, os boot up time is uh, basically lower and we switched from java to golang because go- golang uh, boot up time is way faster than a spring boot application spring boot application was taking around 40 seconds to boot up and we didn't have that kind of time uh, we cannot put that kind of time right? so uh, have a different set of instances and tech stack if you know you have to add buffer spikes and lastly the solution that is right uh, running right now is uh, ml kind of a model which predicts how many users are going to be uh, actually there on the platform and uh, if its pr- prediction is right uh, we will be able to handle this uh, spike if not we'll rely on the stock uh, i think this is what uh, issues are the hardest to debug any specific category from experience at hotstar I-, i think the most difficult issues are the issues that do not give any exceptions right uh, so uh, typically uh, if you have to deploy something and let's say it is uh, you release a feature and you're not getting any exceptions you're not getting getting any to everything is working green in your monitoring dashboard right uh, and if that gets propagated to a client uh, you know maybe i misplaced uh, some spelling mistake be- because of which uh, that particular api is not even getting caught there are two versions uh, if my client teams are calling the older version there is a new version i am thinking that my dashboard is clean and everything is working fine right so those kind of issues where i don't get the exception stack trace or uh, i don't have uh, i don't really know which method is basically ca- causing that particular issue those are the hardest uh, for me to quantify or to uh, give you uh, more context on this uh, let's suppose i am debugging a slow api debugging a slow api is uh, to me the hardest problem right uh, it can be uh, uh, the issue can be anywhere right it can be uh, either due to client network calls it can be a part uh, like 80% of the users uh, for 80% of the users it is running fine and for let's say 20% of users it is not in the accepted range then it might be a server issue which is running that particular application then i'll go back to server look at the logs in the server and then try to debug it so uh, i think that is to me the hardest kind of uh, issue to debug at the back end side uh, i let arnav speak his thought around the client uh, sides what do you think is the hardest Actually, kind of problem the, that the, the thing you said about uh, exceptions not uh, coming in, that is obviously right. the hardest and uh, one of the things i used to uh, like like as a team lead has to be sort of a 
Hitler about is that uh, people often play like, for example, specifically saying, say, Kotlin code is that for null safety, you can use two approaches. Like, you know, either you crash when you face null safety problems or, you know, you wrap it around in a null safe wrapper or something like that. No, no, in code reviews and in, in, in team discussion, I used to say them that, dude, exceptions are great. Like, like, don't try to achieve for a lower crash-free rate. Like, like, a lot of time when you're coding, you're thinking, oh, like, our app's crash-free rate should be 99.9999%. And for that, wherever possible, I will try to sort of eliminate exceptions from my app. And I used to tell everybody, like, never keep your objective to eliminate exceptions. Because then you will start getting bug uh, report from a user while they will say, I open a screen, it is white, I can't see anything. And then you won't even know where to start figuring that question out because you did not get a crash report. Crash reports are the best thing to start with because you get a stack trace. You know exactly what, what problem happened. Uh, so so hardest to debug always is uh, where where there is some undefined behavior happening, which when you mentally dry run your code, you see there is no way to reach such a condition. But there is no exception or no crash to actually track that. So now you're sort of hunting in the you know dark that you know how the fuck did this user reach this particular scenario? I don't know, <laughs> but there is no stack trace on on my sentry or on my crash lattice to even go by. Uh, so I think when you're coding, uh, wherever I I would say one thing I used to say part of defensive coding I used to tell them is that wherever sort of you're writing a lot of cases that. You know, if, if somebody submitted an address, if, if, you know, the length is too long or there's a special character or, you know, the, the pin that has been dropped does not, you know, the geofence does not match with that. So, so many use cases, say, for example, right? Now, you're writing a files in a switch condition, maybe it's a bunch of logic or writing. A uh, couple of places where there's some undefined behavior is possible. Like, and I should tell them that wherever in doubt what to take when I have reached this particular branch in my ifs condition. Wherever in doubt, throw an exception. That's the best code. Like if you write, throw some exception in your code, I would definitely review that, merge that code, no problem. Because, you know, throwing exception is the best thing to do because then it's just so easy to identify the problems and solve them. We should not fail silent. Uh, like uh, for the, uh, whenever there is an exception, right, just print the stack trace or uh, push it to some queue so that people who are debugging it, uh, they can right. look it into it. Uh, what I typically see, in, uh, you know, I've seen this uh, particular uh, mistake made by a lot of people that they do uh, try uh, inside a trial box, uh, trial box, they try something and then in catch exception. And instead of catching the specific exception also, this uh, call the super class, catch exception EX and catch blocks is, is completely empty. So yeah, now I don't know what is happening. Yeah. So nothing is done. So in that <laughs> Cache block is completely empty, so we will not be able to figure out where exactly yeah, this you, error you, is coming. You neither get the exception, and the user is in right. some empty state where, where nothing is happening. Correct. Yes, yes. Right. This is for you, enough. Uh, some love from your fan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so you want to become a mobile application developer, you're doing native Android dev and a little bit of iOS. Is it a good idea to switch to Flutter or React Native? Uh, if if you are good in uh, native development in, in either Android and iOS, and you can pick the other one a little bit, then I would say there is no point spending time on any, any hybrid framework because today uh, the demands for native Android and native iOS developer is going through the roof. Uh, hard to find good people, at least at senior positions, it's very, very hard. Uh, hiring for native Android developers, good quality is to always be a challenge for me. Hybrid apps have their uh, have their place, uh, but but even at scale in big companies where hybrid apps are also used, uh, companies which rely on Flutter or React Native, they would have quite a few people on their teams who would be working on native as well because they need to do a bunch of the stuff in the app in native and sort of glue it into their hybrid code. And uh, hybrid code is still sort of getting used in some startups a little bit. Agencies use them a lot where the the engineering of the app is not so important it's like more content based apps are getting made like a app for a conference so for that it's, it's a more visual kind of an app not a lot of deep down native stuff happening you can make it in flutter that's fine uh but you know if you take the 
top uh, top 20 apps on the app store so both android and and in ios right uh a top 20 in terms of downloads or top 20 in terms of trending or anything you will find 90% of them are native apps there will be rare conditions like you know instagram is there because you know obviously facebook has their own framework react native they are using i find instagram on android by the way quite buggy uh, in fact there are a lot of places where there are, are some bugs on ios it's a great app by the way uh, but but that's how react native is designed react native was originally uh, designed to work well with ios android support they added much later uh, which shows up in, in even their own app i see so you know native android if you're doing well and then ios you are able to pick up then i think you can stick with those things that would be best all right all right uh, thank you so much arnav for uh, taking time and uh, uh, thank you so much hello hi and welcome to our podcast on uh, on senior versus junior developer we are doing such live events uh, quite often now and uh, the topic for today is uh, how do we debug issues in production but before going ahead let's take a moment to introduce ourselves uh, i am mohit yadav I am IT at Scala. I've been part of uh, you know engineering teams at Hotstar and Nutanix. I was a senior developer in both the teams, and uh, I let Pragya introduce himself as well. Right. So I am Pragya. You might have uh, seen me on the Scala YouTube channel quite a lot, uh, and I have been working uh, at. I had worked at Directi in the past, uh, Media.net uh, branch of it, and uh, since the past couple of years, I have been a senior software engineer here at Scala. So nice to meet you, everyone. I think we can we can begin it now. So uh, let me uh, set the premise, right? Or what this session is about, and uh, how we are going to be uh, running this session, right? Uh, we'll the starting in the se- uh, beginning of the session, we will uh, give you the uh, entire glimpse of how do you de- debug an uh, application in the production environment, and then we'll give you a chance to ask live questions, uh, right? Uh, so keep your questions ready uh, we'll give you ample amount of time in the at the end to ask uh, questions so the premise goes like this uh, let's say you have built a paid application that is supposed to stream live cricket matches now the match starts at 8 pm and 5 minutes into the game your social team uh, social media teams comes up to you and uh, says that hey lot of paid customers are complaining about poor experience on social media right or they might be uh, ranting about it you know, on twitter or maybe facebook groups or maybe tons of other places to rant about right now as an engineer who is responsible for streaming this match live to millions of users worldwide what would be your next steps i let tagge talk about the piece uh, the three pieces uh, that we can solve for and then we'll get started tagge over to you Yes. So, if you look at any uh, large-scale application, right? Any any web service, any anything like Google or Amazon or any sort of uh, cricket streaming website that you see, uh, you you usually can divide the entire thing into three parts, right? One is uh, what you have is the client side, right? That is the actual user that is sitting there, and I mean they are streaming some some let's say cricket matches, right? The user has their browser, they have their uh, browser cache, they are talking to a DNS, and so on and so forth. Apart from that, you have something called the infrastructure. Right, and that is basically where your code is running. So perhaps, uh, let's say the website is deployed on something like AWS. So the infrastructure in that case will be the AWS web servers, right, on on which your entire code will be running. Everything, the load balancer, the app servers will be over there. And though at the final side, the last uh, piece of the puzzle for us is the server side. Right, by the server side, I mean that the the actual code that is running on the infrastructure. Right, so the actual code that you have written, perhaps in a language using Java, perhaps using a framework like Spring Boot, right? That is what we are talking about. That is the server side. Now, out of these three pieces, we won't really be talking about the client and infrastructure in today's uh, session. Right? We'll be focusing uh, particularly on the server side. That uh, suppose that you have been, uh, you have figured out that the problem is not on the client side and neither in my, in the infrastructure. The problem is at an API level. Then how do you uh, debug it in production? Right. So uh, one thing that we can say is, let us suppose that uh, we we wish to figure out that what exactly is the problem that our users are facing. Right. So uh, one thing that we could say is that I mean, let's say that I was in uh, I was on call on the duty. Right. So what I would like to do is I would like to ask our users 
right, to report their problems via Twitter messages. So I would ask the users that, hey, just send me a Twitter message, just send us a Twitter message, and basically we'll try to figure out what the problem is and proceed from there. So how does that sound? Uh, I think that sounds uh, good, but there are a few problems with it, right? Uh, okay. Like collect, you're collecting the feedback uh, that is outside the realm of your application. And that might lead to what we call as a snowball effect. Now, what we, what is a snowball effect? Uh, if you notice at Evan, uh, Avalanche, it starts from a snow which starts rolling down and uh, soon it, sooner or later it becomes an Avalanche if there is uh, enough snowball, right? Uh, the same behavior we see in the uh, ap like application side as well. The more people read it, the more negative publicity your application will get. And eventually, people who are getting even a decent stream will start complaining. For example, a person who is supposed to get a, maybe a 720p uh, kind of a resolution is getting a lower resolution, maybe around 320p or 480p, which is still manageable. They'll also start feeling left out and they'll also start ranting about your application on uh, you know Twitter, which is not an ideal case for any uh, you know any business so can we do something to contain this fire within the realm of your application hmm, fair enough so we don't really want to publicize this this issue so twitter messages right. are a no-go in that case so uh what we could do is uh, while designing our application itself right while designing the application what we could have is we could have some sort of a support infrastructure some sort of support feature inbuilt with our application Right. Uh, once we have that, then the users can contact us via that support feature directly. And that will also help us to identify whether the problem is on our end or whether the problem is on the client end. Oh, oh that's great, man. Uh, I think uh, you are also referring to, uh, if, you, uh, if you have heard about o Uber app support, right? They all, all, um, all they have is an uh, in-app support. The benefit that uh, we get out of it is, uh, like it contains the fire within the application. Plus, it will help us capture other uh, insights as well. And like deeper insights like network speed, how much free memory was there in the application when this bug occurred? Or is there a storage limitation on the client side due to which the, it is calling, uh, you know, causing such issues? So we'll be able to dig deeper into the issue uh, because a person uh, who's just, uh, you know, using your application might not be well, uh, you know, uh, have the entire context about the problem. And we can capture such problems using a uh, client side SDK. Uh, and we can use, uh, we can also uh, use the same SDK to capture all uh, any crash reports. And uh, we can bundle these crash reports and send it to our backend server servers, right? Uh, many a times we notice that uh, there are uh, API changes which are not backward compatible. And these leads to errors and exception. The responsibility, uh, you know, the person who's designing this framework. You should take care of uh, capturing such exceptions and maybe bundling them and then giving it back to backend servers. And this will, uh, the reason I'm saying this is that it will give an insight to uh, all the iOS and Android teams that I have. Uh, and it will tell them exactly what kind of issues uh, their, uh, their uh, users are facing. Fair enough, fair enough. So uh, perhaps using this information, uh, I mean, I will be able to, I think, narrow down whether the problem is on the client side or whether the problem is on the server side. But uh, I mean, currently, as, as we said, that we are not going to be discussing about the client side issues right now uh, or the infrastructure issues. We will cover them perhaps in some of the other sessions. So let us just say that it is not a client side issue right now. OK, so I mean, I have identified that it is a server side issue. Now, uh, what I think I will do is that I will start checking the, uh, I will start monitoring the dashboards right, to see if the HTTP responses that our website is producing are, are those mostly two exception responses, right? So the 200 responses, basically that the responses are succeeding. We're not getting uh, server errors from our side, right? Uh, similarly, if the number of five uh, XX uh, errors on our system is more than a particular threshold, then uh, what we could do is we could raise an alarm, right? That would alert the team and whoever, uh, engineer is on the all call duty so basically uh, something like so imagine if you have a uh, if you are working for a large company then usually whenever a system is live whenever something critical is happening something like a cricket match is being streamed or something like on flipkart there's a big billion day going on then uh, there will be a couple of engineers who will be on call their responsibility will be to uh, take care of production issues as and when they occur right so uh, let us suppose that i mean what we could do is based on the uh, error uh, error thresholds, uh, we, could, we could raise an alert and basically get the on-call engineers to respond to it. How does that sound? 
sounds really awesome uh, you've raised really uh, good points up uh, okay i'll talk uh, i'll talk about each of them one by one right uh, so first point that you raised was uh, around monitoring dashboard right uh, basically keeping an eye on the number of uh, or basically a percentage of requests that are failing uh, and we can define a threshold which can be different for each and every system right uh, for example uh, if you're using google search the threshold uh, of number of requests that can fail will be very very low right i the uptime or the uh, kind of guarantees that google provide is that their systems are able to respond to 99.999% of the times but if we compare it with other uh, system like payment system for example this number of failing requests is a frequent uh, you know um, frequent scenario in such kind of systems the uh, industry uh, standard for pay uh, payments getting succeeded is around 70% they make it to 90% they go to 90% by uh, you know having multiple other mechanisms like retries and ex uh, retries with exponential back off to make it uh, more reliable but 70% is basically the industry uh, average and just by measuring the number of requests that are failing that will not give me a good uh, very good insight as well what we should typically do is we should also look at how much time each of uh, like uh, how much time my 2xx request is uh, taking this is usually called the latency of application server how much time does my application server take to first of all uh, accept a request do all the processing and computing that is required to uh, answer this query and finally respond it back to the server the total time in this process is basically called the latency uh, of the system, uh, of the application server and the reason i'm stressing on the latency part is uh, whenever you're designing system the latency also measure uh, is also uh, quite important for example if you're designing a google search type ahead and if that suggestion that comes up right uh, when you type michael it shows uh, michael jordan and bunch of other suggestions as well right uh, if you type donald it might suggest you donald trump or maybe donald duck uh, but the essence of this is basically that uh, these suggestions are only meaningful if the latency of such systems is very low if it takes 5 minutes to uh, or sorry 5 seconds to show up these results it's quite point pointless however Uh, if there is a banking transaction uh, or maybe you are generating movie recommendations for users who have just signed up uh, on netflix for the first time 5 seconds over there is still bearable you can still bear 5 uh, seconds they, they'll wait for the 5 seconds and hence uh, i'm saying it again measuring this time and setting a proper threshold will is uh, not only uh, important but is also use case dependent right So this was basically the first point that you spoke about monitoring. Uh, let me give a idea about the alert, second point that you pointed out, which was around alerting. Right. Uh, so you said that uh, if there is a threshold reach, we'll raise an alert, and uh, that might go to a, a, a on-call person. Right. Uh, but the question is, should we? Uh, like, is it fair to wake up a real person post midnight, even if he encountered just one? Uh, violation of latency. Hmm. Fair enough. That that would be oh, good. Oh. Yeah. So uh, I I think that's a rhetorical question. The answer uh, uh, for the question is basically you no. Know, uh, it does not make sense to do that, and it does not make sense to do uh, like uh, raise an alert for every uh, you know every sort of exception that we are getting. So we should have basically varying levels of severity uh, because I don't want to disturb the developers who are. Uh, Uh, in a case where where i am getting huge number of 4xx which are basically client errors maybe the client itself is sending me a bad uh, you know bad request they are calling a get api but in the http method they are writing a post api in that case i don't want to uh, alert my developer so it also depends upon whether the uh, you know alert that i am getting is worthy of waking up a person or not so it should have basically varying level of severity but uh, i won't uh, want to hear your suggestions on what should be the criteria for raising an alert uh, in case of uh, you know specifically in case of latencies fair enough fair enough so uh, what we can do is since we don't want to overwhelm the person on call what we could do is we could raise an alert only if the average latency 
of let's say five minutes, the past five minutes, if that average latency goes uh, beyond the threshold, only then we will raise the alert. How does uh, that sound? So uh, you are in the right direction, uh, but not quite there. Uh, so I'll tell you where you are right. Uh, so the idea where you said that uh, I'll use a certain time period for analysis, that is actually correct, right? Uh, it, uh, it makes sense to uh, observe the system behavior for a, a given period of time. But it does not make sense to uh, use average as a metric, right? Uh, the reason I, I'll come to the reason uh, in a bit. Uh, but before that, uh, I would like to highlight over here that you should almost never rely on average metrics when it comes to raising alerts. Instead, what you can rely on is uh, a metric called P99. In simple words, this P99 metric that I'm uh, calling out is that 99% of my requests that are coming to my system will take less time than the time that is reported on against this P99 metric on your dashboard. That means that 99% requests which are reaching my system will, uh, for example, if the time is one, uh, let's say P99 is written as 10 milliseconds on your dashboard. That means that 99% of my request will take less than 10 milliseconds. Let me give you an analogy to explain you why average matrices don't work. Uh, so the pleasant temperature for a normal human being uh, is let's say 25 degrees. Now imagine if I place your head in minus 10 degrees and your feet in 60 degrees. The average temperature is still 25 degrees, right? But it's not a very pleasant experience and most likely the person will die as well. Similarly in software engineering, Measuring the 99 percentile metrics of P99 are more important as compared to the average uh, metrics. And this is true for any kind of a metric, uh, not just latency, right? Uh, we look at other metrics uh, that are, uh, you know, that are uh, quite important. Uh, so, Prage, would you like to uh, talk about some of the metrics uh, that are important? Hmm. So, uh, if I'm looking at the P99 statistic, what I would like to measure is, first of all, the latency of all the APIs that we have in our system. Right. Uh, apart from that, I would like to measure some things about uh, the load on our servers. Right. So, I would like to measure how much disk space is remaining on our servers. Right. Uh, what is the RAM availability? How much CPU load are they facing? Right. Uh, so, basically, I mean, based on these metrics, what I will be able to do is, I will be able to decide if I want to launch more servers, if I want to scale out, basically. Right. If I want to uh, add or remove instances and basically what we could also have is based on these metrics, we could have some sort of a pipeline. We could have some sort of a hook that will auto scale our servers. So if the, if the demand suddenly uh, rushes in and we don't even have a person on call, then the software automatically will detect that, Hey, the CPU load is going higher. So uh, it will automatically launch more instances of the application. So uh, latency of APIs, server stats, that is something that I would like to uh, measure. Apart from that, I think at the code level, uh, I would also like to measure the time each function is taking, right? So that would really help me narrow down uh, at a function level, right? Uh, basically where the issue is happening. So it could be the case that uh, basically the call to a particular function is taking very, very long. So if I track the times for each function call, then that will help me pinpoint the issue accurately, right? Uh, but I mean, I will have to be uh, kind of cognizant of the of monitoring the latencies of functions that are involving some sort of IO call, right? So it could be the case that a function is basically uh, making a server request, right? So, uh, I mean, I, I want to measure uh, the, the latency of functions which are making a server request, but if, if the function is very simple, right? If the function is uh, as simple as let's say add something, then I don't really want to measure the latency of that. So if the function is complicated enough, I would want to measure the time that function is also taking. So with time, our approach should be that uh, we've, we've started measuring the function latencies. Uh, but if let's say it becomes this code becomes a legacy code and this has been running for like ages now, uh, we should omit the uh, measuring latency part because that also has an overhead uh, attached to it, right? Uh, because uh, measuring latency, the way it happens is that uh, when a function, uh, when a call comes to a function, the time stamp of that particular uh, uh, like that particular timestamp is noted and whenever the scope of that function finishes, that timestamp is noted and then difference is calculated and it is basically logged out to uh, either a log or it is flushed out to a channel where uh, this latency is cal basically calculated. So you are wasting three uh, three instructions uh, while measuring the latency. 
So if you have a function like a, uh, add two numbers, I would rather not measure that particular latency because I know that this is a simple enough instruction. It does not make sense to add um, the latency over, uh, me uh, measuring the latency overhead in this case. Uh, and I'll also uh, like to point out uh, some other parameters that I would like to monitor, uh, right? Uh, I would also want to monitor the amount of uh, how is my heap memory looking at a given point and how are my GC cycles happening, right? Uh, we all know that most of the programming languages, unless you are uh, writing code in C or C++, uh, comes up with the concept of heap uh, and they uh, also have a garbage collector uh, which collects the objects uh, from the uh, heap, right? Uh, frees up the space for newer objects. Me monitoring these will give you deeper insights on how objects are basically piled up in the heap and it may also point out possible memory leaks that are there in your application. How you are going to find out that there are memory leaks? The, you can just look at the graph of uh, heap memory, right? Uh, it will be in a form of a mountain, then a valley, uh, then basically down, peak and down, peak and down. That downward is basically when the GC uh, starts triggering, triggering it. So just by measuring this, uh, just by monitoring your heap memory also, you can find deeper insights into your application and uh, you know inform your developers that hey this is maybe uh, there are some memory leaks in your application the second one is um, the second metric that i would want to add is uh, basically uh, keeping an eye on the number of active threads or connection that my application is uh, making this will give insights if we can parallelize tasks in the applications or not and the last point that i want to add uh, is around file descriptors uh, I don't know if you know about file descriptors or not, but uh, file descriptors are basically open when you, whenever you open up a uh, file on the OS, um, right? Uh, you might have seen, so just go back and uh, do this experiment uh, in any programming language. Open a file, uh, do a, write a for loop, open up a, um, and in that for loop, uh, it, it should be an infinite for loop. Uh, don't do anything, just do, uh, open uh, try uh, opening uh, opening files in that particular for, for loop eventually the, there is a limit on the number of files that can be opened in an os operating system and that limit will be hit hit and you'll get an error so there are systems which are basically based on the file descriptors right uh, for example kafka uh, if the if the number of file descriptors are quickly increasing and they are on its way to eat up all the uh, file descriptors that can be uh, basically the OS limit, then it is uh, it does make sense to raise an alarm to the platform team and alert them that, hey, this is the kind of issue that, I, that we are fixing. You might want to uh, do something about this particular issue, right? And uh, <clears throat> using this matrix, we can decide around allocating or removing uh, resources that, uh, you know, uh, Pragya has already spoken about. We can scale in or scale out depending upon the load. Uh, all of this will basically help me in, uh, you know, automated addition of resource or automated removal of resource behind the load balancer, right? Uh, if you have worked on AWS, you will get to know that uh, these are the kind of uh, this auto scaling thing that we are, uh, I'm, uh, me and Pragya are uh, basically saying it again and again, will come up uh, uh, is basically a service that that is uh, offered by AWS, and uh, these are the standard parameters uh, on based on which you can uh, increase the number of resources cool cool, cool. that that makes a lot of sense uh, but uh, coming back to the topic maybe the issue is still not solved so using these metrics and basically using all these uh, charts and monitoring things maybe i figured out what the exact problematic api is and maybe i have even narrowed it down to a particular function right but i might still not know what the exact issue is so I am thinking that uh, now is the right time to start looking at the logs, right? And see if you can find something over there. So uh, what I would want to do is I would try to uh, basically uh, look at what servers we have. I would SSH into one of those servers, right? So I'll just open my uh, terminal. I'll open something like iterm. I'll SSH into my server. I'll navigate to wherever the logs is located. And I'll just tail that log, right? I'll try to read the last uh, few lines of that log to see if uh, I can find what the exact issue is. So, I mean, what does is, what is that sound like? Uh, yeah, so uh, if we have multiple, uh, let's say I just have three, four servers, so I can use the item window itself 
to basically broadcast input to multiple uh, servers and uh, like I, I'll primarily if I want to just check whether there are exceptions or not, I can also grab for that particular exception keyword into that but uh, into the logs, right? Uh, but this approach also will not scale, right? Uh, typically, in any company uh, of a decent size or decent volume, those companies have like hundreds and thousands of servers. It is impossible to SSH into each server. So what you can do is uh, you can ask each server to uh, to basically direct the logs into a centralized uh, location. Now, this centralized location is basically uh, responsible for storing logs from all the services that are there in the uh, ecosystem. So, for example, in AWS, there might be, uh, for, for example, in Amazon, there might be a service corresponding to uh, order management. There will be a service uh, which will be responsible for inventory man management, for example. We'll collate logs from all these services, different services, and put it into one place. The benefit that we get out of it is that once we have all the logs from all the services in one place, we can throw all these logs, uh, logs into a, a system like uh, Elasticsearch, and we can write queries and uh, the same grep command that you're doing on while SSHing into a particular instance. We can do it at a centralized location. I don't have to. Uh, you know, go into thousands of VMs and uh, find out whether there, there was an exception or not. But there is still one more uh, problem with this, right? Uh, and this problem is not uh, at a uh, not at a log. Uh, how do I go into the log and find out, find it out? This is more of a logical uh, problem, right? Uh, to give you a glimpse of what this problem is, uh, just imagine how a particular API is written, right? Whenever an API is written, or, or to write a API, typical, uh, uh, typical, uh, typical structuring of your code is like that you start from a controller. So your controller is where your APIs are basically uh, uh, defined. From the controller, the request goes to a handler. From the handler, the request will go to a service. From the service, the request will go to a database layer, fetch something, and then return back. Or it might be a case that a service calls another dependent service, which might be a different uh, uh, different system altogether, right? And exception can occur in any of the uh, layers that I've just described. Each layer might have different different functions, right? The the crux of the problem that I'm getting to is that exception can occur in any of the functions, right? And the entire context of the request lies uh, in the controller. How do I pass this context, the complete context which was there in the controller to the function in which the exception occurred? One way to do that is that I pass the exact request patterns that are passed uh, during my uh, you know, API call to every function. Right? I can create an object of everything that is there in my application, uh, like everything that was passed to my API controller, pass this particular object to each uh, function that is responsible for uh, processing this particular request. But this is far from ideal, right? Uh, what if each layer is developed by a different uh, set of teams or different developers? How do I avoid manual errors? Let's say I forget uh, to pass this outside of my service and the exception was occurring in the database layer. Now, if I forget passing this particular you know, uh, request to any of the functions, I am uh, uh, the subsequent function calls will not have context about the exact request that was there. <clears throat> so can we do better than this? A slightly better way to do this is generate a unique ID as soon as I get a request and pass this unique ID in all the functions. This way, I'm not passing the entire big request object. Uh, I'm just passing a string. Maybe uh, I can generate a UUID out of it. Uh, and I'm just passing a UUID. However, even this approach is prone to manual error, uh, like manual errors, right? So <clears throat> a common practice to avoid this kind of a uh, thing is, uh, and this is where this basically works, because uh, we want to. Uh, 
we want everybody to each function basically to follow this kind of a, a practice that while logging i'm logging this particular uh, unique id that i generated in the beginning of the api call so there is a chance to externalize this responsibility to a framework in java world it is called aop uh, aspect oriented programming uh, i don't know if you guys have heard about it this is called aspect oriented programming where i'm this aspect will be attached to each and every function and I, the responsibility of this aspect is to pass on the uh, unique id that was first uh, generated right many uh, there are many uh, logging frameworks that uh, has this kind of a functionality in built right uh, so using this approach i have solved for the problem of uh, issues arising within that particular application server but in reality we uh, to process a particular request we might end up calling multiple services for example to uh, render the home page of amazon we might need to render promoted links like uh, we might want to promote item like oneplus uh, maybe a new iphone that is getting uh, launched and we also need to show recommended content based on the user's previous uh, order history so if a service a calls service b we need a system that will help me trace the request not just in service a but also help me in identifying the same request when it goes to system b as well this kind of a mechanism which will help me trace requests from one system to another is basically uh, achieved by uh, something called as a distributed log tracing frameworks right uh, there are uh, frameworks like sleuth uh, uh, available which will give you uh, the exact functionality that i have just spoken about and the way this works is uh, you might be wondering how uh, how would the uh, request uh, how would i pass the id which is generated in service a to service b the way it is done is that i attach a i attach this unique id into the http header so whenever i call whenever service a call service b it will attach this unique id in the http headers service b will read this http header around the logs or uh, this is called spans uh, will read this particular uh, uh, will read this particular id and print it or uh, the same way service a is printing it right so this is all you need to uh, do to trace an exception that originated from uh, service a and ended in service b right so we have touched upon multiple uh, just in a very very short time uh, i'll open up for questions now uh, if you have any questions around this uh please feel free to ask them now pets over to you guys the audience if you have any yeah, questions chat and we will be taking those questions okay cool so uh, i did see a question on the screen just now but uh, the question is gone yeah so is there uh is these stats depend upon platform uh we use like node js or spring boot or uh, which one is better in production so uh, i've used a uh, massively worked on uh, spring boot uh, spring boot have an open source uh, library of cloud uh, you know uh, cloud utilities uh, right uh, we have uh, sleuth which works per, uh, particularly uh, for java uh, based spring boot applications but there are open source app, uh, equivalents as well right uh, which are basically polyglot in nature so it, in those cases uh it does not matter whether you are whether your uh, service a is written in java or service b is written in python like it does not matter which language you are using it will work uh, so uh, people have come up with uh, standards that hey for log uh, for sending this log to uh, the next application this is uh, the uh, this should be the header name and it uh, all the applications and all the client libraries are built using those standard uh, semantics also mohit i think rahul's question is a little bit uh, came a little bit earlier i think he's asking about the uh, the statistics <coughs> what the, the server statistics that we are measuring so you told right. me that uh, we have to measure things like the number of cpu threads that are running the file descriptors and i myself wanted to measure the function latencies and api uh, latencies and stuff so i think rahul is asking about that could you touch upon that perhaps uh so yes uh, so i think uh, it makes sense for uh, node js application also at the end of the day uh, 
all the applications need system resources or uh, right uh, we need uh, all the application servers will need uh, matrices to rely on like latency is polyglot right uh, by the way polyglot is that uh, your application uh, or your entire ecosystem of applications that you have built is written in multiple uh, using multiple language, languages so uh, these latencies and matrices that we spoke about are basically not language dependent and all the high level uh, uh, languages that are there right now are basically uh, taking care of the uh, uh, are basically taking care of the memory by themselves so in one way or the other they will need to clear out the uh, garbage that is basically collecting memory man management is done by those languages so uh, yes it helps in measuring those uh, the short answer is yes it helps to measure this irrespective of what language you are coming from i hope i answered your question rahul uh, we'll go to the next question Uh, so, which are the tools used for monitoring thread dumps, heap spaces, and other metrics? So, yes, Mohit, uh, could you say something about this? Uh, I'll take this up. Uh, so, there are multiple tools, uh, both open source available. Uh, like, there are, if you are looking for open source frameworks, uh, there's J Profiler, which you can attach uh, in your uh, one of the servers that is running, which will give you a very detailed view of. What all uh, things are happening inside your heap memory? It will just give you a throw up a heap. heap dump. For example, if the heap size is 4 GB, it will throw up a 4 GB uh, heap dump. And you can use uh, some prof J profiler to analyze what e exactly which object is taking the most uh, amount of memory in your uh, uh, to offer other other matrices uh, uh, that we spoke about, like latency and all that. Uh, that open source uh, uh, version is you can use Grafana. Uh, or Grify uh, to basically push out the matrices, and you can use Grify for plotting out the graphs. The paid version, however, uh, is basically you can use New Relic. There are Data Dog. Uh, there is a company called Data Dog. Uh, those are basically simpler to set up. Uh, as long as you are uh, like willing to pay uh, them a hefty amount, uh, you can use them. Uh, otherwise, you can go for the uh, open source variants. Cool. So I think we can move on to the next question. Yes. Can you provide an example of uh, file descriptors? Uh, okay. Can you uh, provide an example of a file descriptor? So uh, I told you, right? Uh, in Kafka, uh, it is uh, so the way Kafka stores its messages is that uh, I have to give some context about Kafka here. Uh, that's what I was thinking. So the way uh, Kafka stores its messages is uh, it opens up a file. That file corresponds to a partition, and partition corresponds to a topic. So at the end of the day, all the messages that are coming to Kafka are basically stored in file. And whenever you have to write a particular message to a file, uh, that will be a, to write a message to a file, you will have to be first open a file, and then write a message, and then only you will be able to close it. Now let's suppose uh, the number of partitions are huge. You have uh, created. Uh, like I'll go into, uh, I'll digress from uh, the current topic uh, if I go into detail. But let's suppose uh, to achieve scalability, what you did was uh, you created multiple partitions of that particular topic. That will end up creating multiple files on the operating systems. And if all, if you're, uh, if you start writing to all the topics at one or, or all the partitions in, at a single time, you will face uh, problems uh, like. Uh, of file, file descriptors are uh, exhausting out. I hope uh, that answers uh, your questions, Jeev. Uh, how to debug an issue where a uh, set of users are experiencing slowness in global, uh, global app like uh, Amazon and Netflix? Uh, Ratnesh, that is a excellent question. Uh, and that comes under the purview of uh, infrastructure uh, Piece that we are not covering today. A short answer for that is uh, it might be due to DNS, which is getting misconfigured. It is very much possible that let's say uh, I am sitting in India and uh, in the DNS resolution step, uh, what happened was that I was returned an IP address of uh, let's say uh, US, right? So that will inherently add a latency of 200 milliseconds because India and US are geographically quite distant uh, from each other. So that's a short answer. We'll do a separate uh, session on the similar lines. 
uh, where we'll dig deeper into uh, the infrastructure issues as well and uh, client side issues also right uh, it, for example if i talk about just uh, one line of about client side it is very much possible that the stream that i'm sending to the uh, you know uh, my client is not compressed if that is the case then it will experience a lot of slowness uh, so those are some kind of uh, client issues so we'll do a session on uh, both of these uh, in future don't worry any other questions guys uh, cool so i see this one nice question from jeet uh, jeet is asking the following can you take this up perhaps yes uh, can you give some tips on how the on call support engineer should start debugging like uh, should he start from infra next or he first okay that's a great question uh, let me sum this will basically give us a chance to summarize our discussion as well right uh, so the first thing is uh, identify whether it is a server side issue infra side issue or is it a uh, back end issue how you are going to identify that uh, if if the problem is coming to you uh, chances are it will be a back end issue that's why we uh, did this uh, problem right uh, the way to negate a uh, infra side issue is uh, monitor on your load balancer so if you have uh, deployed your application on aws aws load balancer will give you a metric about how many 4xx and 5xx and uh, 2xx are there if the number of 5xx are alarmingly high chances are it's a back end issue right uh, aws also gives you a uh, way to monitor how much time each request is taking so if the latency of a system is going for a toss that means it's again a back end issue uh, using this you just have identified that hey this is the uh, back end issue right then you drill down which api is causing this kind of a problem again the friend over here is your monitoring dashboard have a uh, like monitoring setup uh, the way you set up monitoring is either you can go to go for open source uh, versions where you measure the latency of every api or you go for a paid version where, which will do it uh, out of the box for you right after you have identified which api is calling uh, causing the issue you drill down into the, that api by using the logs that you are getting uh, connect uh, logs that you are uh, connecting right so using this you will basically narrow down the problem to exact uh, issue that you you, have, uh, you know exact issue uh, that is basically coming up Cool. So I think uh, this is another interesting question that we have. Uh, how do you debug issues when a uh, cluster is running uh, in different regions? So simple answer is that a uh, monitoring dashboard will basically define where exactly your uh, application servers are running and which application servers are uh, performing different different tasks. So typically, how you set up monitoring in those cases is uh, you uh, have different dashboards for different different region so have a collated view uh, so i did uh, i did this in hotstar as well which was live in us and uh, india at that time so we had a separate counter and separate latency metrics for us and a separate latency metrics for uh, i'm just using latency but there were a bunch of other matrices as well uh, we spoke about them in the past uh, and a bunch of matrices in india data center the reason we set up a different monitoring on both of them is because the data center inherent data center which is serving indian users and us users are different and that's the reason we uh, like both of them will have uh, issues uh, will report uh, issues separately right uh, it's just that hotstar.com for us users will resolve to us data center and hotstar.com for indian users will be resolved to india data center Oh, perfect, perfect. This seems like a really interesting question. Chahat has a question about uh, low load services. Uh, I have to wait. One error out of four. Maybe seven. Cool. Uh, I will give you a very uh, good analogy for this, right? I'll give you a good example where such kind of systems will uh, occur, right? So, assume uh, you're building a Netflix ingestion pipeline. Okay. Uh, ingestion. What are ingestion pipeline means? Uh, that let's suppose uh, Netflix comes up with a new show and it wants it wants to air a new episode in that particular uh, series. So uh, that is actually a very time-consuming task as well, right? Typically, it will take hours to 
uh, hours for a person to upload it and take it live to the end audience. The reason is that it will go to multiple quality checks, both manual and automated. There'll be uh, checks in the frame as well. Uh, so the kind of TPS on these uh, uh, kind of systems is very low. And even if one request fails uh, in such kind of uh, scenario, uh, if, even if one request fails, that means there is a huge amount of customer base which will get impacted. So I should definitely raise an alarm in case there is even a one, a one failure. To avoid waking my on-call engineer on the night, what I can do is, if this is not a fire, uh, depending upon the feature, right? Uh, let's suppose uh, the video that I'm trying to ingest in the Netflix system has to go live next week. I still have time. I will uh, raise an alarm. Uh, I will send an alert. But the actual call to the person will go in the morning during the office hours. So those things are, uh, I'll basically change my alerting mechanism, not my monitoring system. Monitoring system still remains intact. Cool, cool, cool. That makes sense. Uh, Ankit is asking, uh, can you can you talk about some tools that you can use to automate the alerts? Right, right. So uh, one of the, uh, just explore your uh, elastic stack, okay? Uh, for all these uh, kind of questions, uh, for monitoring, for logging, for distributed tracing, for uh, you know uh, alerting, use the Elk stack. Uh, Elast that stands for Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana. Uh, Kibana, uh, the newer version of Kibana especially, has a capability to send alerts as well. Uh, for doing an on-call kind of a duty, uh, like uh, if you want to manage who is, uh, le let's say there are six developers in the team, uh, there's one developer from the team wakes, uh, takes care of the entire infrastructure for one week and then you rotate amongst your among the people who are there. So for doing this uh, specifically, there is a tool called uh, PagerDuty. Uh, it's a paid tool uh, that you can use. Uh, the pay with PagerDuty, you would be able to call the person, uh, send an SMS, send a pager letter and uh, do a bunch of other tasks as well. Interesting, interesting. Cool. Uh, Jeet has a question about uh, uh, that his company is using P70 matrix instead of P99 matrix. Wow. So could you talk something about that? That's a very, uh, so I, I would say that P70 will not uh, give you good insights. Uh, I think maybe the reason why your company is using a P70 kind of a matrix is uh, may, the SLAs are basically defined uh, that way. So uh, typically when you have enterprise contracts, right, uh, you uh, have to define how much would be your P99, P70 or P50, the, there's a P50 as well. So it starts from P50, P70, uh, I, 70 is the first time that I'm hearing it, uh, hearing it, P50 is there, P75 is there, 95 is there, 99 is there and 99.9 is there. And usually when you have a service level agreement for between enterprises, you have to specify that what would be uh, the threshold or the max limit for these metrics, right? Uh, so maybe the project that you were working on, the contract was that 70% uh, of my uh, request will, uh, I'll basically please 70% of the customers. But as an engineer, your goal should be to uh, look at P99 or maybe uh, if you are a rockstar engineer, then look at P99.99. You can add as many nines as you want. Cool, cool. Uh, Ratesh has a really interesting question. Ratesh is saying that debugging is good, but uh, we should try to avoid the problem in the first place. So uh, when we are writing the code, what can we do so that debugging becomes a lesser hassle and right. we can do debugging really fast? Yes. So uh, if you remember the first thing that I uh, told you, right? Uh, uh, if you're an application developer, for example, uh, Android, and, uh, Android app uh, developer, the exceptions are occurring on the mobile devices and not at the server. So whatever exceptions are occurring on the mobile devices, you won't get a chance to know, uh, know about it. That's the reason it becomes essential that as soon as an exception is occurred, uh, you log it in the system memory uh, Android device, right? Uh, and from that Android storage, once a person is connected to internet again, send that error report to the uh, backend, device, uh, backend uh, people so that they can go and debug uh, that particular application. Uh, for others, right? Uh, for backend systems, uh, having a uh, so typically how people do it is as soon as they, they get an exception, uh, they keep a monitor on their logs 
as soon as they get an exception or maybe uh, you would have written try catch block if you're a java developer right in the catch block uh, just put that exception into a queue right or people call it a dead letter queue put that exception into a queue and there is a special person who, who can look into uh, what are the exceptions what are the most common uh, you know uh, exceptions that are occurring and you can uh, look into that paid solutions uh, for logging exceptions and you know doing all these exception uh, analytics is uh, sentry and uh, crashlytics i think they have a uh, uh, they also ha have an open source variant or a community edition uh, i'm not sure about that uh, just uh, go and uh, have a look at whether they they are providing a community edition but paid solutions are already there cool that is interesting uh i am not seeing any more questions in the chat as of now so guys uh, if you have any more questions please please keep them coming yeah okay so we'll just you wait can, for a couple of minutes you can uh, or what you can do is uh, you can uh, even after the session is ended uh, put your question in the comment uh, right uh, that will help us uh, we'll keep uh, like we keep on looking at the comments and uh, we'll reply back if you have any questions uh, also i would request everyone to please comment about specific areas that you liked about the video uh, that gives us encouragement and motivation about uh, you know doing such sessions in the future as well and uh, please like comment and share and subscribe to our channel uh, grow and spread this word uh, this is a free uh, initiative that we have uh, you know recently started where we will uh, help in uh, you know uh, helping each every uh, each and every engineer um, grow and you know upskill themselves uh, so please do like comment and share and subscribe to our channel uh how to uh, sunil has a question i'll take this uh, as a last question how to handle garbage connection in time of multiple things or threads so garbage collections are, uh, for speci specifically for java you have special collectors that you can have uh, uh, like uh, you, you can configure the kind of collector that is uh, running uh there is g1 gc there is serial character there is parallel gc uh, there is concurrent mark and sweep so multiple algorithms are there uh, for uh, garbage collection for others as well uh, i think pragya can talk about uh, uh, if you want to uh, talk about some py py how does gc works in python and if you can configure uh, a garbage collection algorithm right so uh, i am not so sure. uh, python does allow you to hook into the gc so uh, i think uh, the the library for uh, this is inbuilt library for in python which is literally called gc right and you can basically uh, hook into it to to figure out when an object is being garbage collected uh, i think you can plug and play different algorithms uh, in there as well but i'm not exactly sure uh, you will have to check uh, that library uh, but if you look at any sort of uh, programming language that is used uh, for for web services and that has some sort of a garbage collector uh, you will be able to uh, be that like that programming language will definitely support a library to hook into garbage collector and and basically uh, uh, try to configure you can you can try to configure basically when the garbage collection happens or what algorithm the garbage collection use you can you can basically uh, tweak that those things does that make sense no uh, i'm not sure if that answers your question so your question is more specifically how to handle garbage collection in time of multiple pings or threads uh, is that your question multiple pings or threads i think it's multiple pings okay uh so you cannot control uh, garbage collection you cannot say to the garbage collection that uh, start collecting the garbage now uh you can uh, however hint it uh, and it depends upon the uh, you know uh, algorithm that you are using it, it might honor your uh, request or it might uh, reject your request as well so there's nothing special that you can do uh, in terms of uh, that i want to collect the garbage now that is not possible Even so one thing that you have to take care of uh, from a design perspective is that I mean you have to look at how your application is managing the objects. In case your objects are forming a very large graph, right? If they are forming a large cyclic graph uh, of objects that are dependent on just one variable, right? So imagine that there is one variable that is talking to an object that is basically referring to an object, and that object in in turn is referring to an entire tree or an entire graph of objects. Now if this variable goes out of scope. what will happen is the garbage collector will kick in very late to clear up this entire graph right so you should try to uh, make your design in such a manner that this thing does not happen 
does that make sense so that is there is something that you can do now of course for garbage collection uh, this this a lot of other things that uh, you can do so perhaps what we can do is we can have a separate session on that sometime uh, on the there is uh, there are multiple people who are uh, requesting for a session on garbage collection so we'll uh, probably plan a session alongside uh, you know uh, after we are done with infrastructure and client we'll probably plan a session around garbage collection Cool. Uh, keep the uh, interesting suggestions. When uh, if you have any suggestions around what topic we need to do, uh, please comment that uh, topic name. Uh, just the topic name in the comment. Uh, we we'll make we we'll, uh, make sure that we do a session on that one. All right. Um, I hope the session was informative and uh, interesting for you. And I'll hope to see everyone in the next. Session. Perfect. So, so uh, one more thing that I would like to mention, Mohit. So, uh, apart from this, uh, apart from this particular session, in this uh, junior developer versus senior developer uh, theme that we are having, uh, what other future videos are we expecting to see? Can you can you comment something about uh, upon that? Uh, so we'll have a, a video. So uh, next we are planning to have is a session on. Uh, so this was basically a tech oriented session, right? Uh, and technical skills is not the only thing that is required to. Uh, Climb up the ladder. So we are planning to have a session on soft skills. Uh, you won't believe uh, the differentiating criteria uh, between my uh, my interview at Facebook uh, was basically on the soft skills aspect, right? Uh, so they say that uh, the technical interviews are basically a filter criteria, and whether you'll be offered a position as SD SD three or SD two depends upon how you uh, portray yourself in the team. And how do you manage team, right? Uh, uh, manage your team. So we are planning to have a session on uh, soft skills uh, specifically, uh, probably next time. Uh, and we're also again uh, we missed out on the client and infrastructure side, so we'll also have a session on that. We'll have sessions on um, how do you develop a app, uh, like roadmap series kind of a session. How do you develop an app from start uh, to the end? So those are the things that are there in the pipeline. Uh, to Perfect, perfect. That sounds interesting. So, uh, as as we said, guys, keep the questions coming. Uh, basically, we will be ending the session, but we'll be monitoring the uh, the comments that you are posting. And basically, if if you have an interesting question, we'll be replying to that. All right. Yeah. So that is it for this session. Hope to see you guys in the next session. All right. There are yeah. there are many more. To do, so see you then. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye.